Preface to part three, totalitarianism. The original manuscript of the origins of totalitarianism was finished in autumn 1949, more than four years after the defeat of Hitler's Germany, less than four years before Stalin's death. The first edition of the book appeared in 1951. In retrospect, the years I spent writing it from 1945 onwards appear like the first period of relative calm after decades of turmoil, confusion, and plain horror. The revolutions after the First World War, the rise of totalitarian movements, and the undermining of parliamentary government, followed by all sorts of new tyrannies, fascist and semi-fascist, one party and military dictatorships. Finally, the seemingly firm establishment of totalitarian governments resting on mass support. In Russia in 1929, the year of what is now called the Second Revolution, and in Germany in 1933. With the defeat of Nazi Germany, part of the story had come to an end. This seemed the first appropriate moment to look upon contemporary events with a backward directed glance of the historian and the analytic zeal of the political scientists. The first chance to try and tell and un to understand what had happened not yet Sini Ira et Studio, still in grief and sorrow, and hence with a tendency to lament, but no longer in speechless outrage and impotent horror. I left my present preface for the present edition in order to indicate the mood of those years. It was, at any rate, the first possible moment to articulate and to elaborate the questions with which my generation had been forced to live for the better part of its adult life. What happened? Why did it happen? How could it have happened? For out of the German defeat, which left behind a country in ruins and a nation that felt it had arrived at point zero of its history, mountains of paper had emerged virtually intact. A superabundance of documentary material on every aspect of the 12 years that Hitler's Townsend Jägerreicher Reich had managed to last. The first generous selections from this Embarras de Richet, which even today are by no means adequately published and investigated, began to appear in connection with the Nuremberg trial of the major war criminals in 1946 in the 12 volumes of Nazi conspiracy and aggression. Much more documentary and other material, however, bearing on the Nazi regime had become available in libraries and archives when the second paperback edition appeared in 1958. What I then learned was interesting enough, but it hardly required substantial changes in either the analysis or the argument of my original presentation. Numerous additions and replacements of quotations in the footnotes seemed advisable and the text was considerably enlarged, but these changes were all of a technical nature. In 1949, the Neurom documents were known only in part and in English translations, and a great number of books, pamphlets and magazines published in Germany between 1933 and 1945 had not been available. Also, in a number of editions, I took into account some of the more important events after Stalin's death, the successor crisis and Khrushchev's speech at the 20th Party Congress, as well as new information on the Stalin regime from recent publications. Thus, I revised part three and the last chapter of part two, whereas part one on anti-Semitism and the first four chapters on imperialism have remained unchanged. Moreover, there were certain insights of a strictly theoretical nature, closely connected with my analysis of the elements of total domination, which I did not possess when I finished the original manuscript and ended with a rather inconclusive concluding remarks. The last chapter of this edition, Ideology and Terror, replaced these remarks, which to the extent they still seem valid, were shifted to other chapters. To the second edition, I have added an epilogue where I discussed briefly the introduction of the Russian system into the satellite countries and the Hungarian Revolution. This discussion, written much later, was different in tone since it dealt with contemporary events and has become obsolete in many details. I've now eliminated it. And this is the only substantial change of this edition as compared with the second paperback edition. Obviously, the end of the war did not spell the end of totalitarian government in Russia. On the contrary, 
it was followed by the Bolshevization of Eastern Europe, that is, the spread of totalitarian government, and peace offered no more than a significant turning point from which to analyze the similarities and differences in methods and institutions of the two totalitarian regimes. Not the end of the war, but Stalin's death eight years later, later was decisive. In retrospect, it seems that this death was not merely followed by a successor crisis and a temporary thaw until a new leader had asserted himself, but by an authentic, though never unequivocal, process of de-totalitarianization. Hence, from the viewpoint of events, there was no reason to bring this part of my story up to date now, as as far as our knowledge of the period in question is concerned, it has not changed drastically enough to require extensive revisions and additions. In contrast to Germany, where Hitler used his war consciously to develop and, as it were, perfect totalitarian government, the war period in Russia was a time of temporary suspense of total domination. For my purposes, the years from 1929 to 1941, and then again from 1945 down to 53, are of central interest. And for these periods, our sources are as scarce as of the same nature as they were in 58, or even in 1949. Nothing has happened or is likely to happen in the future to present us with the same unequivocal end of the story or the same horribly neat and irrefutable evidence to document it as was the case for Nazi Germany. The only important addition to our knowledge, the contents of the Smolensk archive published in 1958 by Mel Feinsod, have demonstrated to what extent dearth of the most elementary documentary and statistical material will remain the decisive handicap for all inquiries into this period of Russian history. For although the archives discovered at party headquarters in Smolensk by German intelligence and then captured by the American occupation force in Germany, contained some 200,000 pages of documents and are virtually intact for the period from 1917 to 1938. The amount of information they failed to give us is truly amazing. Even with an almost unmanageable abundance of material on the purges, 1929 to 1937, they contain no indication of the number of victims or of any other vital statistical data. Whenever figures are given, they are hopelessly contradictory. The various organizations all give in different sets. And all we learn beyond doubt is that many of them, if they ever existed, were withheld at the source by order of the government. Also, the archive contains no information on the relations between the various branches of authority between party, the military, and NKVD, or between party and government, and is silent about the channels of communication and command. In short, we learn nothing about the organizational structure of the regime of which you are so well informed with respect to Nazi Germany. In other words, while it has always been known that the official Soviet publications served propaganda purposes and were utterly unreliable, it now appears that reliable source and statistical material never existed anywhere. A much more serious question is whether a study of totalitarianism can afford to ignore what has happened and is still happening in China. Here, our knowledge is even less secure than it was for Russia in the 30s, partly because the country has succeeded in isolating itself against foreigners after the successful revolution much more radically and partly because defectors from the higher ranks of the Chinese Communist Party have not yet come to our aid, which, of course, is in itself significant enough. For 17 years, the little we knew beyond doubt pointed to very relevant differences. After an initial period of considerable bloodshed, the number of victims during the first years of dictatorship is plausibly estimated at 15 million, about 3% of the population in 1949, and in terms of percentage, considerably less than the population losses due to Stalin's second revolution. And after the disappearance of organized opposition, there was no increase in terror, no massacres of innocent people, no category of objective enemies, no show trials, though a great deal of public confession and self-criticism and no outright crimes. Mao's famous speech of 1957 on the correct handling of contradictions among the people usually known under the misleading title, Let a Hundred Flowers Bloom, was certainly no plea for freedom, but it did recognize non-antagonistic contradictions between classes and 
more importantly, between the people and the government, even under a communist dictatorship. The way to deal with opponents was rectification of thought, an elaborate procedure of constant moulding and remoulding of the minds to which, more or less, the whole population seemed subject. We never knew very well how this worked in everyday life, who was exempt from it, that is, who did the remoulding, and we had no inkling of the results of the brainwashing, whether it was lasting and actually produced personality changes. If one were to trust the present announcements of the Chinese leadership, all it produced was hypocrisy on a gigantic scale, the breeding grounds for counter-revolution. If this was terror, as it most certainly was, it was terror of a different kind. And whatever its results, it did not decimate the population. It clearly recognized national interest. It permitted the country to develop peacefully, to use the competence of the descendants of the formerly ruling classes, and to uphold academic and professional standards. In brief, it was obvious that Mao's thought did not run along the lines laid down by Stalin or by Hitler, for that matter, that he was not a killer by instinct and that nationalist sentiment, so prominent in all revolutionary upheavals in former colonial countries, was strong enough to impose limits upon total domination. All this seemed to contradict certain fears expressed in this book. On the other hand, the Chinese Communist Party, after its victory, had once aimed at being international in organization, or comprehensive in its ideological scope, and global in its political aspiration. That is, its totalitarian traits had been manifest from the beginning. These traits became more prominent with the development of the Sino-Soviet conflict, where the conflict itself might well have been touched off by national rather than ideological issues. The insistence of the Chinese on rehabilitating Stalin and denouncing the Russian attempts at detalitarianization as revisionist deviation was ominous enough. And to make matters worse, it was accompanied by an utterly ruthless, though thus far unsuccessful, international policy, which aimed at infiltrating all revolutionary movements in China with Chinese agents everywhere and reviving the Comintern under Peking's leadership. All these developments are difficult to judge at the present moment, partly because we do not know enough and partly because everything is still in a state of flux. To these uncertainties, which are in the nature of the situation, we unhappily have added our own self-created handicaps. For it does not facilitate matters in either theory or practice that we have inherited from the Cold War period an official counter-ideology, anti-communism, which also tends to become global in aspiration and tempts us into constructing a fiction of our own so that we refuse on principle to distinguish various communist one-party dictatorships with which we are confronted in reality from authentic totalitarian government as it may develop, albeit in different forms, in China. The point, of course, is not that communist China is different from communist Russia or that Stalin's Russia was different from Hitler's Germany, Drunkenness and incompetence, which looms so large in any description of Russia in the 20s and 30s, are still widespread today, but played no role whatsoever in the story of Nazi Germany. While the unspeakable, gratuitous cruelty in the German concentration and extermination camps seems to have been largely absent from the Russian camps, where the prisoners died of neglect rather than torture. Corruption the curse of the Russian administration from the beginning was also present in the last years of the Nazi regime, but apparently has been entirely absent from China after the revolution. Differences of this sort could be multiplied. They are of great significance and part of parcel of the national history of the respective countries, but they have no direct bearing on the form of government. Absolute monarchy, no doubt, was a very different affair in Spain, in France, in England, in Prussia, Still, it was everywhere the same form of government. Decisive in our context is that totalitarian government is different from dictatorships and tyrannies. The ability to distinguish between them is by no means an academic issue which should be left safely to the theoreticians for total domination is the only form of government with which coexistence is not possible. Hence, we have every reason to use the word totalitarian sparingly and prudently. 
in stark contrast to the scarcity and uncertainty of new sources for factual knowledge with respect to totalitarian government, we find an enormous increase in studies of all the varieties of new dictatorship, be they totalitarian or not, during the last 15 years. This is, of course, particularly true for Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia. There now exist many works which are indeed indispensable for further inquiry and study of the subject, and I've tried my best to supplement my old bibliography accordingly. The second paperback edition carried no bibliography. The only kind of literature which, with a few exceptions, I left out on purpose are the numerous memoirs published by former Nazi generals and high functionaries after the end of the war. That this sort of apologetics does not shine with honesty is understandable enough and should not rule it out of our consideration. But the lack of comprehension these reminiscences display of what actually happened and of the roles the authors themselves played in the course of the events is truly astonishing and deprives them of all but a certain psychological interest. I've also added the relatively few new items of importance to the reading list pertaining to parts one and two. Finally, for reasons of convenience, the bibliography of the book, like the book itself, is now divided into three separate parts. everything is possible. Normal men do not know that everything is possible. A classless society, the masses. Nothing is more characteristic of the totalitarian movements in general and of the quality of fame of their leaders in particular than the startling swiftness with which they are forgotten and the startling ease with which they can be replaced. What Stalin accomplished laboriously over many years through bitter factional struggles and vast concessions, at least to the name of his predecessor, namely to legitimate himself as Lenin's political heir, Stalin's successors attempted to do without concessions to the name of their predecessor, even though Stalin had 30 years time and could manipulate a propaganda apparatus unknown in Lenin's day to immortalize his name. The same is true for Hitler, who during his lifetime exercised a fascination to which allegedly no one was immune. And who after his defeat and death is today so thoroughly forgotten that he scarcely plays any further role, even among the neo-fascist and neo-Nazi groups of post-war Germany. This impermanence no doubt has something to do with the proverbial fickleness of the masses and the fame that rests on them. More likely, it can be traced to the perpetual motion mania of totalitarian movements, which can remain in power only so long as they keep moving and set everything around them in motion. Therefore, in a certain sense, this very impermanence is a rather flattering testimonial to the dead leaders insofar as they succeeded in contaminating their subjects with the specifically totalitarian virus. For if there is such a thing as a totalitarian personality or mentality, this extraordinary adaptability and absence of continuity are no doubt its outstanding characteristics. Hence, it might be a mistake to assume that the inconstancy and forgetfulness of the masses signify that they are cured of the totalitarian delusion, which is occasionally identified with the Hitler or Stalin cult. The opposite might well be true. It would be a still more serious mistake to forget, because of this impermanence, that the totalitarian regimes so long as they are in power and the totalitarian leaders, so long as they are alive, command and rest upon mass support up to the end. Hitler's rise to power was legal in terms of majority rule and neither he nor Stalin could have maintained the leadership 
of large populations, survived many interior and exterior crises, and braved the numerous dangers of relentless intra-party struggles if they had not had the confidence of the masses. Neither the Moscow trials nor the liquidation of the Rome faction would have been possible if these masses had not supported Stalin and Hitler. The widespread belief that Hitler was simply an agent of German and, and German industrialists and that Stalin was victorious in the succession struggle after Lenin's death only through a sinister conspiracy are both legends which can be refuted by many facts, but above all, by the leaders indisputable popularity. Nor can their popularity be attributed to the victory of masterful and lying propaganda over ignorance and stupidity. For the propaganda of totalitarian movements which precede and accompany totalitarian regimes is invariably as frank as it is mendacious and would-be totalitarian rulers usually start their careers by boasting of their past crimes and carefully outlining their future ones. The Nazis were convinced that evil doing in our time has a morbid force of attraction, Bolshevik assurances inside and outside Russia that they do not recognize ordinary moral standards have become a mainstay of communist propaganda and experience has proved time and again that the propaganda value of evil deeds and general contempt for moral standards is independent of mere self-interest, supposedly the most powerful psychological factor in politics. The attraction of evil and crime for the mob mentality is nothing new. It has always been true that the mob will greet deeds of violence with the admiring remark, it may be mean, but it is very clever. The disturbing factor in the succession of totalitarianism is rather the true selflessness of its adherents. It may be understandable that a Nazi or Bolshevik will not be shaken in his conviction by crimes against people who do not belong to the movement or are even hostile to it. But the amazing fact is that neither is he likely to waver when the monster begins to devour its own children, and not even if he becomes a victim of persecution himself, if he is framed and condemned, if he is purged from the party and sent to a forced labour or a concentration camp. On the contrary, to the wonder of the whole civilised world, he may even be willing to help in his own prosecution and frame his own death sentence if only his status as a member of the movement is not touched. It would be naive to consider this stubbornness of conviction, which outlives all actual experiences and cancels all immediate self-interest, a simple expression of fervent idealism. Idealism, foolish or heroic, always springs from some individual decision and conviction and is subject to experience and argument. The fanaticism of totalitarian movements, contrary to all forms of idealism, breaks down the moment the movement leaves its fanaticized followers in the lurch, killing in them any remaining conviction that might have survived the collapse of the movement itself. But within the organizational framework of the movement, so long as it holds together, the fanaticized members can be reached by neither experience nor argument. Identification with the movement and total conformism seem to have destroyed the very capacity for experience, even if it be as extreme as torture or the fear of death. The totalitarian movements aim at and succeed in organizing masses, not classes like the old interest parties of the continental nation states, not citizens with opinions about and interests in the handling of public affairs like the parties of Anglo-Saxon countries. While all political groups depend upon proportionate strength, the totalitarian movements depend on the sheer force of numbers to such an extent that totalitarian regimes seem impossible even under otherwise favorable circumstances in countries 
with relatively small populations. After the First World War, a deeply anti-democratic, pro-dictatorial wave of semi-totalitarian and totalitarian movements swept Europe. Fascist movements spread from Italy to nearly all Central and Eastern European countries. The Czech part of Czechoslovakia was one of the notable exceptions. Yet even Mussolini, who was so fond of the term totalitarian state, did not attempt to establish a full-fledged totalitarian regime and contented himself with, dict with dictatorship and one party. one party rule. Similar non-totalitarian dictatorships sprang up in pre-war Romania, Poland, the Baltic States, Hungary, Portugal and Franco-Spain. <clears throat> the Nazis, who had an unfailing instinct for such differences, used to comment contemptuously on the shortcomings of their fascist allies, while their genuine admiration for the Bolshevik regime in Russia and the Communist Party in Germany was matched and checked only by their contempt for Eastern European races. The only man for whom Hitler had unqualified respect was Stalin the genius. And while in the case of Stalin and the Russian regime, we do not have, and presumably never will have, the rich documentary material that is available for Germany. <clears throat> we nevertheless know since Khrushchev's speech before the 20th Party Congress that Stalin trusted only one man, and that was Hitler. The point is that in all these smaller European countries, non-totalitarian dictatorships were preceded by totalitarian movements, so that it appeared that totalitarianism was too ambitious a name, that although it had served well enough to organize the masses until the movement seized power, the absolute size of the country then forced the would-be totalitarian ruler of masses into the more familiar patterns of class or party dictatorship. The truth is that these countries simply did not control enough human material to allow for the total, total domination and its inherent great losses in population. Without much hope for the conquest of more heavily populated territories, the tyrants in these small countries were forced into a certain old fashioned moderation, lest they lose, lose whatever people they had to rule. This is also why Nazism up to the outbreak of the war and its expansion over Europe lacked so far behind its Russian counterpart, inconsistency and ruthlessness. Even the German people were not numerous enough to allow for the full development of this newest form of government. Only if Germany had won the war, would she have known a fully developed totalitarian rulership and the sacrifices this would have entailed not only for the inferior races, but for the Germans themselves, can be gleaned and evaluated from the legacy of Hitler's plan, plans. In any event, it was only during the war, after the conquest in the East, furnished large masses of people and made the extermination camps possible, that Germany was able to establish a truly totalitarian rule. Conversely, the chances for totalitarian rule are frighteningly good in the lands of traditional oriental despotism in India and China, where there is almost inexhaustible material to feed the power accumulating and man destroying machinery of total domination, and where, moreover, the mass man's typical feeling of superfluousness 
an entirely new phenomenon in Europe, the concomitant of mass unemployment and the population growth of the last 150 years has been prevalent for centuries in the contempt for the value of human life. <clears throat> Moderation or less murderous methods of rule were hardly attributable to the government's fear of population rebellion. Depopulation in their own country was a much more serious threat. Only where great masses are superfluous or can be spared without disastrous results of depopulation is totalitarian rule as distinguished from a totalitarian movement at all possible. Totalitarian movements are possible wherever there are masses for <clears throat> who for one reason or another have acquired the appetite for political organization. Masses are not held together by a consciousness of common interest and they lack that specific class articulateness which is expressed in determined, limited and obtainable goals. The term masses applies only where we deal with people who either because of sheer numbers or indifference or a combination of both cannot be integrated in, into any organization based on common interest into political parties or municipal governments or professional organizations or trade unions. Potentially they exist in every country and form the majority of those large numbers of neutral, politically indifferent people who never join a party and hardly ever go to the polls. It was characteristic of the rise of Nazi movement in Germany and of the communist movements in Europe after 1930 that they recruited their members from this mass of apparently indifferent people whom all other parties had given, uh, given up as too apathetic or too stupid for their attention. The result was that the majority of, the me of their membership consisted of people who never before had appeared on the political scene. This permitted the introduction of entirely new methods into political propaganda and indifference to the arguments of political opponents. These movements not only placed themselves outside and against the party system as a whole, they found a membership that had never been reached, never been spoiled by the party system. Therefore, they did not need to refute opposing, opposing arguments and consistently preferred methods which ended in death rather than persuasion, which spelled terror rather than conviction. They presented disagreements as invari invariably originating in deep, natural, social or psychological sources beyond the control of the individual and therefore beyond the power of reason. This would have been a shortcoming only if they had sincerely entered into competition with other parties. It was not if they were sure of dealing with people who had reason to be equally hostile to all parties. The success of totalitarian movements among the masses meant the end of two illusions of democratically ruled countries in general and of European nation states and their party systems in particular. The first was that the people in its majority had taken an active part in government and that each individual was in sympathy with one's own or somebody else's party. On the contrary, the movements showed that the politically neutral and indifferent masses could easily be the majority in a democratically ruled country, that therefore a democracy could function according to the rules which are actively recognized only by a minority. The second 
democratic illusion exploded by the totalitarian movements was that these politically indifferent masses did not matter, that they were truly neutral and constituted no more than the inarticulate backward setting for the political life of the nation. Now they made apparent that no other organ of public opinion had ever been able to show, namely that democratic government had rested as much on the silent appropriation and tolerance of the indifferent and inarticulate sections of the people as on the articulate and visible institutions and organizations of the country. Thus, <clears throat> when the totalitarian movement movements invaded parliament with their contempt for parliamentary government, they merely appeared inconsistent. Actually, they succeeded in convincing the people at large that parliamentary majorities were spurious and did not necessarily correspond to the realities of the country, thereby undermining the self-respect and confidence of governments which also believed in majority rule rather than in their constitutions. It has been frequently pointed out that totalitarian movements use and abuse democratic freedoms in order to abolish them. This is not just devilish cleverness on the part of the leaders or childish stupidity on the part of the masses. Democratic freedoms may be based on the equality of all citizens before the law, yet they acquire their meaning and function organically, where the citizens belong to and are represented by groups or form a social and political hierarchy. The breakdown of the class system, the only social and politi political stratification of the European nation states,
Can you hear me? Certainly was one of the most dramatic events in recent German history <clears throat> and as favorable to the rise of Nazism as the absence of social stratification in Russia's immense rural population. This great flaccid body destitute of political education, almost inaccessible to ideas capable of ennobling action, was to the Bolshevik overthrow of the democratic Kerensky government. <clears throat> Conditions in pre-Hitler Germany are indicative of the dangers implicit to the development of the Western part of the world since with the end of the Second World War, the same dramatic event of a breakdown of the class system repeated itself in almost every, in almost all European countries. While events in Russia clearly indicate the direction which the inevitable revolutionary changes in Asia may take. Practically speaking, it will make little difference whether totalitarian movements adopt the pattern uh, of Nazism or Bolshevism, organize the masses in the name of race or class, pretend to follow the laws of life and nature or of dialectics and economics. Indifference to public affairs, neutrality on political issues are in themselves no sufficient cause for the rise of totalitarian movements. The competitive and acquisitive society of the bourgeoisie had produced apathy and even hostility toward public life, not only and not even primarily in the social strata which were exploited and excluded from active participation in the rule of the country, but first of all, in its own class. The long period of false modesty, when the bourgeoisie was content with being the dominating class in society without aspiring to political rule, which it gladly left to the aristocracy, was followed by the imperialist era, during which the bourgeoisie grew increasingly hostile to existing national institutions and began to claim and to organize itself for the exercise of political power. Both the early apathy and the later demand for monopolistic dictatorial direction of the nation's foreign affairs had their roots in a way and philosophy of life so insistently and exclusively centered on the individual success or failure in ruthless competition that a citizen's duties and responsibilities could only be felt to be a needless drain on his limited time and energy. These bourgeois attitudes are very useful for those forms of dictatorship in which a strong man takes upon himself the troublesome responsibility for the conduct of public affairs. They are a positive hindrance to totalitarian movements which can tolerate bourgeois individualism no more than any other kind of individualism. The apathetic sections of bourgeois dominated society, no matter how unwilling they may be to assume the responsibility of citizens, keep their personalities intact, if only because without them, they could hardly be they could hardly expect to survive the competitive struggle for life. The decisive differences between 19th century mob organizations and 20th century mass movements are difficult to perceive because the modern totalitarian leaders do not differ much in psychology and mentality from the earlier mob leaders whose moral standards and political devices so closely re resembled those of the bourgeoisie. Yet, insofar as individualism characterized the bourgeoisie's as well as the mob's attitude to life, the totalitarian movements can rightly claim they were the first truly anti-bourgeois parties. None of their 19th century predecessors, neither the society of the 10th of December, which helped Louis Napoleon into power, the butcher brigade to the Dreyfus affair, the black hundreds of the Russian pogroms, nor the pan movements ever involved their members to the point of complete loss of individual claims and ambition, or had ever realized that an organization could succeed in extinguishing individual identity permanently and not just for the moment of collective historical action. The relationship between the bourgeois dominated class society no, don't step on the computer. The relationship between the bourgeois dominated class society and the masses which emerged from its breakdown is not the same as the relationship between the bourgeoisie and the mob, 
which was a byproduct of capitalist production. The masses share with the mob only one characteristic, namely that both stand tall, both stand outside all social ramifications and normal political representation. The masses do not inherit as the mob does, albeit in a perverted form, the standards and attitudes of the dominating class, but reflect and somehow pervert the standards and attitudes towards public affairs of all classes. The standards of the mass man were determined not only and not even primarily by the specific class to which he had once belonged, but rather by the all pervasive influences and convictions which were tacitly and inarticulately, inarticulately shared by all classes of society alike. Membership in a class, although looser and never as inevitably determined by social origin as in the orders and estates of feudal society, was generally by birth, and only extraordinarily, extraordinary gifts or luck could change it. Social status was decisive for the individual's participation in politics, and except in cases of national emergency, when he was supposed to act only as a national, regardless of his class or party membership, he was never directly confronted with public affairs or felt resp directly responsible for their conduct. The rise of a class to greater importance in the community was always accompanied by the education and training of a certain number of its members for politics as a job, for, for paid, or if they could afford it, unpaid service in the government and representation of the class in parliament. That the majority of people remained outside all party or other political organizations was not important to anyone and no truer for one particular class than another. In other words, membership in a class, its limited group obligations and traditional attitudes towards government prevented the growth of a citizenry that felt individually and personally responsible for the rule of the country. This apolitical character of the nation state's population, populations came to light only when the class system broke down and carried with it the whole fabric of visible and invisible threads which bound the people to the body politic. The breakdown of the class system meant automatically the breakdown of the party system, chiefly because these parties, being interest parties, could no longer represent class interests. Their continuance was of some importance to the members of, of former classes who hoped against hope to regain their old, old social status and who stuck together, not because they had common interests any longer, but because they hoped to restore them. The parties consequently became more and more psychological and ideological in their propaganda, more and more apologetic and nostalgic in their political approach. They had lost, moreover, without being aware of it, those neutral supporters who had never been interested in politics because they felt no parties existed to take care of their interests. So the first signs of the breakdown of the continental party system were not the desertion of old party members, but the failure to recruit members from the younger generation and the loss of the silent consent and support of the unorganized masses who suddenly shed their ap apathy and went wherever they saw an opportunity to voice their new violent opposition. The fall of protecting class walls transformed the slumbering majorities behind all parties into one great unorganized, structureless mass of furious individuals who had nothing in common except their vague apprehension that the hopes of party members were doomed. That consequently, the most respected, articulate and representative members of the community were fools and that all the powers that be were not so much evil as they were equally stupid and fraudulent. It was of no great consequence for the birth of this new terrifying negative solidarity that the unemployed worker hated the status quo and the powers that be in the form of the Social Democratic Party, the expro expropriated small property owner in the form of a centrist or rightist party and the former members of the middle and upper classes in the form of the traditional extreme right. The number of this mass of generally dissatisfied and desperate men increased rapidly in Germany and Austria after the First World War, 
when inflation and unemployment added to the disrupting consequences of military defeat. They existed in great proportion in all the succession states, and they have supported the extreme movements in France and Italy since the Second World War. In this atmosphere of the breakdown of class society, the psychology of European mass man developed. The fact that with monotonous but abstract uniformity, the same fate had befallen a mass of individuals did not prevent their judgment, them, their judging themselves in terms of individual failure or the world in terms of specific injustice. This self-centered bitterness, however, although repeated again and again in individual isolation, was not a common bond, despite its tendency to extinguish individual differences, because it was based on no common interest, economic or social or political. Self-centeredness, therefore, went in hand in hand with a decisive weakening of the instinct for self-preservation. Selflessness, in the sense that oneself does not matter, the feeling of being expendable was no longer the expression of individual idealism, but a mass phenomenon. The old adage that the poor and oppressed have nothing to lose but their chains no longer applied to the mass men, for they lost much more than the chains of misery when they lost interest in their own well-being. The source of all the worries and cares which make human life troublesome and anguished was gone. Compared to their non-materialism, a Christian monk looks like a man absorbed in worldly affairs. Hitler, Himmler, who knew so well the mentality of those he organized, described not only his SS men, but the large strata from which he recruited them, when he said they were not interested in everyday problems, but only in ideological in questions of importance for decades and centuries. So the man knows he is working for a great task which occurs but once in 2000 years. The gigantic massing of individuals produced a mentality which like Cecil Rhodes some 40 years before, thought in continents and felt in centuries. Eminent European scholars and statesmen had predicted from the early early 19th century onward, the rise of the mass man and the coming of a mass age. A whole literature on mass behavior and mass psychology had demonstrated and popularized the wisdom so familiar to the ancients of the affinity between democracy and dictatorship, between mob rule and tyranny. They had prepared certain politically conscious and overconscious sections of the Western educated world for the emergence of demagogues, for gullibility, superstition and brutality. Yet, while all these predictions in a sense came true, they lost much of their significance in view of such unexpected and unpredicted phenomena as the radical loss of self-interest, the cynical or bored indifference in the fate of death, face of death, or other personal catastrophes, the passionate inclination towards the most abstract notions as guides for life, and the general contempt for even the most obvious rules of common sense. The masses, contrary to prediction, did not result from growing equality of condition, from the spread of general education and its inevitable lowering of standards and popularization of content. America, the classical land of equality of condition of general education with all its shortcomings knows less of the modern psychology of masses than perhaps any other country in the world. It soon became apparent that highly cultured people were particularly attracted to mass movements and that generally highly differentiated individualism and sophistication did not prevent, indeed sometimes encouraged, the self-abandonment into the mass for which, for which mass movements provided. Since the obvious fact that individualization and cultivation do not prevent the formation of mass attitudes was so unexpected, it has frequently been blamed on the morbidity or nihilism of the modern intelligentsia, upon a supposedly typical intellectual self-hatred, upon the spirit's hostility to life and antagonism to vitality. Yet the much slandered intellectuals were only the most 
illustrative example and the most articulate spokesman for a much more general phenomenon, social atomization and extreme individualization preceded the mass movements. Hello everyone. We're all so excited to get to the end of the day that we've actually got ahead of ourselves on our reading by about 20 minutes. So to fill that time, I'm just going to read the preface to all of um, Origins of Totalitarianism for the whole book um, because it's beautiful and because it is very timely today. And after that, I'll hand back over um, to Nelly who will pick up from where Bob Eagleston left us. Preface, The Origins of Totalitarianism. Two world wars in one generation, separated by an uninterrupted chain of local wars and revolution, followed by no peace treaty for the vanquished and no respite for the victor, have ended in the anticipation of third world war between the two remaining powers. This moment of anticipation is like the calm that settles after all hopes have died. We no longer hope for the restoration of the old world order with all its traditions or for the reintegration of the masses of five continents who have been thrown into a chaos produced by the violence of wars and revolutions and the growing decay of all that has been spared. Under the most diverse conditions and desperate circumstances, we watch the development of the same phenomena, homelessness, on an unprecedented scale, rootlessness to an unprecedented depth. Never has our future been more unpredictable. Never have we depended so much on political forces that cannot be trusted to follow the rules of common sense and self-interest. Forces that look like sheer insanity if judged by the standards of other centuries. It is as though mankind had divided itself between those who believe in human omnipotence, who think that everything is possible if one knows how to organise the masses for it, and those for whom powerlessness has become the major experience of their lives. On the level of historical insight and political thought, there prevails an ill-defined general agreement that the essential structure of all civilizations is at the breaking point. Although it may seem better preserved in some parts of the world than in others, it could nowhere provide the guidance to the possibilities of the century or an adequate response to its horrors. Desperate hope and desperate fear often seem closer to the center of events than balanced judgment and measured insight. The central events of our time are not less effectively forgotten by those committed to a belief in an unavoidable doom than by those who've given themselves up to reckless optimism. This book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, has been written against a backdrop of both reckless optimism and reckless despair. It holds that progress and doom are two sides of the same medal, that both are articles of superstition and are not of faith. It was written out of the conviction that it should be possible to discover the hidden mechanics by which all um, traditional elements of our political and spiritual world were dissolved into a conglomeration where everything seems to have lost specific value and has become unrecognizable for human comprehension, unable, unusable for human purpose. To yield to the mere process of disintegration has become an irresistible temptation. Not only because it has assumed the spurious grandeur of historical necessity, but also because everything outside it has begun to appear lifeless, bloodless, meaningless and unreal. The conviction that everything that happens on earth must be comprehensible to mankind can lead to interpreting history by commonplaces. Comprehension does not mean denying the outrageous, deducing the unprecedented 
from precedence, or explaining phenomena by such analogies and general generalities that the impact of reality and the shock of experience are no longer felt. It means, rather, examining and bearing consciously the burden with which our century has placed on us, neither denying its existence nor submitting meekly to its weight. Comprehension, in short, means the unpremeditated, attentive, facing up to and resisting of reality, whatever it might be. In this sense, it must be um, possible to face and understand the outrageous fact that so small and in world politics so unimportant, a phenomenon as the Jewish question and anti-Semitism could have become the catalytic agent for first the Nazi movement, then a world war, and finally the establishment of death fatros. Or the grotesque disparity between cause and effect which introduced the area of imperialism where economic difficulties led in a few decades to a profound transformation of political conditions all over the world. Or the curious contradiction between the totalitarian movements avowed cynical realism and their conspicuous disdain of the whole texture of reality. Or the irritating incompatibility between the actual power of modern man and the importance of modern men to live in and understand the sense of a world in which their own strength has been established. The totalitarian attempt at global conquest and total domination has been a destructive way out of all impasses. Its victory may coincide with the destruction of humanity. Wherever it is ruled, it has begun to destroy the essence of man. Yet to turn our backs on the destructive forces of the century is of little avail. The trouble is, is that our period has so strangely intertwined with the good and the bad that without the imperialists expansion for expansionist sake, the world might never have become one. Without the bourgeoisie's political device of power for power's sake, the extent of human strength might never have been discovered. Without the fictitious world of totalitarian movements in which with unparalleled clarity, the essential uncertainties of her time have been spelled out, we might have been driven to our doom without ever have becoming aware of what had happened. Anti-Semitism, not merely the hatred of the Jews, imperialism, not merely conquest, totalitarianism, not merely dictatorship, one after the other, one more brutally than the other, have demonstrated that human dignity needs a new guarantee which can be found only in a new political principle, in a new law on earth, whose validity this time must comprehend the whole of humanity, while its power must remain strictly limited, rooted in and controlled by newly defined territorial entities. We can no longer afford to take that which was good in the past and simply call it our heritage, to discard the bad and simply think of it as a dead load by which itself time will bury in oblivion. The subterranean stream of Western history has finally come to the surface and usurped the dignity of our tradition. This is the reality in which we live. And this is why all efforts to escape from the grimness of the present into nostalgia for a still intact past or into the anticipated oblivion of a better future are vain. Hannah Arendt, 1950. Which, which much more easily and earlier, am I starting? <laughs> yes. Which much more easily and earlier than they did the sociable, non-individualistic members of the traditional parties attracted the completely unorganized, the typical 
non-joiner, who for individualistic reason always had refused to recognize social links or obligation. The truth is that the masses grew out of the fragment of a highly atomized society whose competitive structure and concomitant loneliness of the individual had been held in check only through membership in a class. The shift characteristic of the mass men is not brutality and backwardness, but is isolation and lack of normal social relationship. Coming from the, the class-ridden society of the nation states, whose crack had been cemented with nationalistic sentiment, it is only natural that these masses in the first helplessness of their new experience have tended towards an especially violent uh, nationalism to which mass leaders have yielded against their own instinct and purpose for purely demagogic reason. Neither tribal nationalism nor rebellious nihilism is characteristic of or ideologically appropriate to the masses as they were to the mob. But the most gifted mass leader of our time have still risen from the mob rather than from the masses. Hitler's biography reads like a textbook example in this respect. And the point about Stalin is that he comes from the conspiratory apparatus of the Bolshevik party with its specific text mixture of outcasts and revolutionaries. Hitler's early party almost exclusively composed of misfits, failure and adventurers, indeed represented the armed Bohemian, who were only the reverse side of bourgeois society and whom consequently the German bourgeoisie should have been able to use successfully for its own purposes. Actually, the bourgeoisie was as much taken in by the Nazi as was the Rome Schlescher faction is a rash where, oh dear, uh, which also thought that Hitler, whom they had used as a stool pigeon or the SA, which they had used for militaristic propaganda and paramilitary training, will act as an agent and help in the establishment of a military, military dictatorship. Both considered the Nazi movement in their own terms, in terms of the political philosophy of the mob and overlook the independent spontaneous support given the new mob leaders by masses as well as the mob leaders genuine talent for creating new form of organization. The mob as leader of the masses was no longer the agent of the bourgeoisie or of anyone else except the masses. That totalitarian, that totalitarian movements depended less on the structurelessness of a mass society than on the specific condition of atomized and individualized masses can best be seen in a comparison of Nazism and Bolshevism, which began in their respective countries under very different circumstances. To change Lenin's revolutionary dictatorship into full totalitarian rule, Stalin had first to create artificially that atomized society, which had been prepared for the Nazis in Germany by historical circumstances. The October revolutions, the October revolution's amazingly easy victory occurred in a country where despotic and centralized bureaucracy govern a structurallessness, structureless, sorry, mass population, which neither the remnant of the rural federal order nor the weak nascent urban capitalist classes had organized. When Lenin said that nowhere in the world Will it, will it have been so easy to win power and so difficult to keep it? He was aware not only of the weakness of the Russian rocking class, but of anarchic social condition in general, which favored sudden changes. 
without the instinct of a mass leader. He was no orator and a passion for public admission and analysis of his own error, which is always, an, which is against the rule of even ordinary demagogy. Lenin sized at once upon all the possible differentiation, social, dem, social, national, professional, that might bring some structure into the population. And he seemed convinced that in such stratification lay the salvation of the revolution. He legalized the anarchic expropriation of the landowner by the rural masses and established thereby for the first and probably last time in Russia that emancipated peasant, uh, peasant class, which since the French Revolution had been the firmer supporter of the Western nation states. He tried to straighten the working class by encouraging independent trade union. He tolerated the timid appearance of a new middle class, which resulted from the NEP uh, policy after the end of the civil war. He introduced further distinguishing feature by organizing and sometimes inventing as many nationalities as possible, furthering national consciousness and awareness of historical and cultural differences, even among the most primitive tribes in the Soviet Union. It seems clear that in these purely practical political matters, Lenin followed his great instinct for statesmanship rather than his Marxist conviction. His policy, at any rate, proved that he was more frightened by the absence of social and other structure than by the possible development of centrifugal tendency in the newly emancipated nationalities or even by the growth of a new bourgeoisie out of the slowly established middle and peasant classes. There is no doubt that Lenin suffered his greatest defeat when, with the outbreak of the civil war, the supreme power that he originally planned to concentrate in the Soviets definitely passed into the end of the party bureaucracy. But even this development, tragic as it was for the course of the revolution, will not necessarily have led to totalitarianism. A one-party dictatorship added only one more class to the already developing social stratification of the country, EI bureaucracy, which according to the socialist critics of the revolution, quote, possessed the state as private property, end of quote, and this was by Marx. At the moment of Lenin's death, the roads were still open. The formation of workers, peasants, and middle class need not necessarily have, no, uh, need not necessarily have led to the class struggle, which had been characteristic of European capitalism. Agriculture could still be developed as a collective cooperative or private basis and the national economy was still free to follow a socialist state capitalist or a free enterprise pattern. None of these alternatives will have automatically destroyed the new structure of the country. All these new classes and nationality were in Stalin's way when he began to prepare the country for totalitarian government. In order to fabricate an atomized and structureless mass, he had first to liquidate the remnant of the power in the Soviets, which as a chief organ of national representation still played a certain role and prevented absolute rule by the party hierarchy. Therefore, he first undermined the national Soviets through the introduction of Bolshevik cell from which alone the highest functionaries to the central committees were appointed. By 1930, 
the last traces of former communal institution had disappeared and had been replaced by a firmly centralized party bureaucracy whose tendency towards russification were not too different from those of the Tsarist regime, except that the new bureaucrats were no longer afraid of literacy. The Bolshevik government then proceeded to the liquidation of masses and started for ideological and propaganda reason with the property owning classes, the new middle class in the cities and the peasants in the country. Because of the combination of numbers and property, the peasants up to then had been potentially the most powerful classes class in the union. Their liquidation consequently was more sorrow and more cruel than that of any other group and was carried through by artificial famine and deportation under the pretext of expropriation of the Kulak and collectivization of the Gulag and collectivization. The liquidation, liquidation of the middle and peasant classes was completed in the early 30s. Those who were not among the many million of dead or the million of deported slave laborer had learned who is a master here, had realized that their lives and the lives of their family depended not upon their fellow citizens, but exclusively, exclusively on the whim of the government, which they faced in complete loneliness without any help whatsoever from the group to which they happened to belong. The exact moment when collectivization produced a new peasantry bound by common interest which owning to its numerical and economic key position in the country's economy, again, uh, presented a potential danger to totalitarian rule, cannot be determined either from statistic or documentary sources. But for those who know how to read totalitarian source material, this moment had come two years before Stalin died when he proposed to dissolve the collectives and transform them into larger units. He did not leave to carry out this plan. This time, the sacrifices will have been still greater and the chaotic consequences for the total economy still more catastrophic than the liquidation of the first peasant class. But there is no reason to doubt that he might have succeeded. There is no class that cannot be wiped out if a sufficient number of its members are murdered. The next class to be liquidated as a group were the worker. As a class, they were much weaker and offered less, much less resistance than the peasants because their spontaneous expropriation of factory owner during the revolution Unlike the peasants, expropriation of landowner had been frustrated. I keep going. Okay, I keep going. Um, there we go. Had been frustrated at once by the government, which confisca confiscated the factories as state property under the pretext that the state belonged to the proletariat in any event. The Staganov system adopted in the early 30s, in the early 30s, sorry, broke up all solidarity and class consciousness among the worker. First by the ferocious competition and second by the temporary solidification of Staganovit aristocracy with social distance from the ordinary worker naturally was felt more accurately than the distance between the workers and the management. This process was completed in 1938 with the introduction of the labor book, which transformed the old Russian worker class officially into a gigantic forced labor force. On top of these measures, look, apology everyone, I'm just finishing this. On top of these measures, 
came the liquidation of that bureaucracy, which had helped to carry out the previous liquidation measure. It took Stalin about two years, from 1938 to 1930, sorry, from 1936 to 1938, to rid himself of the whole organiz of the whole organi ah, of the whole administrative. I'm going to repeat that whole sentence. Apologies, everybody. On top of these measures came the liquidation of that bureaucracy, which had helped to carry out the previous liquidation measure. It took Stalin about two years, from 1936 to 1938, to rid himself of the whole administrative and military aristocracy of the Soviet society. Nearly all offices, factories, economic and cultural bodies, governments, party and military bureaus came into new ends when nearly half the administrative, personal, party and non-party had been swept out and more than 50% of all party members and at least 8 million more were liquidated. Again, the introduction of an interior passport on which all departure from one city to another have to be registered and authorized completed the destruction of the party bureaucracy as a class. As for its juridical status, the bureaucracy, along with the party functionaries, was now on the same level with the workers. It too had now became, become a part of the vast multitude of Russian forced laborers, and its status as a privileged class in Soviet society was a thing of the past. And since this general purge ended with the liquidation of the highest police officials, the same who had organized the general purge in the first place, not even the cadre of the GPU, which had carried out the terror, could any longer delude themselves that as a group, they represented anything at all, let alone power. None of this immense sacrifice in human life was motivated by a raison d'etat in the old sense of the term. None of the liquidated social strata was hostile to the regime or likely to become hostile in the foreseeable future. Active organized opposition had ceased to exist in 1930 when Stalin, in his speech to the 16th Party Congress, outlawed the right and the leftist deviation inside the party. And even this feeble opposition had hardly been able to base himself on any of the existing class. Okay, I'm gonna uh, repeat what uh, was just read so um, that we stay in order. Traded at once by the government which confiscated the factories as state property under the pretext that the state belonged to the proletariat in any event. The Stekhanov system adopted, adopted in the early 30s broke up all solidarity and class consciousness among the workers, first by the ferocious competition and second by the temporary solidification of a Stakhanovite aristoc aristocracy whose social distance from the ordinary worker naturally was felt more acutely than the distance between the workers and the management. This process was completed in 1938 with the introduction of the labor book which transformed the whole Russian worker class officially into a gigantic forced labor force. On top of these measures came the liquidation of that bureaucracy, which had helped to carry out the previous liquidation measures. It took Stalin about two years, from 1936 to 1938, to rid himself of the whole administrative and military aristocracy of the Soviet society. Nearly all offices, factories, economic and cultural bodies, government, party, and military bureaus came into new hands when, quote, nearly half the administrative personnel, party and non-party had been swept out, unquote. 
and more than 50% of all party members and, quote, at least 8 million more, unquote, were liquidated. Again, the introduction of an interior passport on which all departures from one city to another have to be registered and authorized completed the destruction of the party bureaucracy as a class. As for its juridical status, the bureaucracy, along with the party functionaries, was now on the same level with the workers. It, too, had now become a part of the vast multitude of Russian forced laborers, and its status as a privileged class in Soviet society was a thing of the past. And since this general purge ended with the liquidation of the highest police officials, the same who had organized the general purge in the first place, not even the caterers of the GPU, which had carried out the terror, could any longer delude themselves that as a group they represented anything at all, let alone power. None of these immense sacrifices in human life was motivated by a raison d'etat in the old sense of the term. None of the liquidated social strata was hostile to the regime or likely to become hostile in the foreseeable future. Active organized opposition had ceased to exist by 1930 when Stalin, in his speech to the 16th Party Congress, outlawed the rightist and leftist deviations inside the party, and even these feeble oppositions had hardly been able to base themselves on any of the existing classes. Dictatorial terror, distinguished from totalitarian terror in so far as it threatens only authentic opponents, but not harmless citizens without political opinions, had been grim enough to suffocate all political life, open or clandestine, even before Lenin's death. Intervention from abroad, which might ally itself with one of the dissatisfied sections in the population, was no longer a danger when, by 1930, the Soviet regime had been recognized by a majority of governments and concluded commercial and other international agreements with many countries. Nor did Stalin's government eliminate such a possibility as far as the people themselves were concerned. We now know that Hitler, if he had been an ordinary conqueror and not a rival totalitarian ruler, might have had an extraordinary chance to win for his cause at least the people of the Ukraine. If the liquidation of classes made no political sense, it was positively disastrous for the Soviet economy. The consequences of the artificial famine in 1933 were felt for years throughout the country. The introduction of the Stekhanov system in 1935, with its arbitrary speed up of individual output and its complete disregard of the necessities for teamwork in industrial production, resulted in a, quote, chaotic imbalance, unquote, of the young industry. The liquidation of the bureaucracy, that is, of the class of factory managers and engineers, finally deprived industrial enterprises of what little experience and know-how the new Russian technical intelligentsia had been able to acquire. Equality of condition among their subjects has been one of the foremost concerns of despotism and tyrannies since ancient times. Yet such equalization is not sufficient for totalitarian rule because it leaves more or less intact certain non-political communal bonds between the subjects, such as family ties and common cultural interests. If totalitarianism takes its own claim seriously, it must come to the point where it has, quote, to finish once and for all with the neutrality of chess, unquote. That is, with the autonomous existence of any activity whatsoever. The lovers of, quote, 
chess for the sake of chess, unquote, aptly compared by their liquidator with the lovers of, quote, art for art's sake, unquote, are not yet absolutely atomized elements in a mass society whose completely heterogeneous uniformity is one of the primary conditions for totalitarianism. From the point of view of totalitarian rulers, a society devoted to chess for the sake of chess is only in degree different and less dangerous than a class of farmers for the sake of farming. Himmler quite aptly defined the SS member as the new type of man who, under no circumstances, will ever do, quote, a thing for its own sake, unquote. Mass atomization in Soviet society was achieved by the skillful use of repeated purchase, which invariably precede actual group liquidation. In order to destroy all social and family ties, the purchase are conducted in such a way as to threaten with the same fate the defendant and all his ordinary relations from mere acquaintances up to his closest friends and relatives. The, can the consequence of the simple and ingenious device of quote unquote guilt by association is that as soon as a man is accused, his former friends are transformed immediately into his bitterest enemies. In order to save their own skins, they volunteer information and rush in with denunciations to corroborate the non-existence evidence against him. This obviously is the only way to prove their own trustworthiness. Retrospectively, they will try to prove that their acquaintance or friendship with the accused was only a pretext for spying on him and revealing him as a saboteur, a Trotskyite, a foreign spy, or a fascist. Merit being, quote, gorged by the number of your denunciations of close comrades, unquote, it is obvious that the most elementary caution demands that one avoid all intimate contacts, if possible, not in order to prevent discovery of one's secret thoughts, but rather to eliminate, in the almost certain case of future trouble, all persons who might have not only an ordinary chief interest in your denunciation, but an irresistible need to bring about your ruin simply because they are in danger of their own lives. In the last analysis, it has been through the development of this device to its farthest and most fantastic extremes that Bolshevik rulers have succeeded in creating an atomized and individualized society the like of which we have never seen before and which events or catastrophes alone would hardly have brought about. Totalitarian movements are mass organizations of atomized, isolated individuals. Compared with all other parties and movements, their most conspicuous external characteristic is their demand for total, unrestricted, unconditional, and unalterable loyalty of the individual member. This demand is made by the leaders of totalitarian movements even before they seize power. It usually precedes the total organization of the country under the actual rule, and it follows from the claim of their ideologies that their organization will encompass, in due course, the entire human race. Where, however, totalitarian rule has not been prepared by a totalitarian movement, and this, in contradistinction to Nazi Germany, was the case in Russia, the movement has to be organized afterward and the conditions for its growth have artificially to be created in order to make total loyalty, the psychological basis for total domination, at all possible. Such loyalty can be expected only from the completely isolated human being who, without any other social ties to family, friends, comrades, or even mere uh, acquaintances, derives his sense of having a place in the world only from his belonging, his belonging to a movement, his membership in the party. 
Total loyalty is possible only when fidelity is emptied of all concrete content from which changes of mind might naturally arise. The totalitarian movements, each in its own way, have done their utmost to get rid of the party programs which specified concrete content and which they inherited from earlier non-totalitarian stages of development. No matter how radically they might have been phrased, every definite political goal which does not simply assert or circumscribe the claim to world rule, every political program which deals with issues more specific than, quote, ideological questions of importance for centuries, unquote, is an obstruction to totalitarianism. Hitler's greatest achievement in the organization of the Nazi movement, which he gradually built up from the obscure crackpot, crackpot membership of a typically nationalistic little party, was that he unburdened the movement of the party's earlier program, not by changing or officially abolishing it, but simply by refusing to talk about it or discuss its points, whose relative moderateness of content and phraseology were very soon outdated. Stalin's task in this, as in other respects, was much more formidable. The socialist program of the Bolshevik party was a much more troublesome burden than the 25 points of an amateur economist and a crackpot politician. But Stalin achieved eventually, after having abolished the factions of the Russian party, the same result through the constant zigzag of the communist party lines and the constant reinterpretation and application of Marxism, which voided the doctrine of all its content because it was no longer possible to predict what course or action it would inspire. The fact that the most perfect education in Marxism and Leninism was no guide whatsoever for political behavior, that, on the contrary, one could follow the party line only if one repeated each morning what Stalin had announced the night before, naturally resulted in the same state of mind, the same concentrated obedience, undivided by any attempt to understand what one was doing, that Himmler's ingenious watchword for his SS men expressed, quote, my honor is my loyalty, unquote. Thank you, Hanno. Thank you, Hanno. Um, we're still, um, all of us running ahead of time, so anxious are we to get to the end of um, today. So we're gonna take a brief five um, minute interlude while we're um, organizing our next um, speaker. So do um, bear with us and we'll see you again in about five minutes.
Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, especially America. Um, we're about to resume our reading of Origins of Totalitarianism in about 10 minutes. Um, but we were all so keen to get to the end of today that we read very quickly. So we're now about 15 minutes <laughs> ahead of ourselves. Um, so very kindly, uh, Matt Longo, um, who is an Arendt scholar, who's literally about uh, 80 miles away from me now in Amsterdam. Matt, I'm in Norwich. I could probably wave to you from here. Yeah. Has um, decided to join me. Um, I've never met Matt before, but we've both worked on a rent for about the last 10 years because we're fascinated with questions of citizenship and of borders. So I suspect we know each other's work, although we've never met until this extraordinary day. So we're going to chat about what a rent means to us for about five minutes. And then Matt is going to take up from where we left the story in about a third of the way in to Origins of Totalitarianism. Matt, welcome. Um, and it's really great to meet you in very unusual circumstances. Yeah, <laughs> but I just fantastic. wanted to, I just wanted to, sooner. yeah, it should have happened sooner. I was just interested in um, wondering why you wanted to read today, why you thought it was a good thing to do. Yeah, I mean, obviously Arendt has never been more relevant, which of course I feel like every generation has had the uh, excuse to say that Arendt has never been more relevant, which probably says more about Arendt than any um, think about thing about the moment. Yeah, I work a lot with Arendt. You know, my uh, own work has a lot to do with, with borders, as you mentioned. And I've started uh, a new project that's actually even more Arendtian or Arendt focused. Um, than ever, because it started to look in particular at the agency of border guards. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. I am fascinated by the ways in which uh, the uniform, right, the outfit, ways in which the embodied forms of authority uh, change the actor. There's a, uh, it's often said that, you know, you, you give someone a uniform and they become a pig. That's kind of a, an expression we take from, from German, this idea that you, uh, are shaped somehow by the institution. The institution alters your behavior. And uh, in particular, I've been reading a lot and thinking a lot about Eichmann in this regard, that the crime of Eichmann was a kind of unthinking. It was uncritical thinking, uh, which of course is one of the main themes of Origins also, right? The ways in which we, through ideology, lose our capacity for criticism and judgment. And the question then about understanding ways in which authority, um, once it becomes embodied, uh, or authority, the, the, the owners of the uniform, so to speak, start to lose that capacity and why, and how it can be regained. And I find the question of the border guard, the person with the uniform, uh, as sort of an idiom or an instance of that um, a moment where authority takes form and then ultimately maybe perverts towards a kind of unthinkingness and uh, how that happens and how we get out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a way, a rent for me is, is, uh, is totally structured my thought. I don't know if that helps remotely answer your question. It does actually, as, as you were talking, because you're a political scientist and I come to a rent from comparative literature and critical theory. And as soon as you said, um, the border guard, I'm interested in the border guard. I immediately thought of Arendt's um, fondness for a poem by Brecht, which with an incomprehensibly long title, which I can't remember um, um, just now, but someone will no doubt put it in the chat. And in the story, um, in the poem, Brecht tells the story of a Chinese sage, this is Tao Tsai, trying to cross the border um, and because he's being pushed into exile. And the border guard is cor is slightly corrupt. So he says to the, says to the sage, well, what do you got? You know, and let's let's do some border trade here. And his 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 page says, but he's he he's a master, he's a master of wisdom. And the border guard says, Okay, I'll have that then. And the border guard <laughs> forgets to um he kind of in your language, he takes his uniform off, 
He feeds the sage for, you know, seven days and listens to his wisdom. And Arendt tells a story about how they so loved um, the refugees when she was a refugee and she was crossing borders or not crossing borders or as Walter Benjamin discovered crossing borders and then being told he has to get back. She loved this poem because it, it was sort of like the counter to what you're saying. So against the kind of thoughtless mindlessness of becoming border control, of embodying what would happen if the border guards suddenly said, well, I, mean, I might just listen to you instead. So there's always these two bits in a rent that are kind of, this is the diagnosis of where we are, which is the bit we're reading today. But there are always these moments of, of um, you yeah. know, what does she call it? There's a miracle, the oh. impossible miracle of uh, something else happening. Yeah, and in fact, just to riff off that, I uh, so part of what interests me now in this in this work I'm doing is actually what I think of as the inverse Eichmann problem, right? Where the Eichmann problem was that you just followed the law, even if I mean you did it uncritically, and even if it was against any conception of justice you might uh, you know rationally pursue, uh, because it was the law. And I'm interested in this moment in uh, the late '80s as the Iron Curtain started to fall apart. And you had this period where people started to question the institution they were protecting. It was about 80, the summer of 89. And you had border guards start to put down their weapons and start to essentially, in the Orentian way of thinking, they started to think critically. They started to, they started to make cogent judgments or to break the spell of ideology. She talks about it in Origins as a spell. And that idea of how we start to, uh, to think critically in that way uh, is exactly the point. Because of course, it's easy to get very pessimistic and uh, certainly Arendt helps us <laughs> with uh, satisfy our craving for pessimism. I mean, she's no, um, as much as we, we that, that read quite a lot of her uh, might like to find positive bits, uh, certainly one can read her as, a, as an you know, infinite, uh, infinite um, darkness, which of course is not her point. Um, in fact, you know, she famously was as critical of, of progress as doom, right? And that was her um, mantra, or sorry, doom as progress. But uh, nonetheless, uh, it is, yeah, it's precisely my interest to do that. It's to say, well, but there are all these ways we can use her to understand uh, the flip side of the, of, the, of the doom scenario and the coming into judgment, coming out of the uniform, uh, which is, yeah, it's very moving. Um, yeah, and it's also very um, challenging. I mean, I was um, thinking again where, where she talks about being, you have to be aware of both reckless optimism and reckless despair in equal measure. But the other um, great thing about um, what, what you're saying is, you know, how do we dig out those moments of possibility? And the thing I always come back to in Arendt is she doesn't give us blueprints where she says in the beginning of Origins of Totalitarianism, Comprehension does not mean deducing the unprecedented from precedents. It doesn't mean um, denying, it means facing up to and resisting reality. And I think this is so much our challenge today because we keep on trying to produce narratives that will account for now and get us out of it, <laughs> yeah, but they're not working. Yeah, but also it's part of her uh, general intellectual mantra, which is about understanding. The point was to understand the phenomenon the fact that you're through your process of understanding, you might change it or help people change it, fantastic. But the core is understanding it. And I think that's something that a lot of us identify with. You know, why are we here on election day reading? <laughs> and in a way it's the most scholarly practice, but one that we also uh, find beautiful and powerful. And mm -hmm. if the question is why, the answer, the best answer in a way is a rents, right? Which is that what one thing we can do now in this present moment of tur turmoil and, and conflict and, and fear uh, is to understand what's happening and to dedicate ourselves to that. And so in a way we're using her text the way she used, um, think of all the, the, you know, the text she builds origins out of, right? I mean, all these great works about the Third Reich and about Stalin and, you know, she's, she uh, was so generous in her uh, basically giving the future all of these points of, of, of her own wisdom, all this understanding she had, you know, developed. And I feel like that's what we're doing here in a way. Yeah. We're fulfilling that project. Yeah. Well, with I was just reminded actually when 
the moment when she escaped from Gurr's detention camp and went to Montauban to the library and sat there with loads of others and just read. And there mm -hmm. she was, you know, she didn't, you know, France was just being occupied. Yeah, and right. she's sitting in the library with Klaus Witt's you know, Book of War and Proust. <laughs> Well, and, and it's and it's part of what's so powerful about the uh, the image of her playing chess with Benjamin, right? I mean, this is yeah. why that image is so powerful because, in a way, it's so almost profoundly calm in this this the storms outside. But it's it's the space that she she wanted to harbor this idea of a of a thoughtful, um, you know, warm community of thinking. And in a way, the fact that it took this form is a historical artifact and a, and a tragic one, given what would, what would befall Benjamin. Um, but in a way, still, you know, she, she found a house for thought wherever she was, right? That's kind of her. Um... Yeah, oh, that's great. I'm just, with that thought, um, I'm going to hand over to you um, for the Zoom of thought that we've had to <laughs> <laughs> that we're creating today. But Samantha Hill has just reminded me that the Brecht poem I was referring to is, of course, the legend on the origin of the book, Tao Xi Xing, during Lao Xi's journey into exile. Matt, I could talk to you all day, but I really want to hear you now, hear that echo and read. We'll have to find another occasion. We will. Thank you. Lack of or ignoring of a party program is by itself not necessarily a sign of totalitarianism. The first to consider programs and platforms as needless scraps of paper and embarrassing promises inconsistent with the style and impetus of a movement was Mussolini with his fascist philosophy of activism and inspiration through the historical moment itself. Mere lust for power combined with contempt for talkative articulation of what they uh, intend to do with it is characteristic of all mob leaders, but does not come up to the standards of totalitarianism. The true goal of fascism was only to seize, to seize power and establish the fascist elite as uncontested ruler over the country. Totalitarianism is never content to rule uh, by external means, namely through the state and a machinery of violence thanks to its peculiar ideology and the role assigned to it in this apparatus of coercion. Totalitarianism, is dis totalitarianism has discovered a means of dominating and terrorizing human beings from within. In this sense, it eliminates the distance between the rulers and the ruled and achieves a condition in which power and the will to power, as we understand them, plays no role or at best a secondary role. In substance, the totalitarian leader is nothing more nor less than the functionary of the masses. He leads. He's not a power hungry individual imposing a tyrannical and arbitrary will upon his subjects. Being a mere functionary, he can be replaced at any time. And he depends just as much on the will of the masses he embodies as the masses depend on him. Without him, they would lack external representation and remain an amorphous horde. Without the masses, uh, the leader is a non-entity. Hitler, who was fully aware of this interdependence, expressed it once in a speech addressed to the SA. All that you are, you are through me. All that I am, I am through you alone. We are only too inclined to belittle such statements or to misunderstand them in the sense that acting is defined here in terms of giving and executing orders. As has happened too often in the political tradition in history of the West. But this idea has always presupposed someone in command who thinks and wills and then imposes his thought and will on a thought and will deprived group, be it by persuasion, authority, or violence. Hitler, however, was of the opinion that even thinking exists only by virtue of giving or executing orders and thereby eliminated even theoretically the distinction between thinking and acting on one hand and between the rulers and the ruled 
on the other. Neither National Socialism nor Bolshevism has ever proclaimed a new form of government or asserted that its goals were reached with the seizure of power and the control of the state machinery. Their idea of domination was something that no state and no mere apparatus of violence can ever achieve, but only a movement that is constantly kept in motion, namely the permanent domination of every single individual in each and every sphere of life. The seizure of power through the means of violence is never an end in itself, but only the means to an end. And the seizure of power in any given country is only a welcome transitory stage, but never the end of the movement. The practical goal of the movement is to organize as many people as possible within its framework and to set and keep them in motion. A political goal that would constitute the end of the movement simply does not exist. Section two, the temporary alliance between the mob and the elite. What is more disturbing to our peace of mind than the unconditional loyalty of members of totalitarian movements and the popular support of totalitarian regimes is the unquestionable attraction these movements exert on the elite. And not only on the mob elements in society, it would be rash indeed to discount because of artistic vagaries or scholarly naivete the terrifying roster of distinguished men whom totalitarianism can count among its sympathizers, fellow travelers and inscribed party members. This attraction for the elite is as important a clue to the understanding of totalitarian movements, though hardly of totalitarian regimes, as their more obvious connection with the mob. It indicates the specific atmosphere, the general climate in which the rise of totalitarianism takes place. It should be remembered that the leaders of totalitarian movements and their sympathizers are, so to speak, older than the masses which they organize, so that chronologically speaking, the masses do not have to wait helplessly for the rise of their own leaders in the midst of decaying class society, of which they are the most outstanding product. Those who voluntarily left society before the wreckage of classes had come about, along with the mob, which was an earlier byproduct of the rule of the bourgeoisie, stand ready to welcome them. The present totalitarian rulers and the leaders of totalitarian movements still bear the characteristic traits of the mob, whose psychology and political philosophy are fairly well known. What will happen once the authentic mass man takes over, we do not know yet. Although it may be a fair guess that he will have more in common with the meticulous, calculated correctness of Himmler than with the hysterical fanaticism of Hitler. Will more resemble the stubborn dullness of Molotov than the sensual vindictive cruelty of Stalin. In this respect, the situation after the Second World War in Europe does not differ essentially from that after the first. Just as in the 20s, the ideologies of fascism, Bolshevism, and Nazism were formulated and the movements led by the so-called front generation, by those who had been brought up and still remember distinctly the times before the war. So the present general political intellectual climate of post-war totalitarianism is being determined by a generation which knew intimately the time and life which preceded the present. This is specifically true for France, where the breakdown of the class system came after the second instead of after the first war. Like the mob men and the adventurers of the imperialist era, the leaders of totalitarian movements have in common with their intellectual sympathizers the fact that both had been outside this class and national system of respectable European society, even before the system broke down. This breakdown, when the smugness of spurious respectability gave way to anarchic despair, seemed the first great opportunity for the elite as well as the mob. 
This is obvious for the new mass leaders whose, career, whose careers reproduce the features of earlier mob leaders. Failure in professional and social life, perversion and disaster in private life. The fact that their lives prior to their political careers had been failures, naively held against them by the more respectable leaders of the old parties, was the strongest factor in their mass appeal. It seemed to prove that individually they embodied the mass destiny of the time and that their desire to sacrifice everything for the movement, their assurance of devotion to those who had been struck by catastrophe, their determination never to be tempted back into the security of normal life and their contempt for respectability were quite sincere and not just inspired by passing ambitions. The post-war elite, on the other hand, was only slightly younger than the generation, which had let itself be used and abused by imperialism for the sake of glorious careers outside of respectability, as gamblers and spies, and adventurers as knights in shining armor and dragon killers. They shared with Lawrence of Arabia the yearning for losing themselves and the violent disgust with all existing standards, with every power that be. If they still remembered the golden age of security, they also remembered how they had hated it and how their enthusiasm had been at the outbreak of the First World War. Not only Hitler and not only the failures thanked God on their knees when mobilization swept Europe in 1914, they did not even have to reproach themselves with having been an easy prey for chauvinist propaganda or lying explanations about the purely defensive character of the war. The elite went to war with an exultant hope that everything they knew, the whole culture and texture of life might go down in its storms of steel. That's a quote from Ernst Younger. In the carefully chosen words of Thomas Mann, war was chastisement and purification. War in itself, rather than victories, inspired the poet. Or, in the words of a student of the time, what counts is always the readiness to make a sacrifice, not the object for which a sacrifice is made. Or in the words of a young worker, it doesn't matter whether one lives a few years longer or not, one would like to have something to show for one's life. And long before one of Nazism's intellectual sympathizers announced, when I hear the word culture, I draw my revolver. Poets had proclaimed their disgust with rubbish culture and called poetically on ye barbarians, Scythians, Negroes, Indians, to trample it down. Simply to brand as outbursts of nihilism, this violent dissatisfaction with the pre-war age and subsequent attempts at restoring it from Nietzsche and Sorrel to Pareto, from Rimbaud and T.E. Lawrence to Junger, Brecht and Malraux, from Bakunin and Nechaev to Alexander Bloch, is to overlook how justified disgust can be in a society wholly permeated with the ideological outlook and moral standards of the bourgeoisie. Yet it is also true that the front generation, in marked contrast to their own chosen spiritual fathers, were completely absorbed by their desire to see the ruin of this whole world of fake security, fake culture, and fake life. This desire was so great that it outweighed in impact and articulateness all earlier attempts at a transformation of values, such as Nietzsche had attempted, or reorganization of political life, as indicated in Sorrell's writings, or a revival of human authenticity in Bakunin, or a passionate love of life in the purity of exotic adventures in Rimbo. Destruction without mitigation, chaos, and ruin, as such assumed the dignity of supreme values. The genuineness of these feelings can be seen in the fact that very few of this generation were cured of their war enthusiasm 
by actual experience of its horrors. The survivors of the trenches did not become pacifists. They cherished an experience which they thought might serve to separate them. separate them definitely from the hatred surroundings of respectability. They clung to their memories of four years of life in the trenches as though they constituted an objective criterion for the establishment of a new elite. Nor did they yield to the temptation to idealize this past. On the contrary, the worshipers of war were the first to concede that war in the era of machines could not possibly breed virtues like chivalry, courage, honor, and manliness, that it imposed on men nothing but the experience of bare destruction together with the humiliation of being only small cogs in the majestic wheel of slaughter. This generation remembered the war as a great prelude to the breakdown of classes and their transformation into masses. War with its constant murderous arbitrariness became the symbol for death, the great equalizer and therefore the true father of a new world order. The passion for equality and justice, the longing to transcend narrow and meaningless class lines to abandon stupid privilege, just and prejudices seem to find in war a way out of the old condescending attitudes of pity for the oppressed and disinherited. In times of growing misery and individual helplessness, it seems as difficult to resist pity when it grows into an all devouring passion as it is not to resent its very boundlessness which seemed to kill human dignity with a more deadly certainty than misery itself. In the early years of his career, when a restoration of the European status quo was still the most serious threat to the ambition of the mob, Hitler appealed almost exclusively to the sentiments of this front generation. The peculiar selflessness of the mass man appeared here as yearning for anonymity, for being just a number and functioning only as a cog for every transformation in brief, which would wipe out the spurious identifications with specific types or predetermined functions within society. War had been experienced as that quote, mightiest of all mass actions, which obliterated individual differences so that even suffering, which traditionally had marked off individuals through unique, unexchangeable destinies could now be interpreted as an instrument of historical progress. Nor did national distinctions limit the masses into which the post-war elite wished to be immersed. The First World War, somewhat paradoxically, had almost extinguished genuine national feelings everywhere in Europe, where between the wars, it was far more important to have belonged to the generation of the trenches, no matter on which side, than to be a German or a Frenchman. The Nazis based their whole propaganda on this indistinct comradeship, this community of faith, and won over a great number of veteran organizations in all European countries, thereby proving how meaningless national slogans had become even in the ranks of the so-called right, which used them for connotation of violence rather than for their specific national content. No single element in this general intellectual climate in post-war Europe was very new. Bakunin had already confessed, I do not want to be I, I want to be a we. And Echaev had preached the evangel of the doomed man with no personal interests, no affairs, no sentiments, attachments, property, 
not even a name of his own, end of quote. The anti-humanist, anti-liberal, anti-individualist, and anti-cultural instincts of the front generation, their brilliant and witty praise of violence, power, and cruelty was preceded by the awkward and pompous scientific proofs of the imperialist elite that a struggle of all is the law of the universe, that expansion is a psychological necessity before it is a political device, and that man has to behave by such universal laws. What was new in the writings of the front generation was their high literary standard and great depth of passion. The post-war writers no longer needed the scientific demonstrations of genetics, and they made little, if any, collective use of the works of Gobineau or Houston Stewart Chamberlain which belonged already to the cultural household of the Philistines. They read not Darwin, but Marquis de Sade. If they believed at all in universal laws, they certainly did not particularly care to conform to them. To them, violence, power, cruelty were the supreme capacities of men who had definitely lost their place in the universe and were much too proud to belong for a power theory that would safely bring them back and reintegrate them into the world. They were satisfied with blind partisanship in anything that respectable society had banned, regardless of theory or content, and they elevated cruelty to a major virtue because it contradicted society's humanitarian and liberal hypocrisy. If we compare this generation with the 19th century idealists, with whose theories they sometimes seem to have so much in common, their chief distinction is their greater authenticity and passion. They had been more deeply touched by misery. They were more concerned with the perplexities and more deadly hurt by hypocrisy than all the apostles of goodwill and brotherhood had been. And they could no longer escape into exotic lands, could no longer afford to be dragon slayers among strange and exciting people. There was no escape from the daily routine of misery, meekness, frustration, and resentment embellished by a fake culture of educated talk. No conformity to the customs of fairy tale lands could possibly save them from the rising nausea that this combination continuously inspired. This inability to escape into the wide world, this feeling of being caught again and again in the trappings of society, so different from the condition which had formed the imperialist character, added a constant strain and the yearning for violence to the older passion for anonymity and losing oneself. Without the possibility of a radical change of role and character, such as the identification with the Arab national movement or the rights of an Indian village, the self-willed immersion in the suprahuman forces of destruction seemed to be a salvation from the automatic identification with pre-established functions in society and their utter banality, and at the same time, to help destroy the functioning itself. These people felt attracted to the pronounced activism of totalitarian movements, to their curious, uh, only seemingly contradictory insistence on both the primacy of sheer action and the overwhelming force of sheer necessity. This mixture corresponded precisely to the war experience of the front generation, to the experience of constant activity within the framework of overwhelming fatality. Activism, moreover, seemed to provide new answers to the old and tr troublesome question, who am I? Which always appears with redoubled persistence in times of crisis. 
if society insisted you are what you appear to be, post-war activism replied, you are what you have done. For instance, the man who for the first time had crossed the Atlantic in an airplane, as in Brecht's De Flug de Lindbergs, an answer which after the Second World War was repeated and slightly varied by Sartre's, you are your life in weak law. The pertinence of these answers lies less in their validity to a re redefinitions of personal identity than in their usefulness for an eventual escape from social identification, from the multiplicity of interchangeable roles and functions which society had imposed. The point was to do something heroic or criminal which was unpredictable and underdetermined by anybody else. The pronounced activism of the totalitarian movements, their preference for terrorism over all other forms of political activity, attracted the intellectual elite and the mob alike, precisely because this terrorism was so utterly different from that of earlier revolutionary societies. It was no longer a matter of calculated policy, which saw in terrorist acts the only means to eliminate certain outstanding personalities who, because of their politics or position, had become a symbol of oppression. What proved so attractive was that terrorism had become a kind of philosophy through which to express frustration, resentment, and blind hatred, a kind of political expressionism which used bombs to express oneself, which watched delightedly the publicity given to resounding deeds and was absolutely willing to buy the price of life for having succeeded in forcing the recognition of one's existence on the normal strata of society. It was still the same spirit and the same game which made Goebbels, long before the eventual defeat of Nazi Germany, announced with obvious delight to the Nazi, that the Nazis, in case of defeat, would know how to slam the door behind them and not to be forgotten for centuries. Yet, it is here, if anywhere, that a valid criterion may be found for distinguishing the elite from the mob in the pre-totalitarian atmosphere. What the mob wanted and what Goebbels expressed with great precision was access to history, even at the price of destruction. Goebbels' sincere conviction that the greatest happiness that a contemporary can experience today is either to be a genius or to serve one, was typical of the mob, but neither of the masses nor of the sympathizing elite. The latter, on the contrary, took anonymity seriously to the point of seriously denying the existence of genius. All the art theories of the 20s tried desperately to prove that the excellent is the product of skill, craftsmanship, logic, and the realization of the potentialities of the material. The mob, and not the elite, was charmed by the radiant power of fame, Stefan Zweig, and accepted enthusiastically the genius idolatry of the late bourgeois world. In this, the mob of the 20th century followed faithfully the pattern of earlier parvenus who also had discovered the fact that bourgeois society would rob the, open its doors to the fascinating abnormal, the genius, the homosexual or the Jew, then to simple merit. The elite's contempt for the genius and its yearning for anonymity was still witness of a spirit which neither the masses nor the mob were in a position to understand and which, in the words of Robespierre, strove to assert the grandeur of man against the pettiness of the great. 
This difference between the elite and the mob notwithstanding, there is no doubt that the elite was pleased whenever the underworld frightened respectable society into accepting it on an equal footing. The members of the elite did not only object at all to paying a price, the destruction of civilization for the fun of seeing how those who had been excluded unjustly in the past forced their way into it. They were not particularly outraged at the monstrous forgeries in historiography of which all totalitarian regimes are guilty and which announced themselves clearly enough in totalitarian propaganda. They had convinced themselves that traditional historiography was a forgery. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, it's my pleasure to be here and to follow um, my doctor Mota, Sheila Ben Habib, and um, one of my colleagues from grad school, Matthew Longo, in joining um, in this reading of part three of The Origins of Totalitarianism by Hannah Arendt. Um, and I'm especially pleased because this is one of those books that I return to again and again, I think it's one of the best examples of a way to think about and to use theory to analyze contemporary events and to use theory as a way to think about um, how history can teach us um, about the warning of the present. Um, so I think that it's an especially relevant book now. Um, that's obviously not an opinion that many other people share as well. Um, so because given the sales we've seen of it, but I think it's um, a book that is not explored quite enough. Um, and in particular, I invariably find myself returning to the same passages over and over again. And one of the nice things about this reading is to really go through all of part three. Um, so, and really read all of it, because I think so often all, a lot of us, um, get into a rut and we just return to the same things over and over again. So I think this really gives us an opportunity to sort of dive into the book um, and to really think about the relevance of our own actions and the relevance of politics for people's lives. And I think that sort of in the post-war era, in this kind of era of long peace, I think what so often happens is that we've forgotten that politics ultimately can be um, about life and death, that it ultimately is about the protection of rights and that things really are at stake. Um, so often I think we think of elections as just these kind of formal procedures we go through. And I think the origins of totalitarianism and Ha Arendt's writing really encourages us to think a little bit more broadly and to really consider the outcomes that can come from our political action, even if it's just as simple as voting. And although we can't make promises, although we can't predict the outcomes of our political actions, it is still incumbent upon us to use our judgment and to think carefully about what we are doing when we make political choices. So I think this is a really wonderful book and it's a really important time to consider its lessons for the present. Sorry, we're running a little bit ahead of schedule. So I think we're gonna have a little bit of a conversation so that we don't get too far ahead of ourselves. Hi, is that is that with me <laughs> again? <laughs> Hi. So I was I was just um, just about to 
I'm going to get my lunch. Um, <laughs> but that was great. And we are running ahead of ourselves, um, which is giving us wonderful time to um, talk um, with one another. And thanks, Peter, for that really eloquent introduction. Sam, are you um, in this conversation? I've just seen you. Um, I'm, I'm happy to join the conversation. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm here following along. <laughs> um, we have a number of panelists. Organizing um, it, it's been an immense group effort and it's, it's so wonderful, not just to hear people reading um, Origins this morning as we're all waiting for the day to unfold, um, but to hear people's personal reflections on what this text has meant to them over time and especially during these past for years, um, one second, um, and I think Shayla is going to join us in conversation um, as well. And I see Clifford Brooks um, is here. Hi, Shayla. Hi, Clifford. Okay. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I just jumped into the text without uh, taking a breath because I wasn't quite sure uh, whether we had to say a few, a few words. Uh, what stunned me in reading these pages, which is, of course, not uh, the first time, is this um, deep reflections on the psychology of the mob and the elite. And these days, I mean, uh, seeing what has unfolded in the United States in the last four years, this strange um, mixture on the one hand of a very wealthy elite uh, uh, you know, that is uh, Trump's background. And yet on the other hand, uh, this uh, um, constant descent into the language of the mob and this gangster-like thuggish attitudes that come together, uh, lock her up or uh, fire him about Fauci, you know? It is, uh, Arendt catches something there that is um, very, very significant and somewhat hard for us to understand. It is this alliance between the elite and the mob that is so characteristic of all um, fascist movements, and this is what, you know, also enables them to mobilize. Again, since this is election day, and I'm sitting here in New York like everyone else, uh, completely, no one can hear me. Um, I can hear you, Sheila. So, so we just need to turn off Spotlight. I did that. I okay, did that. so now, every, now everybody will be able to hear you. I'm sorry about that. Um, oh, oh, sorry. Oh, oh, so what I said, should I repeat it, it, what I just I said? Think, or was, I, anyway. think, I think that would be great. I mean, I think it's, I think it's a really important point um, that aren't catches that you were explaining. Okay, just very briefly, not to take up too much time, uh, and you know, to uh, from Peter's reading that in the section um, that Matt read, that I uh, read before joining the discussion, uh, what was uh, being explored by Arendt was this um, um, psychological moment that joins the elite and uh, the mob. And I was saying that for me, it was particularly enlightening because although our political situation in the United States is not a post-war situation and we don't have the psychology of what Arendt calls you know, the front generation, uh, what we do have is the strange alliance um, between, not strange, but maybe, you know, a well-known alliance and fascist movement of um, the elite that permits itself uh, the language and the actions of the mob or a kind of gangsterism. Uh, Trump's uh, continuing uh, refrain about Hillary Clinton even years after, lock her up, lock her up these chants or the kind of thuggery that is being encouraged uh, uh, by him and which we can see. So Arendt captures, uh, uh, captures this moment 
very, very well. And it should give us all something to think about the mass psychology of authoritarianism, fascism, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I think, I think one of the, or do we want to go to the next reading or do we want to? We have three minutes, we can. Yeah, so I, I think one of the things that, um, you know, that you are talking about that Trump has been really successful at for the past four years is, you know, distilling his message into these short um, cliched statements that really reflect the unspoken desires of the masses. And when our, you know, the quote about how the masses have to be won by propaganda, I've seen that passed around a lot in the past four years. And I think I, I probably have even shared it. I think that's often what we're talking about, um, a kind of propaganda that turns people away from actively engaging with political arguments and just affirms um, their desires. And I think it's one of the interesting things that I, I'm curious to see today if we see that reflected in voter turnout. Um, indeed, indeed. I mean, um, uh, I, the passages about cruelty mm -hmm. struck me again, you know, because uh, this was also such a big theme in Judith Clark's work, her definition that the task of liberalism is not only to end injustice, but also to put an end to cruelty. And that Arendt comes to this desire for cruelty, the desire to exercise it also as a way of um, ending bourgeois respectability and how it manifests itself as a rage against uh, society, right? In the peculiar way in which she uses the concept of society as respectable society, sometimes what we would refer to as the establishment, right? So this, this um, moment of you know, cruelty that in some way is also the masses almost exercise upon themselves or are you know, watching exercise on others when she says, the moment here is when an, uh, the, you know, a Marquis de Sade emerges mm -hmm. as the kind of philosopher poet of this, of this moment. So, so many incredible insights in these sections, uh, truly. Can I just, I mean, emphasize something that you just said, which I've, I've been disturbed by for the past four years is that, you know, what you're drawing out is that Arendt wasn't a liberal in the mm -hmm. sense that we think about liberal today. And yet a lot of people are trying to revive her as a liberal in this moment. And I think they miss precisely the point that you're making, Shayla. Um, and I think it's it's worth keeping in mind after the election today, even if there's a Biden victory, I think the desire to want to read her as a liberal um, in the tradition of post-war politics is going to be even more persistent, but it's not going to address this inherent possibility of violence, um, I think, that you're pointing to. She's not a liberal in the sense in which we would understand uh, John Rawls, but yeah. we should also be careful uh, to see how much of a Kantian liberal Arendt is, you know, this has always been the argument in my work, so I don't need to get into it. But for her, the concept of the rule of law and equality in the eyes of the law and a space of uh, participation, equality. I mean, these are things that she shares with the liberal tradition. And, and of course, uh, I mean, it is, uh, um, I think it would be foolish to want to denounce any of this, but Arendt is not a liberal in the sense of, of course, market freedoms, yes. uh, belief in market freedoms. And she's also not a liberal in the sense that she prioritizes public political life as a good. It is not one moral good among others, but it is a fundamental good that if we lose sight of, then we lose sight of everything else. So in that sense, of course, she is a civic Republican and she lives in that tension, her work lives in that tension normatively between liberalism and civic, uh, civic Republicanism. And I think we have to be careful the day after the election that 
something that may still happen was the tremendous ero erosion of constitutional checks and balances in this country. And both liberals and civic Republicans have to defend that. It's, um, it's not the end of politics, but it is the framework, as Arendt would say. I'm not sure whom we are waiting for. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think uh, I think we'll move on to on that brilliant final point. Um, I think we'll move on to um, Peter and get him to pick up uh, where where you left off. Thanks so much for that, wow. Sheila. Thank you, a pleasure. Yes, thank you very much, Shayla. It's an absolute honor to be here with you. It's an honor to follow you, Shayla, and thank you so much for inviting me. I'm going to pick up um, just on the previous page um, and continue, dis continue this discussion of the mob and elite. So they, the elite, had convinced themselves that traditional historiography was a forgery in any case, since it has excluded the underprivileged and oppressed from the memory of mankind. Those who were rejected by their own time were usually forgotten by history and insult added to injury had troubled all sensitive consciences ever since faith in a hereafter where the last would be the first had disappeared. Injustices in the past as well as the present became intolerable when there was no longer any hope that the scales of justice would eventually be set right. Marx's great attempt to rewrite world history in terms of class struggles fascinated even those who did not believe in the correctness of his thesis because of his original intention to find a device by which to force the destinies of those excluded from official history into the memory of posterity. The temporary alliance between the elite and the mob rested largely on this genuine delight with which the former watched the latter destroy respectability. This could be achieved when the German steel barons were forced to deal with and to receive socially Hitler, the house painter, and self-admitted former derelict, as it could be with the crude and vulgar forgeries perpetrated by the totalitarian movements in all fields of intellectual life, insofar as they gathered all the subterranean, non-respectable elements of European history into one, consistent picture. From this viewpoint, it was rather gratifying to see that Bolshevism and Nazism began even to eliminate those sources of their own ideologies, which had already won some recognition in academic or other official quarters. Not Marx's dialectical materialism, but the conspiracy of 300 families. Not the pompous scientificiality of Gubineau and Chamberlain, but the protocols of the elders of Zion, not the traceable influence of the Catholic church and the role played by anti-clericalism in Latin countries, but the backstairs literature about the Jesuits and the Freemasons became the inspiration for the rewriters of history. The object of the most varied and variable constructions was always to reveal official history as a joke, to demonstrate a, fear, a sphere of secret influences of which the visible, traceable, and known historical reality was only the outward facade erected explicitly to fool people. To this aversion of the intellectual life, of the intellectual elite for official historiography, to its conviction that history, which was always a forgery anyway, might as well be the playground of crackpots, must be added the terrible, demoralizing fascination in the possibility that gigantic lies and monstrous falsehoods can eventually be established as unquestioned facts, that man may be free to change his own past at will, and that the difference between truth and falsehood may cease to be objective and become a mere matter of power and cleverness, of pressure and infinite repetition. Not Stalin's and Hitler's skill in the art of lying but the fact that they were able to organize the masses into a collective unit to back up their lies with impressive magnificence exerted this fascination. 
Simple forgeries from the viewpoint of scholarship appeared to receive the san sanction of history itself when the whole marching reality of these movements stood behind them and pretended to draw from them the necessary inspiration for action. The attraction which the totalitarian movements exert on the elite, so long as and wherever they have not seized power, has been perplexing because the patently vulgar and arbitrary positive doctrines of totalitarianism are more conspicuous to the outsider and mere observer than the general mood which pervades the pre-totalitarian atmosphere. These doctrines were so much at variance with generally accepted intellectual, cultural, and moral standards that one could conclude that only an inherent fundamental shortcoming of character in the intellectual, la trahison de Claire, J. Benda, or a perverse self-hatred of the spirit accounted for the delight with which the elite accepted the ideas of the mob. What the spokesmen of humanism and liberalism usually overlook in their bitter disappointment and their unfamiliarity with the more general experiences of the time is that an atmosphere in which all traditional values and propositions had, had evaporated after the 19th century ideologies had refuted each other and exhausted their vital appeal in a sense made it easier to accept patently absurd propositions than the old truths which had become pious banalities, precisely because nobody could ex be expected to take the absurdities seriously. Vulgarity, with its cynical dismissal of respected standards and accepted theories, carried with it a frank admission of the worst and a disregard for all pretenses which were easily mistaken for courage and a new style of life. In the growing presence of mob attitudes and convictions, which were actually the attitudes and convictions of the bourgeoisie cleansed of hypocrisy, those who traditionally hated the bourgeoisie had voluntarily left respectable society, saw only the lack of hypocrisy and respectability, not the content itself. Since the bourgeoisie claimed to be the guardian of Western traditions and confounded all moral issues, by parading publicly, publicly virtues which it had not only, which it not only did not possess in private and business life, but which actually, but which it actually held in contempt, it seemed revolutionary to admit cruelty, disregard of human values, and general immorality, because this at least destroyed the duplicity upon which the existing society seemed to rest. What a temptation to flaunt extreme attitudes in the hypocr hypocritical twilight of double moral standards, to appear publicly with the mask of cruelty, to wear publicly the mask of cruelty, if everyone was patently inconsiderate and pretended to be gentle, to parade wickedness in a world, not of wickedness, but of meanness. The intellectual elite of the 20s, who knew little of the earlier connections between the mob and bourgeoisie, was certain that the old game of épatrer le bourgeois could be played to perfection if one started to shock society with an ironically exaggerated picture of its own behavior. At that time, no one anticipated that the true victims of this irony would be the elite rather than the bourgeoisie. The avant-garde did not know that they were running their heads not against walls, but against open doors, and that a unanimous success would belie their claim to being a revolutionary minority and would prove that they were about to express a new mass spirit or the spirit of the time. Particularly significant in this respect was the reception given Brecht, Brecht's Drei Groschen Oper in pre-Hitler Germany. The play presented gangsters as respectable businessmen and respectable businessmen as gangsters. The irony was somewhat lost when respectable businessmen in the audience considered this a deep insight into the ways of the world, and when the mob welcomed it as an artistic sanction of gangsterism. The theme song of the play, Erst kommt das Fressen, dann kommt die Moral, was greeted with frantic applause by exactly everybody, though for different reasons. The mob applauded because it took the statement literally. The bourgeoisie applauded because it had been fooled by its own hypocrisy for so long that it had grown tired of the tension and found deep wisdom 
in the expression of the banality by which it lived. The elite applauded because the unveiling of hypocrisy was such superior and wonderful fun. The effect of the work was exactly the opposite of what Brecht intended it by it. The bourgeoisie could no longer be shocked. It welcomed the exposure of its hidden philosophy, whose popularity proved that they had been right all along. So that the only political result of Brecht's revolution was to encourage everyone to disregard the uncomfortable mask of hypocrisy and to accept openly the standards of the mob. A reaction similar in its ambiguity was aroused some 10 years later in France by Céline's Bagatelle pour un massacre, in which he had proposed to massacre all the Jews. André Guide was publicly delighted in the pages of the Nouvelle Revue Française, not of course because he wanted to kill the Jews of France, but because he rejoiced in the blunt admission of such a desire and in the fascinating contradiction between Céline's bluntness and the hypocritical politeness which surrounded the Jewish question in all respectable quarters. How irresistible the desire for the unmasking of hypocrisy was among the elite can be gauged by the fact that such delight could not even be spoiled by Hitler's very real persecution of the Jews, which at the time of Céline's writing was already in full swing. Yet aversion against philosemitism, against the philosemitism of the liberals, had much more to do with this reaction than hatred of Jews. A similar frame of mind explains the remarkable fact that Hitler's and Stalin's widely publicized opinions about art and their persecution of modern artists have never been able to destroy the attraction which the totalitarian movements had for avant-garde artists. This shows the elite's lack of any sense of reality together with its perverted selflessness, both of which resemble not too closely the fictitious world and the absence of self-interest among the masses. It was the great opportunity of the totalitarian movements and the reason why a temporary alliance between the intellectual elite and the mob could come about, that in an elementary and undifferentiated way, their problems had become the same and foreshadowed the problems and mentality of the masses. Closely related to the attraction which the mob's lack of hypocrisy and the masses' lack of self-interest exerted on the elite was the equally irresistible appeal of the totalitarian movement's spurious claim to have abolished the separation between private and public life and to have restored a mysterious irrational wholeness in man. Since Balzac revealed the private lives of the public figures of French society and since Ibsen's dramatization of the pillars of society had conquered the continental theater, the issue of double morality was one of the main topics for tragedies, comedies, and novels. Double morality, as practiced by the bourgeoisie, became the outstanding sign of that esprit de sérieux, which is always pompous and never sincere. This division between the private and public or social life had nothing to do with the justified separation between the personal and public spheres, but was rather the psychological reflection of the 19th century struggle between bourgeois and citoyen, between the man who judged and used all public institutions by the yardstick of his private interests and the responsible citizen who was concerned with public affairs as the affairs of all. In this connection, the liberals' political philosophy, according to which the mere sum of individual interests adds up to the miracle of the common good, appeared to be only a rationalization of the recklessness with which private interests were pressed regardless of the common good. Against the class spirit of the continental parties, which had always admitted they represented certain interests and against the opportunism resulting from their conception of themselves as only parts of a total, the totalitarian movements asserted their superiority in that they carried a Weltanschauung by which they could take possession of man as a whole. In this claim to totality, the mob leaders of the movements again formulated and only reversed the bourgeoisie's own political philosophy. The bourgeois class, having made its way through social pressure and frequently through an economic blackmail of political institutions, always believed that the public and visible organs of power were directed by their own secret 
non-public interests and influence. In this sense, the bourgeoisie's political philosophy was always totalitarian. It always assumed an identity of politics, economics, and society in which political institutions served only as the facade for private interests. The bourgeoisie's double standard, its differentiation between public and private life were a concession to the nation state, which had desperately tried to keep the two spheres apart. What appealed to the elite was radicalism as such. Marx's hopeful predictions that the state would wither away and a classless society emerge were no longer radical, no longer messianic enough. If Berdaev is right in stating that Russian revolutionaries had always been totalitarian, unquote, then the attraction which Soviet Russia exerted almost equally on Nazi and communist intellectual fellow travelers lay precisely in the fact that in Russia. I managed not to unmute, although there was such a great transition there. I should say before I start also that I've been asked to read the footnotes in my section because there are some long uh, comments that Arendt adds in these footnotes. They're quite substantive, so I'll be uh, jumping a little bit around it. I'm not sure that every uh, reader will be doing that, but um, just to explain that. So um, try that start again. Um, the attraction which Soviet Russia exerted almost equally on Nazi and communist intellectual fellow travelers lay precisely in the fact that in Russia, quote, the revolution was a religion and a philosophy, not merely a conflict concerned with the social and political side of life. The truth was that the transformation of classes into masses and the breakdown of the prestige and authority of political institutions had brought to Western European countries conditions which resembled those prevalent in Russia, so that it was no accident that their revolutionaries also began to take on the typically Russian revolutionary fanaticism, which look forward not to change in social or political conditions, but to the radical destruction of every existing creed, value, and institution. The mob merely took advantage of this new mood and brought about a short-lived alliance of revolutionaries and criminals, which also had been present in many revolutionary sects in Tsarist Russia, but conspicuously absent from the European scene. The disturbing alliance between the mob and the elite and the curious coincidence of their aspirations had their origin in the fact that these strata had been the first to be eliminated from the structure of the nation state and the framework of class society. They found each other so easily, if only temporarily, because they both sensed that they represented the fate of the time that they were followed by unending masses, that sooner or later, the majority of European peoples might be with them, as they thought, ready to make their revolution. It turned out that they were both mistaken. The mob, the underworld of the bourgeois class, hoped that the helpless masses would help them into power, would support them when they attempted to forward their private interests, that they would be able simply to replace the older strata of bourgeois society and to instill into it the more enterprising spirit of the underworld. Yet totalitarianism in power learned quickly that enterprising spirit was not restricted to the mob strata of the population and that in any event, such initiative could only be a threat to the total domination of man. Absence of scruple, on the other hand, was not restricted to the mob either, and in any event, could be taught in a relatively short time. 
for the ruthless machines of domination and extermination, the masses of coordinated Philistines provided much better material and were capable of even greater crimes than so-called professional criminals, provided only that these crimes were well-organized and assumed the appearance of routine jobs. It is not fortuitous then that the few protests against the Nazis' mass atrocities against the Jews and Eastern European peoples were voiced not by the military men, nor by any other part of the coordinated masses of respectable Philistines, but precisely by those early comrades of Hitler who were typical representative, representatives of the mob. And here's the first uh, aside. Arendt says, there is, for instance, the curious intervention of Wilhelm Kuba, general commissar in Minsk, and one of the oldest members of the party, who in 1941, that is at the beginning of the mass murder, wrote to his chief, I certainly am tough and willing to cooperate in the solution of the Jewish question. But people who have been brought up in our own culture are, after all, different from the local bestial hordes. Are we to assign the task of slaughtering them to the Lithuanians and Letts who are discriminated against even by the indigenous population? I could not do it. I ask you to give me clear cut instructions to take care of the matter in the most humane way for the sake of the prestige of our Reich and our party. This letter is published in Max Weinreich, Hitler's Professors, 1946. Kuba's intervention was quickly overruled, yet an almost identical attempt to save the lives of Danish Jews made by W. Best, the Reich's plenipotentiary in Denmark and a well-known Nazi was more successful. Similarly, Alfred Rosenberg, who had preached the inferiority of the Slav peoples, obviously never realized that his theories might one day mean their liquidation. Charged with the administration of the Ukraine, he wrote outraged reports about conditions there during the fall of 1942, after he had tried to get direct intervention from Hitler himself. There are, of course, some exceptions to this rule. The man who saved Paris from destruction was General von Kodlitz, who, however, still feared that he would be deprived of his command as he had not executed his orders, even though he knew that the war had been lost for several years. That he would have had the courage to resist the order to turn Paris into a mass of ruins without the energetic support of a Nazi of old standing, Otto Abetz, the ambassador to France, appears dubious according to his own testimony during the trial of Abetz in Paris. Going back to the main text. Nor was Himmler, the most powerful man in Germany after 1936, one of those armed Bohemians, that's a quote from Haydn, whose features were distressingly similar to those of the intellectual elite. Himmler himself was more normal, that is, more of a Philistine, than any of the original leaders of the Nazi movement. He was not a bohemian like Goebbels, or a sex criminal like Stryker, or a crackpot like Rosenberg, or a fanatic like Hitler, or an adventurer like Goring. He proved his supreme ability for organizing the masses into total domination by assuming that most people are neither bohemians, fanatics, adventurers, sex maniacs, crackpots, nor social failures, but first and foremost, job holders and good family men. The Philistine's retirement into private life, his single-minded devotion to matters of family and career was the last and already degenerated product of the bourgeoisie's belief in the primacy of private interest. The Philistine is the bourgeois isolated from his own class, the atomized individual who is produced by the breakdown of the bourgeois class itself. The mass man whom Himmler organized for the great mass crimes ever committed, sorry, for the greatest mass crimes ever committed in history, bore the features of the Philistine rather than of the mob man and was the bourgeois who in the midst of the ruins of his world 
worried about nothing so much as his private security, was ready to sacrifice everything, belief, honor, dignity, on the slightest provocation. Nothing proved easier to destroy than the privacy and private morality of people who thought of nothing but safeguarding their private lives. After a few years of power and systematic coordination, the Nazis could rightly announce, the only person who is still a private individual in Germany is somebody who is asleep. In all fairness to those among the elite, on the other hand, who at one time or another have let themselves be seduced by totalitarian movements, and who sometimes, because of their intellectual abilities, are even accused of having inspired totalitarianism. It must be stated that what these desperate men of the 20th century did or did not do had no influence on totalitarianism whatsoever. Although it did play some part in earlier successful attempts of the movements to force the outside world to take their doctrines seriously. Wherever totalitarian movements seized power, this whole group of sympathizers was shaken off even before the regimes proceeded toward their greatest crimes. Intellectual, spiritual, and artistic initiative is as dangerous to totalitarianism as the gangster initiative of the mob, and both are more dangerous than mere political opposition. The consistent persecution of every higher form of intellectual activity by the new mass leaders springs from more than their natural resentment against everything they cannot understand. Total domination does not allow for free initiative in any field of life, for any activity that is not entirely predictable. Totalitarianism in power invariably replaces all first-rate talents, regardless of their sympathies, with those crackpots and fools whose lack of intelligence and creativity is still the best guarantee of their loyalty. And then Arendt adds another aside. Bolshevik policy in this respect surprisingly consistent is well known and hardly needs further comment. Picasso, to take the most famous instance, is not liked in Russia, even though he has become a communist. It is possible that Andrei Gide's sudden reversal of attitude after seeing the Bolshevik reality in Soviet Russia in 1936 definitely convinced Stalin of the uselessness of creative artists, even as fellow travelers. Nazi policy was distinguished from Bolshevik measures only insofar as it did not yet kill its first rate talents. It would be worthwhile to study in detail the careers of those comparatively few German scholars who went beyond mere cooperation and volunteered their services because they were convinced Nazis. Weinreich, the only available study, and misleading because he does not distinguish between professors who adopted the Nazi creed and those who owed their careers exclusively to the regime, omits the earlier careers of the concerned scholars and thus indiscriminately puts well-known men of great achievement into the same category as crackpots. Most interesting is the example of the jurist Carl Schmitt, whose very ingenious theories about the end of democracy and legal government still make arresting reading. As early as the middle thirties, he was replaced by the Nazis own brand of political and legal theorists, such as Hans Frank, the later governor of Poland, Gottfried Nisse and Reinhard Hohn. The last to fall into disgrace was the historian Walter Frank, who had been a convinced anti-Semite and member of the Nazi party before it came to power, and who in 1933 became director of the newly founded Reichsinstitut für Geschichte des Neuen Deutschlands with its famous, my German is so bad, <laughs> with its famous Forschungs of Beitlung Judenfrage, apologies to all German speakers, and editor of the nine volume for Schumgutzer Judenfrage. In the early 40s, Frank had to cede his position and influence to the notorious Alfred Rosenberg, whose Dermithos, <laughs> I can't do this, uh, uh, um, I should be able to say 20 in German, um, 
but I'm just going to go to Jarundertz, certainly shows no aspiration whatsoever to scholarship. Franck clearly was mistrusted for no other reason than that he was not a charlatan. I'm going to say that again because I think my murdering the German might have distracted from that important sentence. Franck clearly was mistrusted for no other reason than that he was not a charlatan. What neither the elite nor the mob that embraced national socialism with such fervor could understand was that one cannot embrace this order by accident. Above and beyond the willingness to serve stands the unrelenting necessity of selection that knows neither extenuating circumstances nor clemency. In other words, concerning the selection of those who would belong to them, the Nazis intended to make their own decisions regardless of the accident of any opinions. The same appears to be true for the selection of Bolshevists for the secret police. F. Beck and W. Godin report in Russian purge and the extraction of confession that the members of the NKVD are claimed from the ranks of party members without having the slightest opportunity to volunteer for this career. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> uh, it's Kathy here who's hosting right now from uh, the East Coast of the US. And uh, while we're waiting for our next speaker to arrive, and since we have a few minutes of interlude, I would just like to ask you, um, maybe for the sake of those of the rest of us over here on this side of the pond, as they say, uh, to say something about why you decided to join the reading today. Mm. Um, absolutely, and um, and thank you very much for inviting me uh, to do so and overlooking my massacre of, of, of the German language. Um, look, I mean, I was actually listening to the earlier um, um, part of this uh, conversation with um, with Sheila Benabib, and uh, and and I was struck by how much what she had to say about this uh, um, resonated with me. Um, I am, Arendt offers so much insight into the political situation around the world, obviously, as we all know from the ways that people have been rediscovering her texts and, um, and her quotation, uh, or you know, the way her quotations have been kind of, you know, um, zooming around the media sphere. But in particular for me, um, as somebody who's working on um, American political history and the modern American political situation, and obviously speaking um, to you as another American um, on this day, um, the way in, the ways in which she her insights into the ways in which terrorism and gangsterism interrelate mm. that they're actually on a spectrum with each other the way that what looks like spontaneous thuggery actually quickly becomes organized terrorism and particularly though the way in which and this is i think in the next section actually uh, mm -hmm. um which will be about to be read about the way in which she pinpoints the fact that terror and propaganda are both weapons in psychological warfare. And she mm. sees terror and propaganda working together in ways that I think our political discourse has not yet rediscovered and needs to. I think we need to be much more alert to that interrelationship um, of terror and propaganda. The other thing that brought me back to um, Arendt uh, when everybody started, uh, uh, I, and I should say I'm not a scholar of Arendt, as again, you know, it was clear from uh, from some of my reading there, I would have, my German would have to be better to be a scum, proper scholar of Arendt. Um, but I came back uh, uh, around to her in part through her great 1971 essay um, on lying in politics, which mm. I would also commend to people who might want to um, um, read more of what Arendt has to say, because in that essay, as you know, she was responding to the Pentagon Papers. Yes. Um, and to the um, to the great scandal of the fact that the that the Nixon government was lying to the American population left, right, and center about the causes of the Vietnam War and about what was actually happening in the Vietnam War, um, and and the and the, the thesis of that essay basically, um, if I can uh, take the liberty of trying to you know distill a rent. Um, is that lying isn't isn't an error in politics that it's foundational to the concept of politics because political action depends on our being able to imagine the world other than as it is and so it's the alternative world is bound up in political understanding and in political action and then the thing i love about that essay is the way that she she brings in the contingency of fact and she talks about how important uh, how, how historians know how how about the important fragility of mm -hmm. facts that only human beings can keep facts alive that they need testimony um, and they also need trustworthy 
um, witnesses, she says, people you can actually trust to say that these are facts that are worth listening to and that we can establish and that therefore no factual statement can ever be beyond that need for humans to reinforce it, to establish it, to authorize it. Um, and so the great uh, um, vulnerability of fact in all political discourse is kind of the subject of that essay. And again, I can't think of anything more pertinent uh, um, to what we've lived through in the, in the US over the last four years than thinking hard about how lying in politics works. Right, right. Well, I wanna thank you very much. And uh, all of our listeners, we're waiting for the, uh, the next speaker to come. Uh, and as we begin chapter 11 on the totalitarian movement. So I might take a second to just regroup and uh, you're welcome to stay. And perhaps we'll continue this conversation in just a few minutes while I turn my attention to see if I can find out where the next speaker is. Thank you. <laughs> Certainly. Sarah. Oh, hi. Yeah. Lindsay, hi. you're back. Are we carry on talking? <laughs> sure, why not carry on talking? Yeah. I'll yeah. try to find, oh, you did, I did, I did as well. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sarah, hi, thank you. That was brilliant as usual to hear you talk about lying in politics. Um, just one more question why um, Kath is lining up the next, next speaker. Every time I read, you've, re you've written a series of essays in, in the last three months. I'm not quite sure how you've managed to do that. <laughs> um, on the continuities of um, American right-wing politics from a historian's perspective. And there's a bit, we haven't got to it yet, but there's a bit later where Arendt says very firmly that um, totalitarian states will fall. And she was right, they didn't, they have. But elements of totalitarianism, elements of what she's talking about in this amazing book will persist in cultures. I was just wondering how much Arendt had allowed you to think through both the continuities and the non-continuities between the time she was writing out of, which is the mid 20th century, which you're mid 20th century cultural historian and the now. Yeah. Um, Thank you, that's a really important point. Um, and, and what I'll say basically is that she gave me permission um, to, to see the legitimacy of the continuities that I was picking up on and to see them as not being accidental and indeed um, to see that as the historian's job to establish those facts um, in the ways that I was just referring to that then that testimony of the historian becomes what we can do to establish that totalitarianism was not wiped out and that there can be these seeds and roots and that the, the metaphor that, you know, it's a, it's a trite one, but I think it works that I've used before in talking about the seeds of fascism in America in the 1930s is that they, they, they didn't flower at that time. So they did not take over American government at that time, but that doesn't mean they didn't take root and they did take root. And the evidence is before us that they took root and they spread and they deepened. And, and that's what she lets us see. Um, that's what she lets us understand is that, um, is that totalitarianism is a process and that it is, and that it is not totalizing or, or, or Sorry, it, 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 it is not only recognizable once it has totalized that we that there is this myth that until it is a full totalitarian regime, it is not totalitarianist. Um, and that that I think becomes the problem is this, um, and it gets tied up with the kind of myth of, of totalitarian competence as well. The idea that it has to all be um, this kind of grandiose, you know, evil plan. And of course, that's what Arendt is getting at um, always. And even with her most famous concept um, of the banality of evil from Eichmann in, in Jerusalem, the idea that this doesn't have, you don't have to have total totalitarian um uh, you know, ideological structures and a, and a great conspiratorial plan and you don't have to be playing 12 dimensional chess to be able to achieve totalitarian power. Um, and, and that that's what she's showing us is that those processes, once they embed, they're, they're in, that you have to be, it's, you know, eternal vigilance, right? That you have to keep um, 
but you have to keep alert to them and you have to recognize the symptoms and where they might start to metastasize. Sarah, this is John McCready. How are you? I, uh, I, I've been Hi. wondering- I'm good, how are you? About thinking about the way, what Arendt notes in her analysis of totalitarianism is a novelty, that it's a new political phenomenon that emerges. And I'm wondering if, part of this moment, what this moment teaches us is to look for some new novel form that may have the architecture of a totalitarian system or a fascistic system, but we may be witnessing a new form of oppressive government uh, and movements, uh, something we don't yet have a name for, but something that is emerging sort of out of the failures of totalitarianism and fascism. One, one um, uh, name that I've heard on the right is illiberalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and this illiberalism is a kind of um, desire to break classic liberalism by any means necessary in order to bring about a new regime, which in its logic is fascistic. Um, but what we may be witnessing is the emergence of something new. I wonder if you've thought about that. Mm. Oh, yeah, no, I think it's absolutely the kind of $64,000 question, isn't it? And it's one that is very alive in this debate about whether what we're seeing in the United States is, is fascism. Is it properly named fascism? Is it properly understood as fascism? Is it mere authoritarianism? Is it mere opportunism? Is it mere kleptocracy? I mean, in my more flippant moods, I tend to say when I don't like any of those. So, <laughs> you know, um, but it, of course, it, so on the one hand, you can argue that it's a semantic distinction. And, and, on, and on one hand, it kind of is, um, to your point. So I think we could certainly call it post-fascism or neo-fascism, as many observers today do. And there are strong arguments for that. It's certainly not classical fascism from the interwar period. That's not what we're seeing. So there is definitely a strong argument for saying that this is, if not something completely new, that it's a mutation of something that we've seen before. But that's the question is, at what point does the mutation become something that needs to be renamed as an entire new entity. And at what point do you say this is, you know, a bit like, I don't know, COVID-19, right? It's a SARS-V2 virus, um, but it has its own strain, right? So it's, to me, it's like that. Like we do, are we, we're looking at not, we're not looking at a flu, we're looking at a SARS virus, but each one mutates and has its own identity. Um, and that seems to me a perfectly uh, uh, um, sensible and indeed accurate way of thinking about uh, um, what we're going through right now, what we're observing. Um, on the other hand, there's a lot to be said for, for naming it what it is and naming it something that people will recognize because trying to just give it a completely new name, A, might mean that people just shrug it off. Um, they, won't, they won't actually uh, um, see it as the same kind of threat. And, um, and, and I think that all of the, all of the, um, the impulses toward post this or neo that have already been to a certain extent discredited by a great deal of our political and cultural discourse over the last 20 or 30 years, which, you know, particularly on the right, wanting to dismiss anything that has post in front of it. Um, so, what, so to me, there's a question about accuracy and there's a question about political efficacy and they're not the same question. To my mind, it's completely accurate to describe what we're seeing as fascist and then to describe it as a new mutation in the ways that we're talking about. But to me, it is a mutation of fascism and recognizably fascism. Is that politically efficacious to call it that? That is a more complex um, debate. Although I will say, you know, I'm, I'm sure other people have seen that there have already been calls because of course what happened was people who were saying this was fascist um, got called alarmist. And some of us have been being called alarmist for the last four years, um, and we're increasingly alarmist. And I was actually um, responded to this on social media because there's already been some people saying, well, if, if the election today manages to um, bring down the Trump administration and if democracy, you know, has its way and, and a free and fair election happens, that then the alarmist pundits should apologize for having been alarmist for the last four years. And I was like, no, no, if, if, if you successfully warn people that there's a fire and they save themselves from a fire, that is not a false alarm. That is an alarm that did its job. And you say, thank you to the alarm for saving us from the fire. You don't tell the alarm it should have shut up. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah, very much. And uh, I'm going to, since our other reader has um, not yet appeared, I'm going to start 
the next section. And uh, if you just give me a minute, I will get us set up. Chapter 11. The totalitarian movement, totalitarian propaganda. Only the mob and the elite can be attracted by the momentum of totalitarianism itself. The masses have to be won by propaganda. Under conditions of constitutional government and freedom of opinion, totalitarian movements struggling for power can use terror to a limited extent only and share with other parties the necessity of winning adherence and of appearing plausible to a public which is not yet rigorously isolated from all other sources of information. It was recognized early and has frequently been asserted that in totalitarian countries, propaganda and terror present two sides of the same coin. This, however, is only partly true. Wherever totalitarianism possesses absolute control, it replaces propaganda with indoctrination and uses violence not so much to frighten people. This is done only in the initial stages when political opposition still exists, as to realize constantly its ideological doctrines and its practical lies. Totalitarianism will not be satisfied to assert in the face of contrary facts that unemployment does not exist. It will abolish unemployment benefits as part of its propaganda. Equally important is the fact that the refusal to acknowledge unemployment realized, albeit in a rather unexpected way, the old socialist doctrine he who does not work shall not eat. Or when, to take another instance, Stalin decided to rewrite the history of the Russian Revolution, the propaganda of his new version consisted in destroying, together with the older books and documents, their authors and readers. The publication in 1938 of a new official history of the Communist Party was the signal that the super purge, which had, which had decimated a whole generation of Soviet intellectuals, had come to an end. Similarly, the Nazis in the Eastern European occupied territories at first used chiefly anti Semitic propaganda to win firmer control of the population. They neither needed nor used terror to support this propaganda. When they liquidated the greater part of the Polish intelligentsia, they did it not because of its opposition, but because according to their doctrine, Poles had no intellect. And when they planned to kidnap blue-eyed and blonde-haired children. They did not intend to frighten the population, but to save, quote, Germanic blood. 
Since totalitarian movements exist in a world which itself is non-totalitarian, they are forced to resort to what we commonly call propaganda. But such propaganda always makes its appeal to an external sphere, be it the non-totalitarian strata of the population at home or the non-totalitarian countries abroad. This external sphere to which totalitarian propaganda makes its appeal may vary greatly. Even after the seizure of power, totalitarian propaganda may address itself to those segments of its own population whose coordination was not followed by sufficient indoctrination. In this respect, Hitler's speeches to his generals during the war are veritable models of propaganda, characterized mainly by the monstrous lies with which the Fuhrer entertained his guests in an attempt to win them over. The external sphere can also be represented by groups of sympathizers who are not yet ready to accept the true aims of the movement. Finally, it often happens that even party members are regarded by the Fuhrer's inner circle or the members of the elite formations as belonging to such an external sphere. And in this case, they too are still in need of propaganda because they cannot yet be reliably dominated. In order not to overestimate the importance of propaganda lies, one should recall the much more numerous instances in which Hitler was completely sincere and brutally unequivocal in the definition of the movement's true aims, but they were simply not acknowledged by a public unprepared for such consistency. But basically speaking, Totalitarian domination strives to restrict propaganda methods solely to its foreign policy or to the branches of the movement abroad for the purpose of supplying them with suitable material. Whenever totalitarianism at home comes into conflict with the propaganda line for consumption abroad, which happened in Russia during the war, not when Stalin had concluded his alliance with Hitler, but when the war with Hitler brought him into the camp of the democracies. The propaganda is explained at home as a temporary tactical maneuver. As far as possible, this distinction between ideological doctrine for the initiated in the movement who are no longer in need of propaganda and unadulterated propaganda for the outside world is already established in the pre-power existence of the movements. The relationship between propaganda and indoctrination usually depends upon the size of the movements on the one hand and upon outside pressure on the other. The smaller the movement, the more energy it will expend in mere propaganda. The greater the pressure on totalitarian regimes from the outside world, a pressure that even behind iron curtains cannot be ignored entirely, the more actively will totalitarian dictators engage in propaganda. The essential point is that the necessities for propaganda are always dictated by the outside world. And 
that the movements themselves do not actually propagate, but indoctrinate. Conversely, indoctrination inevitably coupled with terror increases the strength of the movements or the totalitarian government's isolation and security from outside interference. Propaganda is indeed part and parcel of psychological warfare, but terror is more. Terror continues to be used by totalitarian regimes even when its psychological aims are achieved. Its real horror is that it reigns over a completely subdued population. Where the rule of terror is brought to perfection, as in concentration camps, propaganda disappears entirely. It was even expressly prohibited in Nazi Germany. Propaganda, in other words, is one and possibly the most important instrument of totalitarianism for dealing with the non-totalitarian world. Terror, on the other hand, is the very essence of its form of government. Its existence depends as little on psychological or other subjective factors as the existence of laws in a constitutionally governed country depends upon the number of people who transgress them. Terror as the counterpart of propaganda played a greater role in Nazism than in communism. The Nazis did not strike at prominent figures as had been done in the earlier wave of political crimes in Germany, the murder of Rathenau and Erzberger. Instead, by calling small, killing small socialist functionaries or influential members of opposing parties, they attempted to prove to the population the dangers involved in mere membership. This kind of mass terror, which still operated on a comparatively small scale, increased steadily because neither the police nor the courts seriously prosecuted political offenders on the so-called right. It was valuable as what a Nazi publicist has aptly called power propaganda. It made clear to the population at large that the power of the Nazis was greater than that of the authorities and that it was safer to be a member of a Nazi paramilitary organization than a loyal Republican. This impression was greatly strengthened by the specific use the Nazis made of their political crimes. They always admitted them publicly, never apologized for excesses of the lower ranks. Such apologies were used only by Nazi sympathizers and impressed the population as being very different from the idle talkers of other parties. The similarities between this kind of terror and plain gangsterism are too... obvious to be pointed out. This does not mean that Nazism was gangsterism, as has sometimes been concluded, but only that Nazis, without admitting it, learned as much from American gangster organizations as their propaganda, admittedly, learned from American business publicity. More specific in totalitarian propaganda, however, than direct threats and crimes against individuals is the use of indirect, veiled, and menacing hints against all who will not heed its teachings and later 
mass murder perpetrated on guilty and innocent alike. People are threatened by communist propaganda with missing the train of history, with remaining hopelessly behind their time, with spending their lives uselessly, just as they were threatened by the Nazis with living against the eternal laws of nature and life, with an irreparable and mysterious deterioration of their blood. The strong emphasis on totalitarian propaganda, on the scientific nature of its assertions, has been compared to certain advertising techniques, which also address themselves to the masses. And it is true that the advertising columns of every newspaper show this scientificality by which a manufacturer proves with facts and figures and the help of research department that his, that his is the best soap in the world. It is also true that there is a certain element of violence in the imaginative exaggerations of publicity men that, beyond, that behind the assertion that girls who do not use this particular brand of soap may go through life with pimples and without a husband lies the wild dream of monopoly. The dream that one day the manufacturer of the only soap that prevents pimples may have the power to deprive of husbands all girls who do not use his soap. Science in the instances of both business publicity and totalitarian propaganda is obviously only a surrogate for power. The obsession of totalitarian movements with scientific proofs ceases once they are in power. The Nazis dismissed even those scholars who were willing to serve them and the Bolsheviks used the reputation of their scientists for entirely unscientific purposes and force them into the role of charlatans. But there is nothing more to the frequently overrated similarities between mass advertisement and mass propaganda. Businessmen usually do not pose as prophets and they do not constantly demonstrate the correctness of their predictions. The scientificality of totalitarian propaganda is characterized by its almost exclusive insistence on scientific prophecy, as distinguished from the more old-fashioned appeal to the past. Nowhere does the ideological origin of socialism in one instance and racism in another show more clearly than when the spokesmen pretend that they have discovered the hidden forces that will bring them good fortune in the chain of fatality. There is, of course, great appeal to the masses in the absolute systems which represent all events of history as demanding upon the great first causes linked by the chain of fatality and which, as it were, suppress men from the history of the human race, in the words of Tocqueville. But it cannot be doubted, either, that the Nazi leadership actually believed in and did not merely use as propaganda such doctrines as the following. The more accurately we recognize and observe the laws of nature and life, so much the more do we conform to the will of the Almighty. The more insight we have into the will of the Almighty, the greater will be our successes. It is quite apparent that the very few changes are needed to express Stalin's creed in two sentences, which might run as follows. The more accurately we recognize the, and observe the laws of history and class struggle, so much more do we conform to dialectic materialism. The more insight we have into dialectic materialism, the greater will be our success. Stalin's notion of correct leadership at any rate could hardly be better illustrated. Totalitarian propaganda raised ideological scientificality and its technique of making statements in the form of predictions to a height of efficiency of method and absurdity of content, because demagogically speaking, there is hardly a better way to avoid discussion 
than by releasing an argument from the control of the present and by saying that only the future can reveal its merits. However, totalitarian ideologies did not invent this procedure and were not the only ones to use it. Scientificality of mass propaganda has indeed been so universally employed in modern politics and it has been interpreted as a more general sign of that obsession with science which has characterized the Western world since the rise of mathematics and physics in the 16th century. Thus totalitarianism appears to be only the last stage in a process during which science has become an idol that will magically cure the evils of existence and transform their nature. It's a quote from Eric Vogelin. And there was indeed an early connection between scientificality and the rise of the masses. The collectivism of masses was welcomed by those who hoped for the appearance of natural laws of historical development, which would eliminate the unpredictability of the individual's actions and behavior. There has been cited the example of Enfantine, who could already see the time approaching when the art of moving the masses will be so perfectly developed that the painter, the musician, and the poet will possess the power to please and to move with the same certainty as the mathematician solves a geometrical problem or the chemist analyzes any substance. And it has been concluded that modern propaganda was born then and there. Yet whatever the shortcomings of positivism, pragmatism, behaviorism, and however great the influence on the formation of the 19th century brand of common sense, it is not at all the cancerous growth of the utilitarian segment of existence which characterizes the masses to whom totalitarian propaganda and scientificality appeal. The positivist conviction, as we know it from Comte, that the future is eventually scientifically predictable, rests on the evaluation of an interest as an all-pervasive force in history and the assumption that objective laws of power can be discovered. Rohan's political theory that the kings command the people and the interests command the king, that objective interest is the rule that alone can never fail and that rightly or wrongly understood the interest makes governments live or die is the traditional core of modern utilitarianism, positivist or socialist. But none of these theories assumes that it is possible to transform the nature of man, as totalitarianism indeed tries to do. On the contrary, they all implicitly or explicitly assume that human nature is always the same, that history is the story of changing objective circumstances and human reactions to them, and that interests, rightly understood, may lead to a change of circumstances, but not to a change of human welfare, or not to a change of human reactions as such. Scientism in politics still presupposes that human welfare is its object, a concept which is utterly alien to totalitarianism. It is precisely because the utilitarian core of ideologies was taken for granted that the anti-utilitarian behavior of totalitarian governments, their complete indifference to mass interests, has been such a shock. This introduced into contemporary politics an element of unheard of unpredictability. Totalitarian propaganda, however, although in the form of shifted emphasis, indicated even before totalitarianism could seize power, how far the masses had drifted from mere concern with interest. Thus the suspicion of the allies that the murder of the insane, which Hitler ordered at the beginning of the war, should be attributed to the desire to get rid of unnecessary mouths to feed was altogether unjustified. Hitler was not forced by the war to throw all ethical considerations overboard, but regarded the mass slaughter of war 
as an incomparable opportunity to start a murder program, which like all other points of his program, was calculated in terms of millennia. Since virtually all of European history through many centuries had taught people to judge each political action by its qui bono, and all political events by their particular underlying interests, they were suddenly confronted with an element of unprecedented unpredictability. Because of its demagogic qualities, totalitarian propaganda, which long before the seizure of power clearly indicated how little the masses were driven by the famous instinct of self-preservation, was not taken seriously. The success of totalitarian propaganda, however, does not rest so much on its demagoguery as on the knowledge that interests as a collective force can be felt only where stable social bodies provide the necessary transmission belts between the individual and the group. No effective propaganda based on mere interest can be carried on among masses whose chief characteristic is that they belong to no social or political body and who therefore present a veritable chaos of individual interests. The fanaticism of members of totalitarian movements, so clearly different in quality from the greatest loyalty of members of ordinary parties, is produced by the lack of self-interest of masses who are quite prepared to sacrifice themselves. The Nazis have proved that one can lead a whole people into war with the slogan, or else we shall go down, and this is not in times of misery and unemployment or frustrated by national ambitions. The same spirit showed itself during the last months of a war that was obviously lost when Nazi propaganda consoled an already badly frightened population and the promise of the Fuhrer in his wisdom had prepared an easy death for the German people by gassing them in the case of defeat. Totalitarian movements use socialism and racism by emptying them of the, their utilitarian content. The interests of a class or nation, the form of infallible prediction in which these concepts were presented has become more important than their content. The chief qualification of a mass leader has become unending <clears throat> infallibility. He can never admit an error. The assumption of infallibility, moreover, is based not so much on superior intelligence as on the correct interpretation of the essential reliable forces in history or nature. Forces which neither defeat nor ruin can prove wrong because they are bound to assert themselves in the long run. Mass leaders in power have one concern which overrules all utilitarian considerations to make their predictions come true. The Nazis did not hesitate to use and the end of the war, their concentrated force of their will, of their still intact organization to bring about as complete a destruction of Germany as possible. In order to make true their prediction that the German people would be ruined in case of defeat. The propaganda effect of inf infallibility, the striking success of posing as a mere interpreting agent of predictable forces has encouraged in totalitarian dictators the habit of announcing their political intentions in the form of prophecy. The most famous example is Hitler's announcement to the German Reichstag in January of 1939 I want today once again to make a prophecy in case the Jewish financiers succeed once more in hurling the peoples into a world war. The results will be an anni the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. Translated into non-totalitarian language, this meant I intend to make war and I intend to kill the Jews of Europe. Similarly, Stalin 
in the great speech before the Central Committee of the Com Communist Party in 1930, in which he prepared the physical liquidation of intraparty intra right and left divisionalists, deviationists, described them as representatives of dying classes. This definition not only gave the argument its specific sharpness, but also announced in the totalitarian style, the physical destruction of those whose dying out had just been prophesied. In both instances, the same objective is accomplished. The liquidation is fitted into a historical process in which man only does or suffers what, according to immutable laws, is bound to happen anyway. As soon as the execution of the victims had been carried out, the prophecy becomes a retrospective alibi. Nothing happened but what had already been predicted. It does not matter whether the law of history spelled the doom of the classes and their representatives or whether the laws of nature exterminate all those elements, democracies, Jews, Eastern subhumans, or the incurably sick that are not fit to live anyway. Incidentally, Hitler too spoke of dying classes that ought to be eliminated without much ado. This method, like other totalitarian propaganda methods, is foolproof only after the movements have seized power. Then all debate about the truth or falsity of a totalitarian dictator's prediction is a weird, is as weird as arguing with a potential murderer about whether his future victim is dead or alive. That's cool. Since by killing the person in question, the murderer can promptly provide proof of the correctness of his statement. The only valid argument under such conditions is promptly to rescue the person whose death is predictable, predicted. Before mass leaders seize the power to fit reality to their lives, their propaganda is marked by its extreme contempt for facts as such. For in their opinion, facts depend entirely on the power of man who can fabricate it. The assertion that the Moscow subway is the only one in the world is a lie only so long as the Bolsheviks have not the power to destroy all the others. In other words, the method of infallible prediction more than any other totalitarian propaganda device betrays its ultimate goal of the world conquest. Since only in a world completely under his control could the totalitarian ruler possibly realize all his lies and make true all his prophecies. The language, the prophetic, scientifically corresponded to the needs of masses who had lost their home in the world and now were prepared to be reintegrated into eternal, all dominating forces, which by themselves would bear man, the swimmer, on the waves of adversity to the shores of safety. We shape the world of our people and our legislation according to the verdicts of genetics, said the Nazis. Just as the Bolsheviks assure, as the Bolsheviks assure their followers that economic forces have the power of a verdict of history, they thereby promise a victory which is independent of temporary defeats and failures in specific enterprises. For masses, in contrast to class, is want victory and success as much as such in their most abstract form. They are not bound together by those special collective interests which they feel to be essential to their survival as a group and which they therefore may assert even in the face of overwhelming odds. More important to them than the cause that may be victorious or the particular enterprise that may be a success is the victory of no matter what cause and success in no matter what enterprise. Totalitarian propaganda perfects the techniques of mass propaganda, but it neither invents them nor originates their themes. These were prepared for them by 50 years of the rise of imperialism and disintegration of the na nation state when the mob entered the scene of European politics. Like the earlier mob leaders, the spokesmen for totalitarian movements possessed an unerring instinct for anything that ordinary party propaganda or public opinion did not care or dare to touch. Everything hidden, 
everything passed over in silence became the major significance, regardless of its own intrinsic importance. The mob really believed that truth was whatever respectable society had hypocritically passed over or covered up with corruption. Mysteriousness as such became the first criterion for the choice of topics. The origin of mystery did not matter. It could lie in a reasonable, politically comprehensive desire for secrecy as in the case of the British Secret Service or the French Dreamy Bureau, or in the conspiratory need for revolutionary groups, as in the case of Antichrist or other terrorist sects, or in the structure of societies whose original secret content had long since become well-known and where only the formal ritual still remain, retained the former mystery, as in the case of the Freemasons, or in age-old superstitions which had woven legends around certain groups, as in the case of the Jesuits and the Jews. The Nazis were undoubtedly superior in the selection of such topics for mass propaganda, but the Bolsheviks have gradually learned the trick, although they rely less on traditionally accepted mysteries and prefer their own inventions. Since the middle 30s, one mysterious world conspiracy has followed another in Bolshevik propaganda, starting with the plot of the Trotskysis, followed by the rule of the 300 families to the sinister imperialists, machinations of the British or American secret services. The effectiveness of this kind of propaganda demonstrates one of the chief characteristics of modern masses. They do not believe in anything visible in the reality of their own experience. They do not trust their eyes and ears, but only their imaginations, which may be caught by anything that is at once universal and consistent in itself. What convinces masses are not facts, and they are presumably part, and not even invented facts, but only the consistency of the system of which they are presumably part. Repetition, somewhat overrated in importance because of the common belief in the masses inferior capacity to grasp and remember is important only because it convinces them of consistency in time. What the masses refuse to recognize is the fortuitousness that pervades reality. They are predisposed to all ideologies because they explain facts as mere examples of laws and eliminate coincidences by inventing an all-embracing omnipotence, which is supposed to be at the root of every accident. Totalitarian propaganda thrives on this escape from reality into fiction, from coincidence into consistency. The chief disability of totalitarian propaganda is that it cannot fulfill this longing for the masses, of the masses for a completely consistent, compre comprehensible and predictable world without seriously conflicting with common sense. If, for instance, all the confessions of political opponents in the Soviet Union are phrased in the same language and admit the same motives, the consistency, hungry masses, the consistency, hungry masses will accept the fiction as supreme proof of their truthfulness, whereas common sense tells us that it is precisely their consistency, which is out of this world and proves that they are a fabrication. Figuratively speaking, it is as though the masses demand a constant repetition of the miracle of the Sipagent, when according to ancient legends, 70 isolated translators produce an identical Greek version of the Old Testament. Common sense can accept this tale only as a legend or a miracle, yet it could also be adduced as proof of the absolute faithfulness of every single word in the translated text. In other words, while it is true that the masses are obsessed by a desire to escape from reality because in their essential homelessness, they can no longer bear its accidental, incomprehensible aspects. It is also true that their longing for fiction has some connection with those capacities of the human mind whose structural consistency is superior to mere occurrence. The masses escape from the from reality is a verdict against the world in which they are forced to live and in which they cannot exist since coincidence has become its supreme master and human beings need the constant transformative transformation of chaos and accidental conditions 
into a man-made pattern of relative consistency. The revolt of the masses against realism, common sense, and all the plausibilities of the world was the result of their atomization of their loss of the social status along with which they lost the whole sector of communal relationships and whose framework common sense makes sense. And their situation of spiritual and social homelessness, a measured insight into the interdependence of the arbitrary and the planned, the accidental and the necessary could no longer operate. Totalitarian propaganda can out outrageously insult common sense only where common sense has lost its validity. Before an alternative of facing the anarchic growth and total arbitrariness of decay or bowing down before the most rigid, fantastically fictionous consistency of an ideology that makes probably will, that the masses probably will always choose the latter and be ready to pay for it with individual sacrifices. And this not because they are stupid or wicked, but because in the general disaster, this escape grants them a minimum of self-respect. While it has been the speciality of Nazi propaganda to profit from the longing of the masses for consistency, Bolshevik methods have demonstrated as though in a laboratory, its, compact, its impact on the isolated mass man. The Soviet secret police, so eager to convince its victims of their guilt for crimes, Hi, everyone. Uh, before we go into the, um, the next section, I would like to invite uh, some of the panelists who are here uh, to have a little bit of conversation, chat about the last sections that were just read, particularly about the lying world of consistency. So I'm going to ask a few of the panelists who remain uh, to come back and uh, see if we have a few words we might want to share about that concept, particularly the section that Cliff just read about the masses escape from reality as a verdict against the world in which they're forced to live and in which they cannot exist. Hi, Roger. Uh, I wonder I if you might want to say a few words about that as you, before you begin your section. Um, because okay. we have about 10 minutes or so before our time actually comes up for your reading. Well, thanks, Kathy, and, and thanks, Cliff, Cliff for uh, that beautiful reading. Very poetic. Um, yeah, these, these pages um, of, of the totalitarian movement section are, I think, some of my favorite um, and most important sections uh, for understanding uh, humanity, let alone humanity today in the 21st century. Um, what, what Kathy said, the, the lying world of consistency. I mean, what, what, what Arendt is going to say, and it will come up again in the next section, is that lies are more, uh, are, 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 are more desired and more uh, palatable to people because uh, for a couple reasons. One is they're consistent and especially people who are um, feeling adrift and lost, have lost their class identity and other identities um, uh, and feel that the world is, is, is chaotic and, and challenging to them, desire something to hold on to, some mm -hmm. sort of consistency. And so one thing that lies can do is they can even out the, the, the sort of uneven and, 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 and challenging aspects of reality through a kind of consistent ideology, consistent idea. Um, but they also can appeal directly to what we want. I mean, you know, if people are feeling um, a need for, or for a kind of uh, race-based or class-based ideology, the lies can provide that, that idea. Um, and they can actually, uh, you know, gear themselves based on um, what people want. I mean, I, I always, you know, uh, remember um, uh, the founder of some of the evangelical movements in the United States who really transformed Christianity. And 
they went around and interviewed Christians and they asked, what do you want from Christianity? And people said, well, we don't want to go to church and we don't want all the rules, but we want the identity. And, you know, they used management techniques. And, and I think what Arendt uh, here sees so clearly is that in this essential homelessness and meaninglessness of, of, of the world in the mid 20th century, which I think we can also see today, um, there is a deep need that people have. And if you're willing to lie, uh, and if you're willing to lie so fully that um, you know you have you believe, as she said in what Chris just wrote, that you have the power um, to make your lies real. Um, you know, you can pretty much say anything, and it's not that people will believe it per se, but they'll uh, be open to it, and uh, they're open to it enough that over time, if you uh, are consistent enough, and you use your power to turn the world in the direction you want it to go, you can actually make the world um, fit your lies instead of the truth having to fit the world. And, and this is so much, I think, of what's going on um, in the world today. And we should say from, from many perspectives, but certainly uh, the president and, and the way he, he goes about that. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that today, but um, we're, we're about to have an election in which, you know, uh, What's at stake is not just the power of the United States, but reality um, and uh, the kind of consistent fictions that um, Arendt is here talking about uh, are, I think, at the very core of, of what this election is about is to what extent we're going to allow um, a politician and political party that insists upon consistent lying fictions of the world uh, to, to have those fictions, if not believed, at least be publicly um, uh, accredited. And, and that's so much of what we're going on. Yeah. Roger, I was really struck by that line uh, on that last page mm. where um, there is, in human beings, their need for the constant transformation of chaos into some pattern of consistency yeah. and how politicians recognize this pattern. And it, I, I find myself saying this, I just want four years of boring uh, uh, economic debates <laughs> by my politicians and less outrage every day, right? And part of what, I'm, what I feel myself needing is some relief from the chaos to bring some kind of normal consistency back to political life. And I think that's an important insight um, uh, and, and says something about uh, maybe the kind of courage that is required uh, to engage in politics and maybe something lost in our current political climate. I think that's right, John. And, you know, the all, you know, the, the, the hard part about this, right, if we're going to be hard on ourselves, is that Arendt is saying that this is not true for some people, right? This is true for all of us, mm. right? There's a, the, the human mind has a longing for fiction. And, and, you know, all of us, we're all academics of some sort or intellectuals of some sort. That's what we study, right? I mean, <laughs> So much of what we study is that we all long for fictions. We, you know, whether it's the founding fathers or democracy or, or, or you know, that we can figure out the world. I mean, I, I think we, to be hard on ourselves, which I think Arendt always asks us to be, you know, it, it's not that like one side is lying and the other side is true. Um, but it is, there are times when, when one side, um, lies with such power and consistency and in such a way that the very recognition of a common existence begins to crumble. And mm. that's what, now, you know, if I'm, if I try to be thinking from a plural point of view, I guess what I say is that for clearly for, you know, millions and millions of people in the United States, the common sense world that we've created over the last 50 years is one they don't recognize and has crumbled. And what we see is a war of different fictions going on to such an extent right now that it's not clear Humpty Dumpty can be put back together again. Mm -hmm. And that's to me, 
you know, the, the, the bite of these pages of RNs. I don't know if that is that, you know, some people, when they hear me say that, say that's too, that's I'm being too generous. It's too, two sidedism. But um, I don't well, know what you guys I, think of that. If I could just say something here, uh, it, it seems to me those last few words before the beginning of the paragraph that you're going to complete, Roger. Um, yeah. The reason why there's a desire to escape is that uh, we're, is that the masses, as she calls them, uh, this allows them, this lying world of consistency, a minimum of self-respect. Yeah. A minimum of self-respect. And I think it goes to the point of plurality. Uh, it's, it's a fundamental problem that I've felt I've had personally in the last four years of how to grant a minimum of self-respect to a position that I find um, untenable and not just to the position, but to the people who hold the position. So I don't think that's two-sidedness. I mean, I think this is through, you know, woven throughout all of her work is a challenge for us to find a way to deal with this problem of plurality. I mean, which she celebrates, but it is the human condition and to figure out a form of political existence in which we accord everyone a minimum of self-respect with the conundrum that that in introduces, uh, you know, of, uh, you know, what are the, are there any limits to that being affording uh, someone uh, a minimum of self-respect when the person to whom you're expected to afford self-respect might even be someone who is hell bent on killing you. I mean, <laughs> I, Kathy, I'm a hundred percent with you. I mean, I think that's, you know, I mean, I think there's a, there's self-respect, as a human being, right? And Arendt believes you have all human beings deserve that self-respect. But then there's judgment. Yes. I mean, this is, I mean, I think this is how she 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 frames the issue with someone like Eichmann, right? Mm -hmm. We respect Eichmann, we listen to him, and then we judge him and we decide that the world requires that he be killed, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, respecting someone doesn't mean that you don't um, judge yeah. that you don't judge them right yeah but you at least take them seriously enough that you respect them right i'm just going to close my door okay and then it'll be uh your turn roger to continue the reading i will um get that ready So if you want to pick up the reading where we left off. Okay, it's, I have 1019, should I wait till 1020? Okay. Yeah. I think you can begin as long as you go slow. Okay. They never committed. And in many instances, were in no position to commit completely isolates and eliminates all real factors so that the very logic, the very consistency of the story contained in the prepared confession becomes overwhelming. In a situation where the dividing line between fiction and reality is blurred by the monstrosity and inner consistency of the accusation. Not only the strength of character to resist constant threats, but great confidence in the existence of fellow human beings, relatives or friends or neighbors who will never believe the story are required to resist the temptation to yield to the mere abstract possibility of guilt. To be sure, this extreme of an artificially fabricated insanity 
can be achieved only in a totalitarian world. Then, however, it is part of the propaganda apparatus of the totalitarian regimes to which confessions are not indispensable for punishment. Confessions are as much a specialty of Bolshevik propaganda as the curious pedantry of legalizing crimes by retrospective and retroactive legislation was a specialty of Nazi propaganda. The aim in both cases is consistency. Before they seize power and establish a world according to their doctrines, totalitarian movements conjure up a lying world of consistency, which is more adequate to the needs of the human mind than reality itself in which through sheer imagination, uprooted masses can feel at home and are spared the never ending shocks which real life and real experiences deal to human beings and their expectations. The force possessed by totalitarian propaganda before the movements have the power to drop iron curtains to prevent anyone's disturbing by the slightest reality, the gruesome quiet of an entirely imaginary world, lies in its ability to shut the masses off from the real world. The only signs which the real world still offers to the understanding of the unintegrated and disintegrated masses, whom every new stroke of ill luck makes more gullible, are, so to speak, its lacunae, the questions it does not care to discuss publicly, or the rumors it does not dare to contradict because they hit, although in an exaggerated and deformed way, some sore spot. From these sore spots, the lies of totalitarian propaganda derive the element of truthfulness and real experience they need to bridge the gulf between reality and fiction. Only terror could rely on mere fiction, and even the terror-sustained lying fictions of totalitarian regimes have not yet become entirely arbitrary. Although they are usually cruder, more impudent, and so to speak, more original than those of the movements. It takes power, not propaganda skill, to circulate a revised history of the Russian Revolution, in which no man by the name of Trotsky was ever a commander in chief of the Red Army. The lies of the movements, on the other hand, are much subtler. They attach themselves to every aspect of social and political life that is hidden from the public eye. They succeed best where the official authorities have surrounded themselves with an atmosphere of secrecy. In the eyes of the masses, they then acquire the reputation of superior realism because they touch upon real conditions whose existence is being hidden. Revelations of scandals in high society, of corruptions of politicians, everything that belongs to yellow journalism becomes in their hands a weapon of more than sensational importance. The most efficient fiction of Nazi propaganda was the story of a Jewish world conspiracy. Concentration on anti-Semitic propaganda had been a common device of demagogues ever since the end of the 19th century and was widespread in Germany and Austria of the 20s. The more consistently a discussion of the Jewish question was avoided by all parties and organs of public opinion, the more convinced the mob became that Jews were the true representatives of the powers that be, and that the Jewish issue was the symbol for the hypocrisy and dishonesty of the whole system. The actual content of post-war anti-Semitic propaganda was neither a monopoly of the Nazis 
nor particularly new and original. Lies about a Jewish world conspiracy had been current since the Dreyfus affair and based themselves on the existing international relationship and interdependence of Jewish people dispersed all over the world. Exaggerated notions of Jewish world power are even older. They can be traced back to the end of the 18th century when the intimate connection between Jewish business and, nation, and the nation states had become visible. The representation of the Jew as the incarnation of evil is usually blamed on remnants and superstitious memories from the Middle Ages, but is actually closely connected with the more recent ambiguous role which Jews play in European society since their emancipation. One thing was undeniable. In the post-war period, Jews had become more prominent than ever before. The point about the Jews themselves is that they grew prominent and conspicuous in inverse proportion to their real influence and position of power. Every decrease in the stability and force of the nation states was a direct blow to Jewish positions. The partially successful conquest of the state by the nation made it impossible for the government machine to maintain its position above all classes and parties, and thereby nullified the value of alliances with the Jewish sector of the population, which was supposed to also stay outside the ranks of society and to be indifferent to party politics. The growing concern with foreign policy of the imperialist-minded bourgeoisie and its growing influence on the state machinery was accompanied by the steadfast refusal of the largest segment of Jewish wealth to engage itself in industrial enterprises and to leave the tradition of capital trading. All this taken together almost ended the economic usefulness to the state of the Jews as a group and the advantages to themselves of social separation. After the First World War, Central European Jewries became as assimilated and nationalized as French Jewry had become during the first decades of the Third Republic. How conscious the concerned states were of the chain situation came to light when, in 1917, the German government, following a long established tradition, tried to use its Jews for tentative peace negotiations with the Allies. Instead of addressing itself to the established leaders of German Jewry, it went to the small and comparatively uninfluential Zionist minority, which were still trusted in the old way precisely because they insisted on the existence of a Jewish people independent of citizenship and could therefore be expected to render services which depended upon international connections and an international point of view. The step, however, turned out to have been a mistake for the German government. The Zionists did something that no Jewish banker had ever done before. They set their own conditions and told the government that they would only negotiate a peace without annexation and reparations. The old Jewish indifference to political issues was gone. The majority could no longer be used since it was no longer aloof from the nation. And the Zionist minority was useless because it had political ideas of, of its own. The replacement of monarchical governments by republics in Central Europe completed the disintegration of Central European Jewries, just as the establishment of the Third Reich, I'm sorry, of the Third Republic had done it in France some 50 years earlier. The Jews had already lost much of their influence when the new governments established themselves under conditions in which they lacked the power as well as the interest to protect their Jews. During the peace nego negotiations in Versailles, 
Jews were used chiefly as experts. And even anti-Semites admitted that the petty Jewish swindlers in the post-war era, mostly new arrivals, behind whose fraudulent activities, which distinguished them sharply from their native co-religionists, lay an attitude which oddly resembled the old indifference to the standards of their environment. These new arrivals had no connections with the representatives of a supposed Jewish international. Among a host of competing anti-Semitic groups and in an atmosphere rife with anti-Semitism, Nazi propaganda developed a method of treating this subject, which was different from and superior to all others. Still, not one Nazi slogan was new. Not even Hitler's shrewd picture of a class struggle caused by the Jewish businessman who exploits his workers, while at the same time his brother in the factory courtyard incites them to strike. The only new element was that the Nazi party demanded proof of non-Jewish descent for membership and that it remained the Fader program notwithstanding, extremely vague about the actual measures to be taken against Jews once it came to power. The Nazis placed the Jewish issue at the center of their propaganda in the sense that anti-Semitism was no longer a question of opinions about people different from the majority or a concern of national politics but the intimate concern of every individual in his personal existence. No one could be a member whose family tree was not in order. And the higher the rank in the Nazi hierarchy, the farther back the family tree had to be traced. By the same token though, less consistently, Bolshevism changed the Marxist doctrine of the inevitable final victory of the proletariat by organizing its members as born proletarians and making other class origins shameful and scandalous. Nazi propaganda was ingenious enough to transform anti-Semitism into a principle of self-definition and thus to eliminate it, anti-Semitism, from the fluctuations of mere opinion. It used the persuasion of mass demagogy only as a preparatory step and never overestimated its lasting influence, whether in oratory or in print. This gave the masses of atomized, undefinable, unstable, and futile individuals, a means of self-definition and identification, which not only restored some of the self-respect they had formerly derived from their function in society, but also created a kind of spurious stability, which made them better candidates for an organization. Through this kind of propaganda, the movement could set itself up as an artificial extension of the mass meeting and rationalize the essential futile feelings of self-importance and hysterical.
security that it offered to the isolated individuals of an atomized society. The same ingenious application of slogans coined by others and tried out before was apparent in the Nazis' treatment of other relevant issues. When public attention was equally focused on nationalism on one hand and socialism on the other, when the two were thought to be incompatible and actually constituted the ideological watershed between the right and the left, the National Socialist German's Worker Party, Nazi, offered a synthesis supposed to lead to national unity, a semantic solution whose double trademark of German and worker connected the nationalism of the right with the internationalism of the left. The very name of the Nazi movement stole the political contents of all other parties and pretended implicitly to incorporate them all. Combinations of supposedly antagonistic political doctrines, national socialist, Christian social, etc., had been tried and successfully before. But the Nazis realized their own combination in such a way that the whole struggle in parliament between the socialists and the nationalists, between those who pretended to be workers first of all, and those who were Germans first, appeared as a sham designed to hide ulterior sinister motives. For was not a member of the Nazi movement all these things at once? It is interesting that even in their beginnings, the Nazis were prudent enough never to use slogans which like democracy, republic, dictatorship, or monarchy indicated a specific form of government. It is as though in this one matter, they had always known they would be entirely original. Every discussion about the actual form of their future government could be dismissed as empty talk about mere formalities. The state, according to Hitler, being only a means for the conservation of the race. As the state, according to Bolshevik propaganda, is only an instrument in the struggle of classes. In another curious and roundabout way, however, the Nazis gave a propaganda answer to the question of what their future role would be. And that was in their use of the protocols of the elders of Zion as a model for the future organization of the German masses for world empire. The use of the protocols was not restricted to the Nazis. Hundreds of thousands of copies were sold in post-war Germany. And even their open adoption as a handbook of politics was not new. Nevertheless, this forgery was mainly used for the purpose of denouncing the Jews and arousing the mob to the dangers of Jewish domination. In terms of mere propaganda, the discovery of the Nazis was that the masses were not so frightened by the Jewish world rule as they were in, interested in how it could be done. That the popularity of the protocols was based on admiration and eagerness to learn rather than on hatred. And that it would be wise to stay as close as possible to certain of their outstanding formulas, as in the case of the famous slogan, quote, right is what is good for the German people, end quote, which was copied from the protocols, quote, 
everything that benefits the Jewish people is morally right and sacred. The protocols are a very curious and noteworthy document in many respects. Apart from their cheap Machiavellianism, their essential political characteristic is that in their crackpot manner, they touch on every important political issue of the time. They are anti-national in principle and picture the nation state as a colossus with feet of clay. They discard national sovereignty and believe, as Hitler once put it, in a world empire on a national basis. They are not satisfied with revolution in a particular country, but aim at the conquest and rule of the world. They promise the people that regardless of superiority in numbers, territory, and state power, they will be able to achieve world conquest through organization alone. To be sure, part of their persuasive strength derives from very old elements of superstition. The notion of the uninterrupted existence of an international sect that has pursued the same revolutionary aims since antiquity is very old and has played a role in political backstairs literature ever since the French Revolution, even though it did not occur to anyone writing at the end of the 18th century that the quote revolutionary sect, this quote peculiar nation in the midst of all civilized nations, end quote, could be the Jews. It was the motif of a global conspiracy in the protocols which appealed most to the masses for it corresponded so well to the new power situation. Hitler very early promised that the Nazi movement would quote, transcend the narrow limits of modern nationalism, end quote. And during the war, attempts were made within the SS to erase the word nation from the national socialist vocabulary altogether. Only world powers seem still to have a chance of independent survival and only global politics a chance of lasting results. That this situation should frighten the smaller nations, which are not world powers, is only too understandable. The protocols seem to show a way out, and that did not depend upon objective, unalterable conditions, but only on the power of organization. Nazi propaganda, in other words, discovered in the quote, supranational because intensely national Jew, the forerunner of the German master of the world and assured the masses that quote, the nations that have been the first to see through the Jew and have been the first to fight him are going to take his place in the domination of the world. The delusion of an already existing Jewish world domination formed the basis for the illusion of a future German world domination. This was what Himmler had in mind when he stated that we quote, owe the art of government to the Jews, namely to the protocols which quote, the Fuhrer had learned by heart. Thus, the protocols presented world conquest 
as a practical possibility, implied that the whole affair was only a question of inspired or shrewd know-how, and that nobody stood in the way of a German victory over the entire world, but a patently small people, the Jews, who ruled it without possessing instruments of violence. An easy opponent, therefore, once their secret was discovered and their method emulated on a larger scale. Nazi propaganda concentrated all these new and promising vistas in one concept, which it labeled Volksgemeinschaft, their new community, tentatively realized in the Nazi movement in the pro pre totalitarian atmosphere was based on the absolute equality of all Germans, an equality not of rights, but of nature, and their absolute difference from all other people. After the Nazis came to power, this concept gradually lost its importance and gave way to, to a general contempt for the German people, which the Nazis had always harbored, but could not very well show publicly before, on the one hand, and a great eagerness on the other to enlarge their own ranks from I don't think you heard me. <laughs> I didn't unmute myself. <laughs> Hi, Stephanie. I, okay, I don't think she's unmuted yet. Um, Am I here now? There you are, yes. <laughs> I was just, while we're waiting, we have a few minutes before um, the very next uh, section. We're a little ahead of ourselves, uh, though not much, but we do have maybe 10 minutes where we could have a brief discussion about what you just read. And I wondered maybe if you could respond to tell us what the meaning of that section was to you in, th in this moment in time. Yeah, that's a really um, interesting question because the protocols of the elders of Zion, of course, is this form of propaganda. I mean, it's a world conspiracy that the Jews are organizing to take over the world that the Nazi party not only uses to foment a kind of um, suspicion, but also looks to for guidance um, on its own uh, construction of a its own world empire making. And whether we, it's so a question, you know, I was thinking, is, is this even remotely comparable to anything right now? Hmm. Um, I mean, we, we see the use of scapegoatings of immigrants, of course, and Fox News uh, does a wonderful job of using this, but I, I, I you know, I, I don't know that the American propaganda machine, if you want to call it that, um, has quite anything this sophisticated um, at this at this particular moment, um, or even if it relies on anything so organized in its um, use of stirring up hatred and um, organization, I, I just I couldn't I couldn't find any analogies that for me worked. That yeah, way. what. What struck me listening to you during this mm -hmm. um, period was the emphasis as, the, as in the protocols on world mm -hmm. conquest. And mm -hmm. you know, I, don't, I don't think we've necessarily heard anything like that mm -hmm. in, uh, in, the, in whatever 
pr um, propaganda has been circulating uh, on, on, you know, whatever political spectrum uh, necessarily. Um, so there was a little bit of a difference in terms of not only there being an analogy, lack of an analogy, but also that theme that is so strongly there. The look, you know, I mean, you start out, the, the section starts out by talking about how uh, the Nazis were able to combine successfully national and socialism in, mm -hmm. in a sense, both being um, contradicted by what they were actually attempting, both the aspects of those terms being contradicted by what they were attempting. Yeah, and I would say that the the kind of outward propaganda emphasis on world domination and empire um, isn't seen so readily in, in Trump's propaganda, um, or even just his rhetoric, we could say, let alone his propaganda, just the way he talks about people, or even some of the right-wing conspiracies that are floated um, it, it, it seems more populist and nationalist to me than um, having the characteristics of somebody wanting to organize to take over the world, um, as you sort of see, saw suggested in that passage or those, those pages I read. Mm -hmm. I wonder what others who are here think about that. Um, yeah. We have two other people. It also seems like us. they're in this passage, there's an acceleration of propaganda. And in previous pages, we we read that when they when propaganda reaches its mark, say in the concentration camps, it's no longer needed. Right. But early on, it's just this attempt to overcome the chaos with some kind of consistency. Mm -hmm. It then begins to accelerate and expand to a scale that it can that can make claims about world domination. And then at that point, once you have the camps, there's no longer any need to, uh, to use the propaganda. You can, you can eliminate it. Right. And right. I think that's an interesting trajectory that Arendt traces out in these pages. Right, yes. Um, but tied back to the theme we were talking about a little while ago about the lying world of consistency and why why it becomes so i mean there were sections we were just hearing where the business of finding something to belong to in order to have a modicum of self-respect reverberates and you know regardless of, of what the implications are that you find the right thing to attach to and it makes you feel like you belong to something and then ultimately the thing that you belong to uh, is inevitable, and it it uh, it you know it's it's a force of nature, which I think she you know repeatedly analogizes it to in certain certain sections here. Mm -hmm. um, Peg Birmingham has arrived and <laughs> is getting ready to do her section of the reading, but um, I wondered if you had any thoughts about that portion that was just read before you start your section of the reading. Yes, I think I think as as uh, was just really what has just been said, the it's it's the use of propaganda as as a, a kind of totalizing fiction uh, in which it replaces anything having to do with reality or our real our experience of the world. Um, and I think that's I think that's central to Arendt's uh, claim in the third part of the uh, voluntary of origins is this notion of superfluousness that this is the really the the driving force as it were uh, that starts far beyond I think John that's what you were pointing to that's that starts far beyond the concentration camps and of course propaganda is, is used to to a, to uh, garner we could say that superfluousness uh, and so the, so the, that the, so the radical evil is simply the perfect superfluousness the death camps are the perfect the perfect superfluousness of what has already been uh, the superfluousness of, of so many, that the feeling of not belonging, mm. of being beside the point. Uh, and I do think there's a lot to that today mm. uh, that's driving uh, 
the sense of belonging to some kind of movement, as you were saying, Julie. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, Kathleen. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> why I said that. I, uh, All right, I like the name Julie. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, <laughs> Kathleen. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the, the the need to belong, uh, or not so much the need as the desire to belong, belong to something, to erase the feeling of having been left out. And I, I mean, I hear that a lot coming out of, of uh, uh, different people's statements about why they support, you know, this party or another. I mean, particularly in relation to um, those who have uh, stood by uh, the president, regardless. Um, when I hear statements like, well, so what if I get the virus? You know, it's just, it's my turn. That's okay. Um, mm -hmm. Nonetheless, mm -hmm. during this period of time, I matter. I mean, it almost sounds like there's a contradiction, but there isn't, if you think about it a little more deeply. It's a sense mm -hmm. of mattering now. Um, and, uh, you know, the rest will be, will be taken care of. Um, so it strikes me that this is a, um, a sort of diminished or form or a simulacrum of the Goethean and Nietzschean uh, imperative to bring order to the chaos within. You know, the the con bringing consistency to um, chaos is not the same thing as uh, Nietzsche meant by finding some encircling myth to bring order to your chaos, right? Something that elevates and moves you to greatness. This seems to be, this propaganda seems to be um, fictionalized in a way that instead of turning you into a subject, it turns you into the subjugated so that you, uh, um, so that you're willing to give your life for something uh, even if it costs you uh, everything. And, and uh, so I, th I think that's interesting. It's a, um, there's sort of a history here of, of needing something like this, but propaganda is a kind of simulacrum of these grander myths and orders uh, of a previous uh, history in Germany, it seems like. Mm -hmm. If I might um, turn the microphone over now to Peg so that she can begin. Uh, I just have to do one or two little things uh, there. And now, if you would continue the reading. Aryans of other nations, an idea which had played only a small role in the pre-power stage of Nazi propaganda. The Volkgemeinschaft was merely the propaganda's preparation for an Aryan racial society which in the end would have doomed all peoples, including the Germans. To a certain extent, the Volkgemeinschaft was the Nazis' attempt to counter the communist promise of a classless society. The propaganda appeal of the one over the other seems obvious if we disregard all ideological implications. While both promise to level all social and property differences, the classless society had the obvious connotation that everybody would be leveled to the status of a factory worker. While the Volkgemeinschaft, with its connotation of conspiracy for world conquest, held out a reasonable hope that every German could eventually become a factory owner. The even greater advantage of the Volkgemeinschaft, however, was that its establishment did not have to wait for some future time and did not depend upon objective conditions. It could be realized immediately in the fictitious world of the movement. The true goal of totalitarian propaganda is not persuasion but organization, the accumulation of power without the possession of the means of violence. For this purpose, originality and ideological content can only be considered an unnecessary obstacle. It is no accident that the two totalitarian movements of our time, so frightfully new in methods of rule and ingenious in forms of organization, have never preached a new doctrine, have never invented an ideology which was not already popular. Not the passing successes of demagogy whim the masses, but the visible reality and power of a living organization. 
Hitler's brilliant gifts as a mass orator did not win him his position in the movement, but rather misled his opponents into underestimating him as a simp simple demagogue. And Stalin was able to defeat the greater orator of the Russian Revolution. What distinguishes the totalitarian leaders and dictators is rather the simple-minded, single-minded purposefulness with which they chose those elements from existing ideologies, which are best fitted to become the fundaments of another entirely fictitious world. The fiction of the protocols was as adequate as the fiction of a Trotskyite conspiracy, for both contained an element of plausibility. The non-public influence of the Jews in the past, the struggle for power between Trotsky and Stalin, which not even the fictitious world of totalitarianism can safely do without. Their art consists in using and at the same time transcending the elements of reality, of verifiable experiences in the chosen fiction and in generalizing them into regions which then are def definitely removed from all possible control by individual experience. With such generalizations, totalitarian propaganda establishes a world fit to compete with the real one, whose main handicap is that it is not logical, consistent, and organized. The consistency of the fiction and strictness of the organization makes it possible for the generalization eventually to survive the explosion of more specific lies. The power of the Jews after their helpless slaughter, the sinister global conspiracy of Trotskyites after their liquidation in Soviet Russia and the murder of Trotsky. The stubbornness with which totalitarian dictators have clung to their original lies in the face of absurdity is more than superstitious gratitude to what turned the trick. And at least in the case of Stalin cannot be explained by the psychology of the liar whose very success might make him his own last victim. Once these propaganda slogans are integrated into a living organization, they cannot be safely eliminated without wrecking the whole structure. The assumption of a Jewish world conspiracy was transformed by totalitarian propaganda from an objective, arguable matter into the chief element of the Nazi reality. The point was that the Nazis acted as though the world were dominated by the Jews and needed a counter conspiracy to defend itself. Racism for them was no longer a debatable theory of dubious scientific value, but was being realized every day in the functioning hierarchy of a political organization in whose framework it would have been very unrealistic to question it. Similarly, Bolshevism no longer needs to win an argument about class struggle, internationalism, and unconditional dependence on the welfare of the proletariat, on the welfare of the Soviet Union. The functioning organization of the Comintern is more convincing than any argument or mere ideology can ever be. The fundamental reason for the superiority of totalitarian propaganda over the propaganda of other parties and movements is that its content or the members of the movement at any rate is no longer an objective issue about which people may have opinions, but has become as real and untouchable an element in their lives as the rules of arithmetic. The organization of the entire texture of life according to an ideology can be fully carried out only under a totalitarian regime. In Nazi Germany, questioning the validity of racism and anti-Semitism, when nothing mattered but race origin, when a career depended upon an Aryan physiognomy, Himmler used to select the applicants for the SS from photographs, and the amount of food upon the number of one's Jewish grandparents was like questioning the existence of the world. The advantages of a propaganda that constantly adds the power of organization 
to the feeble and unreliable voice of argument and thereby realizes, so to speak, on the spur of the moment, whatever it says are obvious beyond demonstration. Foolproof against arguments based on a reality which the movements promise to change against a counter propaganda disqualified by the mere fact that it belongs or defends a world which the shiftless masses cannot and will not accept. It can be disproved only by another, a stronger or better reality. It is in the moment of defeat that the inherent weakness of totalitarian propaganda becomes visible. Without the force of the movements, its members cease at once to believe in the dogma for which yesterday they still were ready to sacrifice their lives. The moment the movement, that is the fictitious world which sheltered them is destroyed. The masses revert to their old status of isolated individuals who either happily accept a new function in a changed world or sink back into their old desperate superfluousness. The members of totalitarian movements, utterly fanatical as long as the movement exists, will not follow the example of religious fanatics and die the death of martyrs, even though they were only too willing to die the death of robots. Rather, they will quietly give up the movement as a bad bet and look around for another promising fiction or wait until the former fiction regains enough strength to establish another mass movement. The experience of the allies who vainly tried to lo locate one self-confessed and convinced Nazi among the German people, 90% of whom probably had been sincere sympathizers at one time or another, is not to be taken simply as a sign of human weakness or gross opportunism. Nazism as an ideology had been so fully realized that its contents ceased to exist as an independent set of doctrines, lost its intellectual existence, so to speak. Destruction of the reality therefore left almost nothing behind, least of all the fanaticism of believers. Section two, totalitarian organization. The forms of totalitarian organization as distinguished from their ideological content and propaganda slogans are completely new. They are designed to translate the propaganda lies of the movement woven around a central fiction, the conspiracy of the Jews or the Trotskyites or 300 families and so on into a functioning reality to build up even under non-totalitarian circumstances, a society whose members act and react according to the rules of a fictitious world. In contrast with seemingly similar parties and movements of fascist or socialist, nationalist or communist orientation, all of which back up their propaganda with terrorism as soon as they have reached a certain stage of extremism, which mostly depends on the stage of desperation of their members, the totalitarian movement is really in earnest about its propaganda. And this earnestness is expressed much more frighteningly in the organization of its followers than in the physical liquidation of its opponents. Organization and propaganda, rather than terror and propaganda, are two sides of the same coin. The most strikingly new organizational device of the movements in their pre-power stage is the creation of front organizations, the distinction drawn between party members and sympathizers. Compared to this invention, other typically totalitarian features, such as the appointment of functionaries from above and the eventual monopolization of appointments by one man are secondary in importance. The so-called leader principle is in itself not totalitarian. It has borrowed certain features from authoritarianism and military dictatorship, which have greatly contributed towards obscuring and belittling 
the essentially totalitarian phenomenon. If the functionaries appointed from above possessed real authority and responsibility, we would have to do with a hierarchical structure in which authority and power are delegated and governed by laws. Much the same is true for the organization of an army and the military dictatorship established after its model. Here, absolute power of command from the top down and absolute obedience from the bottom up correspond to the situation of extreme danger in combat, which is precisely why they are not totalitarian. A hierarchically organized chain of command means that the commander's power is dependent on the whole hierarchic system in which he operates. Every hierarchy, no matter. myself. We have a few minutes before we start the next section. So I thought uh, we might uh, do what we've done before and just have a little chat about the sections that uh, were just read on um, the development of totalitarian propaganda and its role in creating uh, a, a movement uh, that sticks to the organization uh, because of its consistency uh, in its, its so-called lying world of consistency. Um, I wonder, Peg, if you could comment a little about what that last section you read meant as you were reading it. It's a very powerful section. Thank you very much. Yeah, it, it, it really struck me as, as something, Kathleen, that you just pointed to, and that is the, that the, the, rea the reality of the world, or however we, des we describe that, but reality is, is very messy. It's never consistent. It has, it's fraught with contradictions. And, uh, and this, as, she, as Ren points out for me, is so striking with why the propaganda is so appealing, because it makes complete sense. It mm -hmm. offers the sympathizer or the believer an absolutely coherent, co consistent, meaningful world. The only catch is that it's fictitious. Uh, in other words, it has no standing in reality. Or, or perhaps I should soften that just a little bit. I think she's, she's right to point out that there's some plausibility in the propaganda that links it that continues to link it to reality. Otherwise, as she points out, it wouldn't it wouldn't have the kind of legs that it has. Yeah. Uh, but it takes that and then uh, constructs a completely fictitious uh, world. Yes, and in combination with the what where we're moving towards in this section, the 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 role of organization. So you read that one section which said, whatever uh, it says are obvious beyond demonstration uh, because it's matched propaganda with an organizational system that in a sense embodies that propaganda. <coughs> yes, yes, I, I, I think that's right. And, and, and then I think it's also implying that the organization has actually constructed a fictitious reality that can be pointed to. I think this is why she's she points to the the efficacy of a lying world order is that it makes the world it makes the fictitious world real. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, when you really get into these sections, it, it, after a while, ordinary language is inadequate because. The, the propaganda has a reality effect. Mm -hmm. And so to use the word reality against it almost doesn't make sense because it is creating a world that has a reality. You know, So there's, in a way, a, a connection with some of the other points she makes in, in other writing about 
uh, the nature of language, the pro pro not only the nature of language in propaganda, but the power of cliches to create a reality all of their own. And therefore, as she points out, it becomes difficult to, to uh, resist it because if one can just point to this, to this fictitious reality as working, as, as actually in, being in effect. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, the, the, you read this line, the consistency of the fiction and strictness of the organization make it possible for the generalization eventually to survive the explosion of more specific lies. You know, so it's not something we can undo with argument alone, which is, I think, <laughs> where many of us have been frustrated uh, these days in trying to present an argument. And, um, you know, that's not the way into the kind of dialogue uh, for which we seem to lack the language to generate these, these days where we've become so um, divided in really in separate realities. Yeah, uh, different well realities. Said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, also, we had just a, yeah, John. Yeah, there was also this um, logic in the organization of these front organizations that I found interesting too, which, which is there's an obedience from the bottom up and an absolute power from below. So absolute obedience and absolute power create this kind of totalitarian uh, uh, system and it strikes me that uh, these front organizations have to have some kind of um, uh, origin. And those you know, can be seen in paramilitary groups. They can be seen in uh, any number of organizations. And there also is another simulacrum. If you think about Tocqueville's uh, discussion of America and how these local organizations <clears throat> were mobilizing, <clears throat> pardon me, um, people within their communities to address problems. It was very democratic. But when you have absolute obedience and absolute power, it's no longer democratic, but becomes totalitarian. So there's a real change in the logic here that she's identifying um, uh, that is destructive to democracy uh, that I think is important. And I, I think it's worth adding to that quickly that you know this is precisely where she's going to end the book. Um, this is um, her laying the groundwork for that final section she adds in 1958 on ideology mm. and terror mm. to show how the destruction of the commons of this what right. we're calling reality, factual truth, which is so vulnerable to lies, can be pierced all the time is. And I, I was really struck when you were reading a peg by the sentence, it is the moment of defeat that the inherent weakness of totalitarian propaganda becomes visible. Um, and it really, it really reminded me of, of Walter Benjamin's um, wonderful um, argument for why, you know, people's allegiance isn't to the individual, it's to the accoutrements of power. Mm -hmm. And I think this is part of Hannah Arendt's point here that is that as long as the leader continues to fabricate the reality and make it appear real, people will follow the leader. But the minute that the defeat becomes visible, they're out the door, they're gone, their allegiance isn't to anything deeper. And I think that's one of the reasons why this can never, this kind of politics staked on propaganda, which is not reflective of shared common reality, I think in the sense that, that we're talking about it here, can never lead to a lasting politics or political stability. And, and I think that's part of the distinction she's drawing between political movements as well as something that are, have a kind of dangerous tendency about them yeah. and yeah. democratic regimes. Yeah. Yeah, well, and isn't the intention uh, of, a, of a totalitarian state, which is a kind of oxymoron, she points out, to cr have perpetual motion, uh, not to be stable, I mean, not to stop. Uh, to keep uh, answering any uh, defeat with an explanation that explains the defeat was predictable and it was just, you know, what we were trying to do before we get to the next step uh, in, in the equation. <laughs> you know, the line about in the, the subways in, in Moscow, for example. Um, 
we have uh, I think time to um, to start now, and so let me make the few changes that need to be made uh, in order for Roy to uh, to begin his section of reading. Thank you. Every hierarchy, no matter how authoritarian in its direction, and every chain of command, no matter how arbitrary or dictatorial the content of orders, tends to stabilize and would have restricted the total power of the leader of a totalitarian movement. In the language of the Nazis, the never resting dynamic, quote, will of the Führer, and not his orders, a phrase that might imply a fixed and circumscribed authority, becomes the supreme law in a totalitarian state. It is only from the position in which the totalitarian movement, thanks to its unique organization, places the leader, only from his functional importance for the movement, that the leader principle develops its totalitarian character. This is also borne out by the fact that both in Hitler's and Stalin's case, the actual leader principle crystallized only rather slowly and parallel with the progressive totalitarianization of the movement. An anonymity which contributes greatly to the weirdness of the whole phenomenon clouds the beginnings of this new organizational structure. We do not know who first decided to organize fellow travelers into front organizations, who first saw in vaguely sympathizing masses upon whom all parties used to count at election day, but whom they considered to be too fluctuating for membership, not only a reservoir from which to draw party members, but a decisive force in itself. The early communist inspired organizations of sympathizers, such as the Friends of the Soviet Union or the Red Relief Associations, developed into front organizations, but were originally nothing more or less than what their names indicated, a gathering of sympathizers for financial or other, for instance, legal help. Hitler was the first to say that each movement should divide the masses which have been won through pro propaganda into two categories, sympathizers and members. This in itself is interesting enough. Even more significant is that he based this division upon a more general philosophy according to which most people are too lazy and cowardly for anything more than mere theoretical insight, and only a minority want to fight for their convictions. Hitler, consequently, was the first to devise a conscious policy of constantly enlarging the ranks of sympathizers while at the same time keeping the number of party members strictly limited. This notion of a minority of party members surrounded by a majority of sympathizers comes very close to the later reality of front organizations, a term which indeed expresses more, most aptly their eventual function and indicates the relationship between members and sympathizers within the movement itself. For the front organizations of sympathizers are no less essential to the functioning of the movement than its actual membership. The front organizations surround the movement's membership with a protective wall, which separates them from the outside normal world. At the same time, they form a bridge back into normalcy, without which the members in the pre-power stage would feel too sharply the differences between their beliefs and those of normal people, between the lying fictitiousness of their own and the reality of the normal world. The ingeniousness of this device during the movement struggle for power is that the front organizations not only isolate the members, but offer them a semblance of outside normalcy, which wards off the impact of true reality more effectively than mere indoctrination. It is the difference between his own and the fellow travelers attitudes, which confirms a Nazi or Bolshevik in his belief in the fictitious explanation of the world. For the fellow traveler has the same convictions after all, albeit in a more normal, i.e. less fanatic, more confused form. So that to the party member, it appears that anyone whom the movement has not expressly singled out as an enemy, a Jew, a capitalist, etc., is on his side. That the world is full of secret allies who merely cannot as yet summon up the necessary strength of mind and character 
to draw the logical conclusions from their own convictions. The world at large, on the other side, usually gets its first glimpse of a totalitarian movement through its front organizations. The sympathizers, who are to all appearances still innocuous fellow citizens in a non-totalitarian society, can hardly be called single-minded fanatics. Through them, the movements make their fantastic lies more generally acceptable, can spread their propaganda in milder, more respectable forms, until the whole atmosphere is poisoned with totalitarian elements which are hardly recognizable as such, but appear to be normal political reactions or opinions. The fellow traveler organizations surround the totalitarian movement with a mist of normality and respectability that fools the membership about the true character of the outside world as much as it does the outside world about the true character of the movement. The front organization functions both ways, as the facade of the totalitarian movement to the non-totalitarian world, and as the facade of this world to the inner hierarchy of the movement. Even more striking than this relationship is the fact that it is repeated on different levels within the movement itself. As party members are related to and separated from the fellow travelers, so are the elite formations of the movement related to and separated from the ordinary members. If the fellow traveler still appears to be a normal inhabitant of the outside world who has adopted the totalitarian creed as one may adopt the program of an ordinary party, the ordinary members of the Nazi or Bolshevik movement still belongs in many respects to the surrounding world. His professional and social relationships are not yet absolutely determined by his party membership, although he may realize, as distinguished from the mere sympathizer, that in case of conflict between his party allegiance and his private life, the former is supposed to be decisive. The member of a militant group, on the other hand, is wholly identified with the movement, he has no profession and no private life independent of it. Just as the sympathizers constitute a protective wall around the members of the movement and represent the outside world to them, so the ordinary membership surrounds the militant groups and represents the normal outside world to them. A definite advantage of this structure is that it blunts the impact of one of the basic totalitarian tenets that the world is divided into two gigantic hostile camps, one of which is the movement, and that the movement can and must fight the whole world, a claim which prepares the way for the indiscriminate aggressiveness of totalitarian regimes in power. Through a carefully graduated hierarchy of militancy in which each rank is the higher level's image of the non-totalitarian world because it is less militant and its members less totally organized, the shock of the terrifying and monstrous totalitarian dichotomy is vitiated and never fully realized. This type of organization prevents its members ever being directly confronted with the outside world, whose hostility remains for them a mere ideological assumption. They are so well protected against the reality of the non-totalitarian world that they constantly underestimate the tremendous risks of totalitarian politics. There is no doubt that the totalitarian movements attack the status quo more radically than did any of the earlier revolutionary parties. They can afford this radicalism apparently so unsuited to mass organizations because their organization offers a temporary substitute for ordinary non-political life, which totalitarianism actually seeks to abolish. The whole world of non-political social relationships from which the professional revolutionary had to cut himself off or had to accept as they were, exists in the form of less militant groups in the movement. Within this hierarchically organized world, the fighters for world conquest and world revolution are never exposed to the shock inevitably generated by the discrepancy between revolutionary beliefs and the normal world. The reason why the movements in their pre-power revolutionary stage can attract so many ordinary Philistines is that their members live in a fool's paradise of normalcy. The party members are surrounded by the normal world of sympathizers and the elite formations by the normal world of ordinary members. Another advantage of the totalitarian pattern is that it can be repeated indefinitely and keeps the organization in a state of fluidity which permits it constantly to insert new layers and define new degrees of militancy. 
The whole history of the Nazi party can be told in terms of new formations within the Nazi movement. The SA, the Stormtroopers, founded in 1922, were the first Nazi formation which was supposed to be more militant than the party itself. In 1926, the SS was founded as the elite formation of the SA. After three years, the SS was separated from the SA and put under Himmler's command. It took Himmler only a few more years to repeat the same game within the SS. One after the other, and each more militant than its predecessor, there now came into being first the shock troops, then the death hand units, or the death head units, the quote, guard units for the concentration camps, which later were merged to form the armed SS, Waffen SS. Finally, the security service, the so called quote, ideological intelligence service of the party and its executive arm for the quote, negative population po policy and the office for the questions of race and resettlement. Rasa and Siedlungswesen, whose tasks were of a positive kind all of them developing out of the general SS, whose members, except for the higher Führer Corps, remained in their civilian occupations. To all these new formations, the members of the general SS now stood in the same relationship as the SA man to the SS man, or the party member to the SA man, or the member of a front organization to a party member. Now the general SS was charged not only with safeguarding the embodiments of the national socialist idea, but also with protecting the members of all special SS cadres from becoming detached from the movement itself. We are having uh, problems with the next reader being able to sign into the Zoom event. And so while I solve that technical problem, I wonder if uh, we could ask you, Roy, to respond to the sections that you just read, what they meant for you um, in, in these times. Okay, thank you. And, uh, and let me just say to the everyone involved in this, thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to participate. Uh, now, this is an, an interesting uh, passage in, in relation to thinking about this book in the relation to our present moment. Uh, not just this passage, but the section that it's now beginning. Uh, the section really began at the end of, of Peg's reading, but, but then right. uh, goes on into the next one. Uh, it's, you know, we're, we're now moving away from Arendt's account of totalitarian propaganda uh, and into what she has to say about totalitarian organization. And I think yeah, in this early section where in effect Arndt is explaining uh, how it is that totalitarian organization uh, simply by, by sheltering uh, the members from engagement with, with outside reality, I think it does have uh, some bearing on how we think about our present moment, but partly because I mean, I, I tend to think that, that part of the power and usefulness of this book is that it lets us uh, think about a model for what might be thought of as the, the core of what, what Arndt wants to call totalitarianism, a, a, a kind of dynamic to it. And then also to look at what are the features that do correspond to what we see in our world today and what are the ones that do not. Yes. And I, I happen to think that uh, one of the distinctive uh, aspects of our present moment, and if I, if I may just say explicitly about uh, the uh, Trump uh, political movement, such as it is, is what an easy time it had of it. Uh, that is, 
Donald Trump managed to get elected president in the United States. He was able to uh, take advantage of the um, uh, existing uh, array of social media outlets and of uh, the uh, presence of the, the Fox cable network, which allowed for something like this kind of insulation from outside reality, even without having developed anything like the actual highly disciplined uh, organizational structure that Arendt is, is gonna be talking about throughout this section. Uh, you know, it, 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 in, in the sense that I think we can you know, very much see how it is that the uh, supporters of the president, those who identify themselves with it as a movement are definitely living in a world that is different from the rest of us. And uh, I think many of us are hoping that they will uh, be forced to come to a reckoning with outside reality sometime soon. Uh, but at the same time, the reason why uh, you know, th that is uh, has to do at least in part with the fact that uh, after all, the movement exists uh, embedded within a constitutional and legal system, which is not fully pervaded uh, with what Arendt describes as totalitarian organization. Right, yeah. Are the reactions to that idea of what seems to be lacking is the uh, organizational dimension of totalitarianism that she's describing, but a ready-made propaganda machine that is, can act as a shield uh, to the outside world. I wonder what um, the other panelists think about this before we turn to the last few pages for this, this time of the reading. I, I, I just wanna highlight something that Roy um, touched on um, in, in talking about social media and Trump's election and presidency in 2016 and over the course of the past four years is that really we've been handed a kind of perfect storm. You know, Arendt is not giving us a, a kind of formula for totalitarianism. She's not giving us a roadmap for totalitarianism. She's identifying various elements that can crystallize together in the formation of a totalitarian or a fascist regime. And one of those elements that she talks about throughout this text is isolation and also the relationship between isolation and vulnerability to propaganda. I think something that has been um, widely acknowledged and written about over the course of the past you know, five years, if not longer, is the increasing isolating effects social media have had um, on our society. You know, rates of loneliness have skyrocketed, so have suicide rates, depression rates. Um, and the more time pe people spend alone, um, in front of their computer, the more likely they're to be in a reactive mindset, um, to be responding to something or to fall into a kind of conversational bubble. I don't know if anybody saw Donald Trump walk out of the 60 Minutes interview, but I think he said one of the most honest things of his entire presidency right before he cut his mic, um, which is that he wouldn't have been elected without Twitter. He said, I wouldn't be here without social media. And I, and I think that's absolutely right. And I think the combination of social media um, and Trump's particular skill set, which is, is brilliant, he's very good at what he does, have in part created this contemporary political situation in the United States. Mm -hmm. I and, and yet a I want to in, introduce oh, a word of caution. We're about to go to the next reader, um, Hannah Spector, who's with us now. And, and that's, I'm, I also want to call attention to what we were reading in the, in the sections before this about Besides the loneliness, what generates the loneliness is the sense of being a kind of a superfluous person. So the economic realities that preceded, uh, you know, the phenomenon of neoliberalism and globalization that preceded even the rise of Twitter and social media. So, I mean, when you say perfect storm, Samantha, I mean, yeah, absolutely. And then add the pandemic into the equation and, uh, it's 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 just it's an amazing situation that we're that we're living through and and it's not going to be no matter what happens uh, an easy one to fix uh, even if uh, if Trump is is defeated uh, and with that happy note <laughs> if I could turn turn the microphone uh, and the spotlight over to Hannah uh, Specter who's joined us now. Um, 
we will uh, will be able to uh, to continue with the reading. Just a second. Okay, Anna. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Guarding the embodiments of the national socialist idea, but also with protecting the members of all special SS cadres from becoming detached from the movement itself. This fluctuating hierarchy with its constant addition of new layers and shifts in authority is well known from secret control bodies, the, the secret police or espionage services where new controls are always needed to control the controllers. In the pre-power stage of the movements, total espionage is not yet possible, but the fluctuating hierarchy, similar to that of secret services, makes it possible, even without actual power, to degrade any rank or group that wavers or shows signs of decreasing radicalism by the mere insertion of a new, more radical layer. Hence, driving the older group automatically in the direction of the front organization and away from the center of the movement. Thus, the Nazi elite formations were primarily inner party organizations. The SA rose to the position of a super party when the party appeared to lose its radicality and was then in turn, and for similar reasons, superseded by the SS. The military value of the totalitarian elite formations, especially of the SA and the SS, are frequently overrated, while their purely inner party significance has been somewhat neglected. None of the fascist short organizations was founded for specific defensive or aggressive purposes, though defense of the leaders or the ordinary party members usually was cited as a pretext. The paramilitary form of Nazi and fascist elite groups was the result of their being founded as instruments of the ideological fight of the movement against the widespread pacifism in Europe after the First World War. For totalitarian purposes, it was much more important to set up as the expression of an aggressive attitude, a fake army, which resembled as closely as possible the bogus army of the pacifists, unable to understand the constitutional pace of an army within the political body. The pacifists had denounced all military institutions as bands of willful murderers than to have a troop of well-trained soldiers. The SA and the SS were certainly model organizations for arbitrary violence and murder. They were hardly as well-trained as the black Reichsfahr and they were not equipped for a fight against regular troops. Militaristic propaganda was more popular <clears throat> in post-war Germany than military training and uniforms did not enhance the military value of paramilitary troops, though they were useful as a clear indication of the abolition of civilian standards and morals. However, somehow these uniforms eased considerably the consciences of the murderers and also made them even more receptive to unquestioning obedience and unquestioned authority. Despite these militaristic trappings, the inner party faction of the Nazis, which was primarily nationalistic and militaristic, and therefore viewed the paramilitary troops not as mere party formations, but as an illegal enlargement of the Reichsfahr, which had been limited by the terms of the Versailles Peace Treaty, was the first to be liquidated. Rome, the leader of the SA stormtroopers, had indeed dreamed of and negotiated for incorporation of his SA into the Reichsfahr after the Nazi seized power. He was killed by Hitler because he tried to transform the new Nazi regime into a military dictatorship. Hitler had made it clear several years before that such a development was not desired by the Nazi movement when he dismissed Rome, a real soldier whose experience in the organization of the Black Reichsfahr would have made him indispensable to a serious military training program. From his position as chief of the SA and chose Himmler 
a man without the slightest knowledge of military matters as reorganizer of the SS. Apart from the importance of the elite formations to the organizational structure of the movement, where they comprise the changing nuclei of militancy, their paramilitary character must be understood in connection with other professional party organizations, such as those for teachers, lawyers, physicians, students, university professors, technicians, and workers. All these were primarily duplicates of existing non-totalitarian professional societies, paraprofessional as the stormtroopers were paramilitary. It was characteristic that the more clearly the European communist parties became branches of a Moscow directed Bolshevik movement, the more they too use their front organizations to compete with existing purely professional groups. The difference between the Nazis and the Bolsheviks in this respect was only that the Nazis had a pronounced tendency to consider these paraprofessional formations as part of the party elite, while the communists preferred to recruit from them the material for their front organizations. The important factor for the movement is that even before they seize power, they give the impression that all elements of society are embodied in their ranks. The ultimate goal of Nazi propaganda was to organize the whole German people as sympathizers. The Nazis went one step further in, the, in this game and set up a series of fake departments, which were modeled after the regular state administration, such as their own Department of Foreign Affairs, Education, Culture, Sport, etc. None of these institutions had more professional value than the imitation of the army represented by the stormtroopers. But together they created a perfect world of appearances in which every reality in the non-totalitarian world was slavishly duplicated in the form of humbug. This technique of duplication, certainly useless for the direct overthrow of government, proved extremely fruitful in the work of undermining actively existing institutions and the decomposition of the status quo, which totalitarian organizations invariably prefer to an open show of force. If it is the task of movements to bore their way like polyps into all positions of power, then they must be ready for any special social and political position. In accordance with their claim to total domination, every single organized group in the non-totalitarian society is felt to present a specific challenge to the movement to destroy it. Everyone needs, so to speak, a specific instrument of destruction. The practical value of the fake organizations came to light when the Nazis seized power and were ready at once to, de to destroy the existing teachers organizations with another teachers organization, the existing lawyers clubs with a Nazi lawyers sponsored club, etc. They could change overnight the whole structure of the German society and not just political life, precisely because they had prepared its exact counterpart within their own ranks. In this respect, the task of the paramilitary formations was finished when the regular military hierarchy could be placed during the last stages of the war under the authority of SS generals. The, te the technique of this coordination was an ingenious and irresistible as the deterioration of professional standards was swift and radical. Although these results were more immediately felt in the highly technical and specialized field of warfare than anywhere else. If the importance of paramilitary formations for totalitarian movements is not to be found in their doubtful military value, neither is it wholly in their fake imitation of the regular army. As elite formations, they are more sharply separated from the outside world than any other group. The Nazis realized very early the intimate connection between total militancy and total separation from, norm from normality. The stormtroopers were never assigned to duty in their home communities, and the active cadres of the SA in the pre-war stage and of the SS under the Nazi regime 
were so mobile and so frequently exchanged that they could not possibly get used to and take root in any other part of the ordinary world. They were organized after the model of criminal gangs and used for organized murder. These murderers were publicly paraded and officially admitted by the upper Nazi hierarchy so that open complicity made it well nigh impossible for members to quit the movement, even under the non-totalitarian government, and even if they were not threatened, as they actually were, by their former comrades. In this respect, the function of the elite formations is the very opposite of that of the front organizations. While the latter lend the movement an air of respectability and inspire confidence, the former, by extending complicity, make every party member aware that he has left for good the normal world, which outlaws murder, and that he will be held accountable for all crimes committed by the elite. This is achieved even in the, I think that's my last line. That is your last line. And I have, I believe, removed the spotlight from you. And I would uh, like to invite you to uh, comment if you'd like. We have a few minutes before the next speaker is Barry Smith. If you'd like to uh, say anything, please do. Sure. So as I was rereading this, and I, and I want to say that I started studying the origins of totalitarianism about 20 years ago. And at the time, I was earning an MFA in creative writing. And I was so taken with the way Arendt writes and her use of metaphors. The metaphors aren't quite explicit right here, um, but she's talking about the front organizations and, and, and this movement between who was at the front and who was behind. And I think that speaks to that metaphor of the onion that she uses when, to, when talking about totalitarianism. So as I've been listening to some of the, not all of the conversation, obviously in the last few hours, but one thing I wanted to just bring attention to with my background in, in writing is that Arendt explains totalitarianism in a way that many other political scientists at the time had not because she used these metaphors, which resonated for people like me who came from a literary background. Thank you. Um, Sam, John, would you like to comment? I'll move. Um, I see that I see that Madeline is here and if, if you're listening if you want to come on I know that you you've thought a lot about metaphors and Hannah Arendt's writing and I was just wondering if you want to to respond to Hannah's wonderful observation if not that's okay you can ignore me um, there you are hi sorry to put you on the spot but this is I know this is something that you've thought a lot about Thomas, can you unmute her? I am attempting to do that, asking her to unmute. Yes, um, there's coffee boiling beside me, but I'm just going to answer very, very quickly that yes, I also come to Hannah Arendt as a novelist, as, as someone who comes from a literary background, and I came to her through her incredible writings about writers. Um, and I think I think we'll get into this maybe more in my section. I think her ability to make distinctions, to use to under, she understands the language of poetics and yet her form of poetics is different from ours, from the literary worlds. Her form of poetics is a, as a form of clarity, of abil ability to make distinctions, of being able to allow us to concretize these things in our minds and then to be able to see the nuances. I think this is quite extraordinary about her writing. I have to grab this coffee, but I'll be right back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Barry, uh, you're, can you hear us? Yes, I can. For welcome. Sure. Yeah, you're welcome to join the conversation. We have about five minutes before your section begins. Thank you. John, what is your mind? Yeah, I think that um, <clears throat> when you look at the early writings of Arendt, when she's writing on Rilke and she's writing on theater, um, when you look at her personal library, uh, she's steeped in literature. That's, that's sort of the soil out of which um, her 
uh, political thinking comes. And even when she describes politics, she describes it in theatric terms. She describes the world as a stage and us as actors uh, being persons as people who sound through the mask. Um, she has a, um, a literary mind, I think. And uh, Randall uh, Jarrow, uh, you know, she wanted to learn German poetry and she made him learn German first and read it in the original language. And um, she really thought that in having language in that way, in the literary way, not in terms of, um, uh, say, uh, philosophical treaties and arguments, not that kind of uh, linguistic analysis, which when she got to Berkeley was all the rage and she thought it was deplorable. Um, but the kind of thinking that requires uh, what she says in the life of the mind with the metaphors, metaphoring, carrying something over from the mind into the world um, and making, as she points out about Rilke, making ashes burst into flames. And I, I think in many ways when we, we're reading this, it's happening to us in the reading of Origins of Totalitarianism. There's a way in which this language is bringing uh, illumination to our own time <laughs> And uh, just by the evocation of, of certain metaphors that she's using, so. Thank you, yeah, can, can Lindsay, are you yeah, with us? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. No, I'd really like that, but also um, want to draw attention to the different types of writing that Arendt does and the origins of totalitarianism. I mean, like Madeleine, I come, and come at this from literature, is a text, I think, which has archive fever. I mean, it gathers... <laughs> Just gathers the data, the documents. It's really um, determined that none of this is going to go. She's going to put it together. Then the text that follows The Human Condition is one of the strangest books I've ever read. It's kind of both naked. It's not, it hasn't got, it hasn't got context. And she's straining with her language in that book and in an utterly extraordinary ways. So I think it's one of the kind of um, best Best, 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 best kind of epic poems, I think, of the human condition of the late 20th century, but it's really peculiar, the writing she does there. And as someone who's interested in poetry, you look at some passages and some of it's working in between German and English, which in itself is fascinating, but she's straining to find a new language for the human condition. Whereas in Origins, as I say, it's a text of archive fever. I mean, she is feverishly amassing this material. It's not, it's going to be preserved in order, as she says in the beginning, to, de to be destroyed. To, you know, we're, the way we're going to destroy the ideology of totalitarianism is by documenting it to the point that um, it, it, it reveals itself for what it is. We have just a minute left. Samantha, you want to um, give us a comment from the point of view of someone who's working on precisely these things? Well, I think, <laughs> yes, I, I mean, I, I love everything that um, has been said. Um, you know, I think what Lindsay just said to pick up from that, that, you know, she's, she's, she's using this specific form of writing in a very political manner in order to do something with it. And I think in many ways, you know, this is Arendt's great contribution in, in a certain sense in, in, in thinking about what she can teach us and how we approach political questions. Um, the poetic quality of her writing, um, the kind of openness of the conceptual work that she's doing, her insistence upon drawing distinctions and her way of making material, those things that otherwise seem very difficult to grasp through the use of metaphor um, is, 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 very, is very powerful. Um, you know, it's, again, her methodology always reminds me very much of Walter Benjamin's work. She's doing a kind of Brechtian montage. She's making a kind of constellation, bringing various elements together to show us um, how things come into existence. And she has that, you know, it's this, it's this difficult to pin down kind of phenomenology, but it's also, it's also worldly. It's a, I don't know if you can say worldly phenomenology, but um, you know, she's always planting her feet in reality. And she uses language to, to help us see, 
to help us, um, you know, I think turn inward, engage in that conversation, that two in one that we have with ourselves, where we, we see the space between the world and ourselves. So we can see what we're being fed in terms of, for example, political propaganda. And then, you know, she's giving us the language to do the work of judgment. She's giving us these metaphors, these, these kind of conceptual, I think, tools um, in order to be better thinkers, in order to be more discerning. But the great, I mean, this is all too instrumental. I mean, the really beautiful thing about her writing is its openness, you know, and I think it's the open poetic quality of her work that, you know, draws readers continuously back to the human condition over time. Every time I pick up that book, I feel like I have never read it before. I've read it at least 30 times. Every time I read it, it is a brand new book to me. Um, you know, and John was right, you know, she's working with the poet. She learned how to English her writing from Randall Jarrell um, and she helped him translate his poetry. Um, and, you know, you see her playing, you see her playing with the structure. We are a minute past high noon on this election day. And Barry, uh, for those who are just joining us, uh, Barry Smith will be beginning at page 373 of Origins of Totalitarianism. We have, uh, Barry, I'm going to spotlight you so that you'll be the center of okay. the screen. And we have um, you, a generous 20 minutes, so take your time. Thank you. Prepar stage when the leadership systematically claims responsibility for all crimes and leaves no doubt that they are committed to the ultimate good of the movement. The artificial creation of civil war conditions by which the Nazis blackmailed their way into power has more than the obvious advantage of stirring up trouble. For the movement, organized violence is the most efficient of the many protective walls which surround its fictitious world, whose reality is proved whenever a member fears leaving the movement more than he fears the consequences of his complicity in illegal actions and feels more secure as a member than as an opponent. The feeling of security resulting from organized violence with which the elite formations protect the party members from the outside world is as important to the integrity of the fictitious world of the organization as the fear of its terror. In the center of the movement, as the motor that swings into motion, sits the leader. He is separated from the elite formation by an inner circle of the initiated who spread around him an aura of impenetrable mystery, which corresponds to his intangible preponderance. His position within this intimate circle depends on his ability to spin intrigues amongst its members and upon his skill in constantly changing its personnel. He owes his rise to leadership to an extreme ability to handle inner party struggles for power rather than to demagogic or bureaucratic organizational qualities. He is distinguished from earlier types of dictators in that he hardly wins through simple violence. Hitler neither needed the SA nor the SS to secure his position as leader of the Nazi movement. On the contrary, Rom, the chief of the SA and able to count upon its loyalty to his own person was one of Hitler's inner party enemies. Stalin won against Trotsky, who not only had far greater mass appeal, but as the chief of the Red Army, held in his hands the greatest power potential in Soviet Russia at the time. Not Stalin, but Trotsky, however, was the greatest organizational talent, the ablest bureaucrat of the Russian Revolution. On the other hand, both Hitler and Stalin were masters of detail and devoted themselves in the early stages of their careers almost entirely to questions of personnel. So that after a few years, hardly any man of importance remained who did not owe his position to them. 
Such personal abilities, however, though an absolute prerequisite for the first stages of such a career, and even later, far from insignificant, are no longer decisive when a totalitarian movement has been built up, has established the principle that the will of the Fuhrer is the party's law, and when its whole hierarchy has been efficiently trained for a single purpose, swiftly to communicate the will of the leader to all ranks. When this has been achieved, the leader is irreplaceable because the whole complicated structure of the movement would lose its raison d'etre without his commands. Now, despite eternal cabals in the inner clique and unending shifts of personnel with their tremendous accumulation of hatred, bitterness and personal resentment, the leader's position can remain secure against chaotic palace revolutions, not because of his superior gifts, about which the men in his intimate surroundings frequently have no great illusions, but because of these men's sincere and sensible conviction that without him, everything would be immediately lost. The supreme task of the leader is to impersonate the double function characteristic of each layer of the movement, to act as the magic defense of the movement against the outside world, and at the same time, to be the direct bridge by which the movement is connected with it. The leader represents the movement in a way totally different from all ordinary party leaders. He claims personal responsibility for every action, deed, or misdeed committed by any member or functionary in his official capacity. This total responsibility is the most important organizational aspect of the so-called leader principle, according to which every functionary is not only appointed by the leader, but is his walking embodiment. And every order is supposed to emanate from this one ever-present source. This, through identification of the leader with every appointed sub-leader, and this monopoly of responsibility for everything which is being done, are also the most conspicuous signs of the decisive difference between a totalitarian leader and an ordinary dictator or despot. A tyrant would never identify himself with his subordinates, let alone with every one of their acts. He might use them as scapegoats and gladly have them criticized in order to save himself from the wrath of the people. But he would always maintain an absolute distance from all his subordinates and all his subjects. The leader, on the contrary, cannot tolerate criticism of his subordinates since they always act in his name. If he wants to correct his own errors, he must liquidate those who carried them out. If he wants to blame his mistakes on others, he must kill them. For within this organizational framework, a mistake can only be a fraud, the impersonation of the leader by an imposter. The total responsibility for everything done by the movement and this total identification with every one of its functionaries have the very practical consequence that nobody ever experiences a situation in which he has to be responsible for his own actions or can explain the reasons for them. Since the leader has monopolized the right and possibility of explanation, he appears to the outside world as the only person who knows what he is doing, i.e. the only representative of the movement with whom one may still talk in non-totalitarian terms and who, if reproached or opposed, cannot say, don't ask me, ask the leader. Being in the center of the movement, the leader can act as though he were above it. It is therefore perfectly understandable and perfectly futile for outsiders to set their hopes time and again on a personal talk with the leader himself 
when they have to deal with totalitarian movements or government. The real mystery of the totalitarian leader resides in an organization which makes it possible for him to assume the total responsibility for all crimes committed by the elite formation of the movement and to claim at the same time the honest, innocent respectability of one of its most naive fellow travelers. The totalitarian movements have been called secret societies established in broad daylight. Indeed, little as we know of the sociological structure and the more recent history of secret societies, the structure of the movements, unprecedented if compared with parties and factions, reminds one of nothing so much as of outstanding traits of secret societies. Secret societies also form hierarchies according to degrees of initiation, regulate the life of their members according to a secret and fictitious assumption, which makes everything look as though it were something else. Adopt a strategy of consistent lying to deceive the non-initiated external masses, demand unquestioning obedience from their members who are held together by allegiance to a frequently unknown and always mysterious leader who is himself surrounded or supposed to be surrounded by a small group of initiated who in turn are surrounded by the half initiated who form a buffer area against the hostile profane world. With secret societies, the totalitarian movements also share the dichotomous division of the world between sworn blood brothers and an indistinct, inarticulate mass. Barry, thank you for that uh, very measured reading of a fascinating passage. We have a little bit of time before Madeline is to read. Uh, if you'd like to comment, I'd welcome your uh, thoughts on this. Yes, I was, I was like everyone else who's listening and all of, all of you in this discussion, one struck immediately by the, the relevance, the, the freshness of these uh, remarks. And just as the discussion I, I joined earlier, it's as though Arendt is piling up a set of reminders. There's a sort of tumbling out of, of great observations and one just feeds on to the other and the other where she's, she's making point after point that we can see the, the relevance of. Lovely stuff about creating the chaos around the leader, continually having people warring with each other, change of personnel so that nobody can stage a putsch. But then the, the fact that initiation in the movement is about insulating yourself from the reality of the world, telling obvious and copious lies to know whether you're in or out. And then beautiful observation about people fearing being outside that, that group as much as they fear doing the dark work of the group itself. I mean, this is in that short space of four pages, she piles up a number of thoughts that, that themselves could be small, a small treatise about how such societies and totalitarian authoritarian regimes work. And, and you, you just, you hear a kind of breathlessness when she's, she's saying all these things, which, which is why I had to take it slowly in reading, not only for my own uh, peace of mind, but also because you really want people to dwell on each of these brilliantly made observations. Yeah, thanks. I, I actually um, was, <laughs> your, your reading of it was anything but breathless. It was uh, very nicely paced, but the breathlessness of the content is really present. It's related to what Lindsay was saying before about this sort of feverish accumulation of the entire picture, while it's fresh in her mind, while the material is present, one does have that sense. And for this passage, just leaps out for comparison. I think it was Roy before uh, was speaking before and pointed out both the the how how difficult it is to avoid thinking about the contemporary relevance, but in its similarity and in its difference. And I was struck in this passage by the distinction between the totalitarian leader and the tyrant. Um, the, the, the early portion on the 
uh, shifting of personnel uh, so that no one can accumulate power. There, there were aspects of it that seem relevant to our current situation, but you can't help but see the responsibility word. Absolutely. Leap out. Absolutely. And Absolutely. That That's doesn't fit the point. Big... Yeah, yeah, that was the key point. And I thought to myself, I'm sure everybody listening and, and reading, you just thought, there's a departure, there's a stepping away. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Just, it, it strikes me now that we've had this conversation about uh, that Lindsay initiated and now Barry's uh, followed up on and Thomas, that perhaps she's doing something uh, that I hadn't noticed before, which is to, in that breathless con delivery of content, um, even when it's read slowly, you get a sense of that movement of totalitarianism, this kind of accumulating force and power that almost becomes unstoppable because it's just one sentence after another. Uh, and in some ways, it's a, it's a brilliant way to take you through how totalitarianism happens. You begin to feel it almost in a claustrophobic way as you as you read the lines. I, I think that's a really significant insight in this text. That's, that's a beautiful way of putting it because you feel steamrollered, I think, by the, by the weight of uh, ways it works. And you, you see the totalitarianism as a sort of hydra headed beast. You know, we go and tackle this part, but there's another part to it. And somehow they've all got to may, be made coherent from the inside and yet we are picking them off one by one. We're noticing these, these ways in which it operates. But I, I, I like that thought that the breathlessness is also, you're just being flattened by the way it's working on you again and again in so many different ways. It's a nice point also, John, because it calls attention to a different aspect of the poetics of the text. And just before we were talking with Hannah and Madeline about the use of metaphor, but also the rhythm, and one can't help but recall with astonishment that she had uh, that Arendt had learned English fairly recently uh, as a as a, as a written language uh, as she's writing this, and I think that it's a really nice observation about how the the sense of movement that's so important in her conceptual analysis comes across in the poetics in exactly the way you're you're saying. And yet, one, one final point, just to go back to something that Sam said, that in the reading, and I think this is why what we're doing today is so um, interesting, is you get the interest, the space between what is said and the space in your voice. And that is a space of reflection. I mean, Arendt's Kantian in her aesthetics. So it does all those wonderful things, but it's deliberately aesthetic because it's creating a space for judgment and thought. Yeah, she's also got great control of dependent clauses. <laughs> yeah. Can I add one thing that really Please. struck out to me as I listened? Um, that be, I've spent 10 years writing about um, Cambodia, Civil War, Pol Pot, the Cultural Revolution, China. And what really kind of broke my heart as I was listening was just how she doesn't write about Asia, of course, but she's so accurate in describing the conditions that people felt that lived experience. I, when I think of, you know, the, the many years I spent thinking about Cambodia, um, how members of the Khmer Rouge, when they were taken to the prison, when 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 they were purged, they always felt if they could only speak to the leader, if they could only speak to Pol Pot himself, that 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 they would be able to cut through this world of appearances because they. They had always tried to do right by the leader. And, and I think that the way that she describes this is so startling to me because, you know, she's, ab she's abstracting and she's also incredibly precise. <laughs> Her ability to, to look at the whole system and also get at the very human dimensions of, of um, the situation. I just find it devastating actually to, to listen to. Uh, thank you, Madeline. We are just at time for you to begin. Uh, and those, for those who are just joining us, we are at page 377 of The Origins of Totalitarianism. And I will let me uh, put you on the center of the screen. Just a moment. I'm sorry. For I found it. And now you may begin. Thank you. Of sworn enemies. This distinction 
based on absolute hostility to the surrounding world is very different from the ordinary party's tendency to divide people into those who belong and those who don't. Parties and open societies in general will consider only those who expressly oppose them to be their enemies, while it has always been the principle of secret societies that quote, whoever is not expressly included is excluded. This esoteric principle seems to be entirely inappropriate for mass organizations, yet the Nazis gave their members at least the psychological equivalent for the initiation ritual of secret societies, which instead of simply excluding Jews from membership, they demanded proof of non-Jewish descent from the members and set up a complicated machine to shed light on the dark ancestry of some 80 million Germans. It was of course a comedy and even an expensive one when 80 million Germans set out to look for Jewish grandfathers. Yet everybody came out of the examination with the feeling that he belonged to a group of included which stood against an imaginary multitude of ineligibles. The same principle is confirmed in the Bolshevik movement through repeated party purges, which inspire in everybody who is not excluded a reaffirmation of his inclusion. Perhaps the most striking similarity between the secret societies and the totalitarian movements lies in the role of the ritual. The marches around the Red Square in Moscow are in this respect no less characteristic than the pompous formalities of the Nuremberg party days. In the center of the Nazi ritual was the so-called, quote, blood banner. And in the center of the Bolshevik ritual stands the mummified corpse of Lenin, both of which introduce a strong element of idolatry into the ceremony. Such idolatry hardly is proof, as is sometimes asserted, of pseudo-religious or heretical tendencies. The, quote, idols are mere organizational devices familiar from the ritual of secret societies, which also used to frighten their members into secretiveness by means of frightful, awe-inspiring symbols. It is obvious that people are more securely held together through the common experience of a secret ritual than by the common sharing of the secret itself. That the secret of totalitarian movements is exposed in broad daylight does not necessarily change the nature of the experience. These similarities, similarities are not, of course, accidental. They cannot simply be explained by the fact that both Hitler and Stalin had been members of modern secret societies before they became totalitarian leaders. Hitler in the secret service of the Reichswehr and Stalin in the conspiracy section of the Bolshevik party. They are to some extent the natural outcome of the conspiracy fiction of totalitarianism, whose organizations supposedly have been founded to counteract secret societies, the secret society of the Jews or the conspiratory society of the Trotskyites. What is remarkable in the totalitarian organizations is rather that they could adopt so many organizational devices of secret societies without ever trying to keep, to keep their own goal a secret that the Nazis wanted to conquer the world, deport, quote, racially alien peoples and exterminate those of, quote, inferior biological heritage that the Bolsheviks work for the world revolution was never a secret. These aims, on the contrary, were always part of their propaganda. In other words, the totalitarian movements imitate all the paraphernalia of the secret societies but empty them of the only thing that could excuse or was supposed to excuse their methods, the necessity to safeguard a secret. In this, as in so many other respects, Nazism and Bolshevism arrived at the same organizational result from very different historical beginnings. The Nazis started with the fiction of a conspiracy and modeled themselves more or less consciously after the example of the secret society of the elders of Zion, whereas the Bolsheviks came from a revolutionary party whose aim was one party dictatorship, passed through a stage in which the party was quote, entirely apart and above everything to the moment when the Politburo of the party was quote, 
entirely apart from and above everything. Finally, Stalin imposed upon this party structure the rigid totalitarian rules of its conspiratory sector and only then discovered the need for a central fiction to maintain the iron discipline of a secret society under the conditions of a mass organization. The Nazi development may be more logical, more consistent in itself, but the history of the Bolshevik party offers a better illustration of the essentially fictitious character of totalitarianism, precisely because the fictitious global conspiracies against and according to which the Bolshevik conspiracy is supposedly organized have not been ideologically fixed. They have changed from the Trotskyites to the 300 families, then to various quote imperialisms and recently to quote rootless cosmopolitanism and were adjusted to passing needs. Yet at no moment and under none of the most various circumstances has it been possible for Bolshevism to do without some such fiction. The means by which Stalin changed the Russian one-party dictatorship into a totalitarian regime and the revolutionary communist parties all over the world into totalitarian movements was the liquidation of factions, the abolition of inner party democracy and the transformation of national communist parties into Moscow directed branches of the Comintern secret societies in general and the conspiratory apparatus of revolutionary parties in particular have always been characterized by the absence of factions, suppression of dissident opinions and absolute centralization of command. All these measures have the obvious utilitarian purpose of protecting the members against persecution and the society against treason the total obedience asked of each member and the absolute power in the hands of the chief were only inevitable byproducts of practical necessities. The trouble, however, is that conspirators have an understandable tendency to think that the most efficient methods in politics in general are those of conspiratory societies and that if one can apply them in broad daylight and support them with a whole nation's instruments of violence, the possibilities for power accumulation become absolutely limitless. The conspiratory sector of a revolutionary party can, as long as the party itself is still intact, be likened to the role of the army within an intact political body. Although its own rules of conduct differ radically from those of the civilian body, it serves remains subject to and is controlled by it. Just as the danger of a military dictatorship arises when the army no longer serves but wants to dominate the body politic, so the danger of totalitarianism arises when the conspiratory sector of a revolutionary party emancipates itself from the control of the party and aspires to leadership. This is what happened to the communist parties under the Stalin regime. Stalin's methods were always typical of a man who came from the conspiratory sector of the party, his devotion to detail, his emphasis on the personal side of politics, his ruthlessness in the use and liquidation of comrades and friends. His chief support in the succession struggle after Lenin's death came from the secret police, which at that time had already become one of the most important and powerful sections of the party. It was only natural that the Cheka's sympathies should be with the representative of the conspiratory section, with the man who already looked upon it as a kind of secret society and therefore was likely to preserve and to expand its privileges. The seizure of the communist parties by their conspiratory sector, however, was only the first step in their transformation into totalitarian movements. It was not enough that the secret police in Russia and its agents in the communist parties abroad played the same role in the movement as the elite formations which the Nazis had constituted in the form of paramilitary troops. The parties themselves had to be transformed 
if the rule of the secret police was to remain stable. Liquidation of factions and inter-party democracy, consequently, was accompanied in Russia by the admission of large, politically uneducated and, quote, neutral masses to membership, a policy which was quickly followed by the communist parties abroad after the popular front policy had initiated it. Nazi totalitarianism started with a mass organization which was only gradually dominated by elite formations, while the Bolsheviks started with elite formations and organized the masses accordingly. The result was the same in both cases. The Nazis, moreover, because of their militaristic tradition and prejudices, originally modeled their elite formations after the army, while the Bolsheviks from the beginning endowed the secret police with the exercise of supreme power. Yet after a few years, this difference too disappeared. The chief of the SS became the chief of the secret police and the SS formations were gradually incorporated into and replaced former personnel of the Gestapo, even though this personnel already consisted of reliable Nazis. It is because of this essential affinity between the functioning of a secret society of conspirators and of the secret police organized to combat it, that totalitarian regimes based on a fiction of global conspiracy and aiming at global rule, eventually concentrate all power in the hands of the police. In the pre-power stage, however, the quote, secret societies in broad daylight offer other organizational advantages. The obvious contradiction between a mass organization and an exclusive society, which alone can be trusted to keep a secret, is of no importance compared with the fact that the very structure of secret and conspiratory societies could translate the totalitarian ideological dichotomy, the blind hostility of the masses against the existing world, regardless of its divergences and differences, into an organizational principle. From the viewpoint of an organization which functions according to the principle that whoever is not included is excluded, whoever is not with me is against me. The world at large loses all the nuances, differenti differentiations, and pluralistic aspects which had in any event become confusing and unbearable. Thank you. Madeline, uh, I'll invite you as I um, welcome everyone else back into the conversation, if you'd like to comment on that. And if you, we have only about seven minutes, but I was also very interested in what you were saying before about your research on Cambodia. If you want to bring that in, certainly feel free to say whatever you'd like, but uh, it would be interesting to hear more about that. Mm -hmm. um, I think here where she talks about conspiracy, I mean, I find this, these pages chilling, <laughs> incredibly chilling. And, um, I, I mean, it's interesting, the rhetoric of secrecy, the poetics of secrecy, all of that, of, of what, what draws one into a conspiracy th theory when the secret is open, but one has the feeling that one is the only one that knows. I mean, that contradiction is so alive in what, in what she's describing. Um, and to link back to what I was saying earlier about Cambodia and China, uh, it's, it's, I'm trying to, not the different passages, she said so much in these, just in the last eight pages or so, but, um, yes. You know, that complex layering of appearances that appear to be the truth and the organization into groups of people who believe they hold the appearance that is the truth. And then this sort of complex division that starts to happen, this true, especially in China in the 1960s into the, I, I have so many thoughts that I'm having difficulty formulating it, but, but what I, I think was powerful under Mao was um, 
this sense that revolutionary change was occurring in the hands of the people, but all of it in the end purposed to keep the power intact. I think that sense of revolutionary for forces that people felt they had in their hands, um, when in fact all of this permanent warfare, all of the secret keeping or the levels of appearance all served strangely to make the power structure cohere. I, th I think that that is such a complex web that we're living in at this moment. I, I was also fascinated by what you said at the beginning, um, calling attention to that, uh, the secret that it comes out in the open, uh, which resonates with one hears often the phrase, uh, saying the quiet part out loud these days. Um, and it seems resonant in that, uh, in that sense that there's some, um, there's some way in which the, uh, in order to have the, um, the mass organizing power, it has to come out in the open, but in order for you to feel that you're part of the inner circle, it has to also have this secretive quality. So the, um, a mass conspiracy becomes very attractive uh, for those purposes. Uh, the other panelists are all with us. So would anyone like to comment? I'll just, I'll just jump in quickly and, and say that I, you know, I, I think my, my cultural touchstone while you were reading, Madeline, was unfortunately the wave of conspiracy theories that have gripped American politics in the past few years from Pizzagate to QAnon um, and trying to wrestle with the question of why it seems so many people have been attracted to these kinds of conspiracy theories and what, if anything, do they have to do with the phenomena of Donald Trump and electoral politics? And what does it say about our, our political institutions? What does it say about what's happening to American democracy, I think, at, at this moment? You know, I think something that I was hearing in what Thomas um, was saying is that, you know, one of the things that this kind of this kind of propaganda offers people is is the belief that, you know, the reality that they're forced to live day after day, they don't have to accept that as given. Right. So if you're unhappy with your day to day life, right, in, in any capacity, right, then you have have this you have this kind of ideological narrative or cynical narrative or this narrative conspiracy theory narrative that tells you well that's not the real reality there's a different reality behind behind that reality and that's to, to blame for the condition that you find yourself in um, and I can teach you how to see what's real and what's not real and you know I think I think that's part of Arendt's argument um, and part of where she's she's going to lead us to um, but that that's one of the things I was thinking about that's, that's uh, go ahead, Barry, and then I Lindsay. Say, that's a really nice thought because of course that's a philosopher's stock in trade, the appearance reality distinction. And if you ask most philosophers how they got into this business, you'll find an event in their childhood where they thought, you know, what I'm being presented with is real. I just feel you've got to get behind those walls. Is, it, is, this, is this the whole thing? So, so that pushing to find some explanation that makes sense to you, very philosophical. So, so that would make Arendt very aware of that, I think, in, in seeing the appeal that people have. And, you know, when, when their lives, when they're faced with chaos and their lives are in pretty bad array, it's really quite tempting to think there's a bigger story in which you are not the victim of the story, but you're part of mobilizing some power to change your circumstances. Very tempting. Mm. Uh, Lindsay, we have a minute. Did you okay, want to Okay, yeah, no, that's fascinating. But there's a flip side as well, which goes back to that word uh, responsibility that we picked up earlier. Um, and that great formulation where, you know, there's an open secret that everyone knows, but somehow you think you're the only one who knows it. That particular psychic structure works both um, in terms of the loneliness of the masses, but also for everyone else. One is a route to power. I join the conspiracy, I join power. The other is a route to powerlessness because you're sitting there going, I know this is not true. Why are they behaving like it's true? Mm -hmm. And then I always have in the back of my head, Arendt's warning at, um, about inner immigration. You can't just withdraw from a reality in which you live with a community of people who believe in lies. You actually have to take 
responsibility. You know, the bit in that wonderful, wonderful um, essay on Lessing when she goes up to Hamburg and says, you know, immigration, you know, withdrawing from a reality you can't cope with is not on. I'm, you know, you've got to try harder. You've got to be more responsible. But you're still structured. You're still caught up in that structure of disavowal. I know that you know that we know. But I feel lonely. One route to loneliness is power. One route to loneliness is disempowerment and hopelessness. Nice. Uh, thank you, Lindsay. And uh, I want now to welcome Eric Ward uh, to the party. Welcome, Eric. Uh, for Hello. Joining us. Eric will be beginning to read on page 381 of Hannah Arendt's Origins of Totalitarianism. And Eric, begin whenever you'd like. Thank you. Bearable to the masses who had lost their place and their orientation in it. What inspired them with the unwavering loyalty of members of secret societies was not so much the secret as the dichotomy between us and all others. This could be kept intact by imitating the secret society's organizational structure and emptying it of its rational purpose of safeguarding a secret. Nor did it matter if a conspiracy ideology was the origin of this development as in the case of the Nazis <clears throat> or the parasitic growth of the conspiratorial sector of a revolutionary party as in the case of the Bolsheviks. The claim inherent in totalitarian organization is that everything outside the movement is dying a claim which is drastically realized under the murderous conditions of totalitarian rule, but which even in the pre-power stage appears plausible to the masses who escape from the disintegration and disorientation into the fictitious home of the movement. Totalitarian movements have proved time and time again that they command the same total loyalty in life and death in which has been the prerogative of secret and conspiracy, conspiratory societies. The complete absence of resistance in a thoroughly trained and armed troop like the SA in the face of murder of the beloved leader Rom and the hundreds of close comrades was a curious spectacle. At that moment, probably Rom and not Hitler had the power of the Reichswehr behind him. But these incidents in Nazi movement have now been overshadowed by the ever repeated spectacle of self-confessed criminals in the Bolshevik parties. Trials based on absurd confessions have become part of an internally all important and externally incomprehensive ritual. But no matter how the victims are being prepared today, this ritual owes its existence to the properly unfabricated confessions of the old Bolshevik guard in 1936. Long before the time of Moscow trials, men condemned to death would receive their sentences with great calm, an attitude particularly prevalent among members of the Cheka. So long as the movement exists, its peculiar form of organization makes sure that at least the elite formations can no longer conceive of life outside the closely knit band of men who, even if they are condemned, still feel superior to the rest of the uninitiated world. And since this organization's exclusive aim has always been to deceive and fight and ultimately conquer the outside world, its members are satisfied to pay with their lives if only this helps again to fool the world. The chief value, however, of the secret or conspiratory society's organizational structure and moral standards for the purposes of mass organization does not even lie in the inherent guarantees of unconditional belonging and loyalty and organizational manifestations of unquestioned hostility to the fictitious world through consistent lines. The whole hierarchical structure of totalitarian movements from naive fellow travelers to party members, elite formations, the intimate circle around the leader and the leader himself 
could be described in terms of curiously varying mixtures of gullibility and cynicism with which each member, depending upon his rank and standing in the movement, is expected to react to the changing lying statements of the leader and the central unchanging ideological fiction of the movement. A mixture of gullibility and cynicism have been an outstanding characteristic of mob mentality before it became an everyday phenomenon of the masses. In an ever-changing, incomprehensible world, the masses had reached a point where they would at the same time believe everything and nothing, think that everything was possible and that nothing was true. The mixture in itself was remarkable enough because it spelled the end of illusion, that gullibility was a weakness of unsuspecting primitive souls and cynicism, the vice of superior and refined minds. Mass propaganda discovered that its audience was ready at all times to believe the worst, no matter how absurd, and did not particularly object to being deceived because it held every statement to be a lie anyhow. The totalitarian mass leaders based their propaganda on the correct psychological assumption that under such conditions, one could make people believe the most fantastic statements one day and trust that if the next day they were given irrefutable proof of their falsehood, they would take refuge in cynicism instead of deserting the leaders who had lied to them. They would protest that they had known all along that the statement was a lie and would admire the leader for their superior tactical cleverness. What had been demonstrable reaction of mass audiences became an important hierarchical principle for mass organization. A mixture of gullibility and cynicism is prevalent in all ranks of totalitarian movements. And the higher the rank, the more cynicism weighs down gullibility. The essential conviction shared by all ranks, from fellow traveler to leader, is that politics is a game of cheating and that the first commandment of the movement, the Fuhrer is always right, is as necessary for the purposes of world politics, i.e. worldwide cheating, as the rules of military discipline are for the purposes of war. The machine that generates, organizes, and spreads the monstrous falsehoods of totalitarian movements depends again on the position of the leader to the propaganda assertion that all happenings are scientifically predictable according to the laws of nature or economics. Totalitarian organizations add the position of one man who has monopolized this knowledge and whose principal quality is that he was always right and will always be right. To a member of a totalitarian movement, this knowledge has nothing to do with truth. And this being right, nothing to do with objective truthfulness of the leader's statement, which cannot be disproved by facts, but only by the future success or failure. The leader is always right in his actions. And since these are planned for centuries to come, the ultimate test of what he does has been removed beyond the experience of his contemporaries. The only group supposed to believe, um, the only group supposed to believe loyally and textually in the leader's words are the sympathizers whose confidence surrounds the movement with an atmosphere of honesty and simple mindedness that helps the leader to fulfill his task. That is to inspire confidence in the movement the party members never believe public statements and are not supposed to, but are complemented by totalitarian propaganda on that superior intelligence, which supposedly distinguishes them from the non-totalitarian outside world, which in turn, they know only from the abnormal capabilities of sympathizers. Only Nazi sympathizers believed Hitler when he swore his famous legality oath before the Supreme Court of the Weimar Republic. Members of the movement knew very well that he lied and trusted him more than ever because apparently he was able to fool public opinion 
and the authorities. When in the latter years, Hitler repeated the performance for the whole world, when he swore to his good intentions, and at the same time, most openly prepared his crimes, the admiration of the Nazi membership naturally was boundless. Similarly, only Bolshevik fellow travelers believed in the dissolution of the, of the common term, and only the non-organized masses of the Russian people and the fellow travelers abroad were meant to take at face value Stalin's pro-democratic statements during the war. Bolshevik party members were explicitly warned not to be fooled by the tactical maneuvers and were asked to admire their leader's shrewdness in betraying his allies. Without the organizational division of the movement into elite formations, membership, and sympathizers, the lies of the leader would not work. The graduation of cynicism expressed in a hierarchy of contempt is at least as necessary in the face of constant refutation as plain gullibility. The point is, is that the sympathizers in front organizations despise their fellow citizens, complete lack of initiation. The party members despise the fellow travelers, gull oh sorry, at gullibility and lack of radicalism. The elite formations despise for similar reasons the party membership, and within the elite formations, a similar hierarchy of contempt accompanies every new form foundation and development. The result of this system is that the gullibility of sympathizers makes lies credible to the outside world, while at the same time, the graduated cynicism, cynicism of membership and elite formations eliminates the danger that the leader will ever be forced by the weight of his own propaganda to make good on his own statements and feign respectability. It has been one of the chief handicaps of the outside world in dealing with totalitarian systems that it ignored the system and therefore trusted that on one hand, the very enormity of totalitarian lies would be their undoing and that on the other, it would be possible to take the leader at his word and force him, regardless of his original intentions, to make good. The totalitarian system, unfortunately, is foolproof against such normal consequences. Its ingenious, ingeniousness rests precisely on the elimination of that reality, which either unmasks the liars or forces him to live up to his pretense. While the membership does not believe the statements made for public consumption, it believes all the more fervently the standard cliches of ideological explanation, the keys to the past and future history, which totalitarian movements took from the 19th century ideologies and transformed through organization into working reality. These ideological elements in which the masses have come to believe anyhow, albeit rather vaguely and abstractly, were turned into factual lies of an all comprehensive nature, the domination of the world by Jews, instead of a general theory about races, the conspiracy of Wall Street, instead of a general theory about classes, and integrated into the general scheme of action in which only the dying, the dying classes of capitalist countries or the decadent nations are supposed to stand in the way of the movement in contrast to the movement's tactical lies, which change literally from day to day. These ideological lies are supposed to be believed like sacred, untouchable truths. They are surrounded by a carefully elaborated system of quote, scientific proofs, which do not have to be convincing for the completely, quote, uninitiated, but still appeal to some vulgarized thirst of knowledge by demonstrating the inferiority of Jews or the misery of people living under a capitalist system. The elite formations are distinguished from an ordinary party membership in that they do not need such demonstrations. They're not even supposed to believe in the literal truth of ideological cliches. 
these are the fabricated answer. These are fabricated to answer a quest for truth among the masses, which in its insistence on explanation and demonstration still has much in common with the normal. Eric, thank you. we have um, five minutes and an enormous text to unpack. Uh, so um, no time for it, but would you like to, if you'd like to make a few comments, you're most welcome as I unmute our other panelists. It's great. I'm excited to, to hear from, from um, other panelists. You know, what, what strikes me here in, in this section, uh, as, as I reflect on it, um, are the unpacking of, um, in, in many ways, what appear to be um, the evolution of, of secret societies into like strong political formation. And it's, it feels like a, a, a recapturing of the term of mysteries, right? Bearing mysteries within a religious context or uh, within um, uh, a secret society uh, and then evolving it into political formations where there is no longer uh, a distinction between one's kind of ideological stance, right? and one spiritual or religious stance uh, in society. And what the, what the Nazis and what some of these ideological, I often refer to them as ideological cults, while that's not entirely accurate, what, what I mean by that is that they establish a unique unified system of beliefs <laughs> and myths, right? That respond uh, to the falsehoods and, and the thinness or the ability of those ideological movements to deliver on real promises. What they do instead is deliver on uh, people's anxieties, uh, hopes and wishes around those promises without ever having to deliver something substantial. And I just think this, sesh, this uh, section uh, does a very good job of unpacking uh, how that narrative, how that myth uh, and uh, how that propaganda is used both internally and, and externally. So that's what really always strikes me about that section. And consistent with that is the uh, the sense that the promised land is ahead. It's a strike. So no, no reality is going to disprove what's been promised because it's there in the future. Uh, yes. And it has, it has that... Um, cultic religious dimension to it. Uh, we have a couple of minutes. Uh, John, Sam, Madeline, would you like to step in? Heather, I'll introduce you in a moment. I think I was really struck by that, that line that everything was possible and nothing was true. That uh, the cynicism was sort of um, the safeguard against the destruction of the movement. Um, and I, uh, in, in a strange uh, analogy, I remember the Heaven's Gate cult. Uh, and after they all committed suicide um, and the people who chickened out and didn't get on the Hale-Bopp comet um, said that they wish they had. And I was so struck that they, <laughs> saw the futility of that, saw, would almost be confronted with the unreality of their belief system and yet continued to believe and were still willing to sacrifice their life. And it is precisely this kind of logic that the, that the future is completely open and there is no measure for truth. So one has to just continually move forward even if things don't make sense. Um, and it's pretty remarkable. Something that always strikes me, at, which was the beginning of the passage, was how she notes that plurality is unbearable or that people feel this plurality is unbearable. And so, you know, what I always moves me about her is her ability to to speak and to, to analyze so well, but always she's putting her finger on a pressure point of human desire, of who kind of desires that we have to have this focusing element that will make everything crystallize it and make it all make sense, however incoherent that may seem to others. And I think she really does that in this passage. You get that sense that we, some of us would prefer to have 
Some would prefer to have the interpretation of reality fixed and replace reality. At least it will be clear and consistent in, in, a, in that person's life. And it's, it's so true and is, is kind of what we're, what, what, what we're up against, I guess, all of us. We are at 1 p.m. here in New York, 7 p.m. in Berlin. I and uh, different times and elsewhere. If you're just joining us, I would like to introduce Heather Nordstrom, who is going to read from Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism. We are picking up with page 385. And Heather, you are now on the spotlight. Thank you. World, the elite is not composed of ideologists. Its members' whole education is aimed at abolishing their capacity for distinguishing between truth and falsehood, between reality and fiction. Their superiority consists in their ability to immediately dissolve every statement of fact into a declaration of purpose. In distinction to the mass membership, which, for instance, needs some demonstration of inferiority of the Jewish race before it can safely be asked to kill Jews, the elite formations understand that the statement, all Jews are inferior, means all Jews should be killed. They know that when they are told only Moscow has a subway, the real meaning of the statement is that all subways should be destroyed and are not unduly surprised when they discover the subway in Paris. The tremendous shock of disillusion which the Red Army suffered on its conquering trip to Europe could be cured only by concentration camps and forced exile for a large part of the occupation troops. But the police formations which accompanied the army were prepared for the shock, not by different and more correct information, there is no secret training school in Soviet Russia, which gives out authentic facts about life abroad, <clears throat> but simply by a general training and supreme contempt for all facts and all reality. This mentality of the elite is no mere mass phenomenon, no mere consequence of social rootlessness, economic disaster, and political anarchy. It needs careful preparation and cultivation and forms a more important, though less easily recognizable part of the curriculum of the totalitarian leadership schools. The Nazi Ordensbergen for the SS troops and the Bolshevik training centers for common turn agents, then race doctrination or the techniques of civil war. Without the elite and its artificially induced ability to understand facts as facts, to distinguish between truth and falsehood, the movement could never move in the direction of realizing its fiction. The outstanding negative quality of the totalitarian elite is that it never stops to think about the world as it really is and never compares the lies with reality. Its most cherished virtue, correspondingly, is loyalty to the leader, who, like a talisman, assures them, ass sorry, assures the ultimate victory of lie and fiction over truth and reality. The topmost layer in the organization of totalitarian movements is the intimate circle around the leader, which can be a formal institution like the Bolshevik Politburo or a changing clique of men who do not necessarily hold office like the entourage of Hitler. To them, ideological cliches are mere devices to organize the masses, and they feel no compunction about changing them according to the needs of circumstances if only the organizing principle is kept intact. In this connection, the chief merit of Himmler's reorganization of the SS was that he found a very simple method for, quote, solving the problem of blood by action. That is, for selecting the members of the elite according to good blood and preparing them to carry on a racial struggle without mercy against everyone who could not trace his Aryan ancestry back to 1750 or was less than five feet, eight inches tall. I know that people who have reached a certain height must possess the desired blood 
to some, de some degree or did not have blue eyes and blonde hair. The importance of this racism in action was that the organization became independent of almost all concrete teachings of no matter what racial science, independent also of anti-Semitism insofar as it was a specific doctrine concerning the nature and role of the Jews, whose usefulness would have ended with their extermination. Race, racism was safe and independent of the scientificality of propaganda, propaganda once an elite had been selected by a race commission and placed under the authority of special marriage laws, while at the opposite end and under the jurisdiction of this racial elite, concentration camps existed for the sake of better demonstration of the laws of inheritance and race. On the strength of this living organization, the Nazis could dispense with dogmatism and offer friendship to Semitic peoples like the Arabs or enter into alliances with the very representatives of the yellow peril, the Japanese. The reality of a race society, the formation of an elite selected from an allegedly racial viewpoint would indeed have been a better safeguard for the doctrine of racism than the finest scientific or pseudo-scientific proof. The policymakers of Bolshevism show the same superiority to their own avowed dogmas. They are quite capable of interrupting every existing class struggle with a sudden alliance with capitalism without undermining the reliability of their cadres or committing treason against their belief in class struggle. The, the dichotomous principle of class struggle having become an organizational device, having as it were petrified into uncompromising hostility against the world, the whole world through, through the secret police cadres in Russia and the common turn agents abroad, Bolshevik policy has become remarkably free of prejudices. It is this freedom from the content of their own ideologies which characterizes the highest rank of the totalitarian hierarchy. These men consider everything and everybody in terms of organization. And this includes the leader <clears throat> who to them is neither an inspired talisman nor the one who is infallibly right, but the simple consequence of this organization. He is needed not as a person, but as a function. And as such, he is indispensable to the movement. In contrast, however, to other despotic forms of government where frequently a cliche rules and the despot plays only the representative role of a puppet ruler, totalitarian leaders are actually free to do whatever they please and can count on the loyalty of their entourage even if they choose to murder them. The more technical reason for this suicidal lo loyalty is that succession to the supreme often office is not regulated by any inheritance or other laws. A successful palace revolt would have a disastrous result for the movement as a whole as a military defeat. It is in the nature of the movement that once the leader has assumed his office, the whole organization is so absolutely identified with him that any admission of a mistake or removal from office would break the spell of infallibility which surrounds the office of the leader and spell doom to all those connected with the movement. It is not the truthfulness of the leader's words, but the infallibility of his actions, which is the basis for the structure. Without it and in the heat of a discussion, which presumes fallibility, the whole fictitious world of totalitarianism goes to pieces, helmed at once by the factuality of the real world, which only the movement steered in an infallibly right direction by the leader was able to ward off. However, the loyalty of those who believe neither in ideological cliches nor in the infallibility of the leader, leader also has deeper non-technical reasons. 
What binds these men together is a firm and sincere belief in human omnipotence. Their moral cynicism, their belief that everything is permitted rests on the solid conviction that everything is possible. It is true that these men, few in number, are not easily caught in their own specific lies and that they do not necessarily believe in racism or economics, in the conspiracy of the Jews or of Wall Street, <clears throat> yet they too are deceived, deceived by their impudent, conceited idea that everything can be done and their contemptuous conviction that everything that exists is merely a temporary temporary obstacle that superior organization will certainly destroy. Confident that power of organization can destroy power of substance as the violence of a well-organized gang might rob a rich man of ill-guarded wealth, they constantly underestimate the substantial power of stable communities and underestimate the driving force of a movement. Since moreover, they do not actually believe in the factual existence of a world conspiracy against them, but use it only as an organizational device. They fail to understand that their own conspiracy may eventually provoke the world into uniting against them. Yet, no matter how the delusion of human omnipotence through organization is ultimately defeated, within the movement, its practical consequence is that the entourage of the leader, in case of disagreement with him, will never be very sure of their own opinions, since they believe sincerely that their disagreements do not really matter, that even the maddest device has a fair chance of success if properly organized. The point of their loyalty is not that they believe the leader is infallible, but that they are convinced that everybody who commands the instruments of violence with the superior methods of totalitarian organization can become infallible. This delusion is greatly strengthened when totalitarian regimes hold the power to demonstrate the relativity of success and failure, and to show how a loss in substance can become a gain in organization. The fantastic mismanagement of industrial enterprise in Soviet Russia led to the atomization of the working class and the terrifying mistreatment of civilian prisoners in Eastern territories under Nazi occupation. <clears throat> Though it caused a deplorable loss of labor, thinking in terms of generations was not to be regretted. Moreover, the decision regarding success and failure under totalitarian circumstances is very largely a matter of organized and terrorized public opinion. In a totally fictitious world, failures need not be recorded, admitted, or remembered. Factuality itself depends for its continued existence upon the existence of the non-totalitarian world. Thank you, Heather. With that, we come to the end of chapter 11. And I'd like to invite you, if you'd like, to comment on either the section you just read or anything in chapter 11. And I'll uh, invite our other panelists back in. Thank you. I, I haven't read this in years, um, but uh, I did. I'm really struck by this notion of loyalty and um, how, you know, loyalty we I have such positive connotations with, I think, most of the time and um, that it relies on not thinking, which, of course, is, you know, always my takeaway with Arendt about um, making sure that you are always thinking about the world and thinking about um, what's happening. Um, and then connected to that also is just the, the infallibility of the leader, even though that they, um, I'm, I'm, I wonder if they're actually really dispense, indispensable um, to the organization or the movement, um, but the infallibility of 
the the organization of totalitarianism that it's not about like the leader but that it's about how things um exert power over others i don't know if that makes any sense <laughs> No, thank, uh, thank you. It, it um, brings back to mind some uh, things that Eric was talking about in the previous section as well. Uh, I invite the other uh, uh, panelists in, if you'd like, and I welcome Christian Falk, who's just joined us and will be reading next. Um, Thomas, I something occurred to me as we were reading this, and you've been uh, reading and teaching Dante lately, so uh, I, I want to get your opinion on this. But it strikes me that this third part has a comedic uh, um, structure in some way that we are, instead of approaching a paradise being driven by love, right? There is a kind of intensification of the ideology and of the movement to a totalitarian paradise, if you will, or an inversion of paradise. And I wonder what you think of that. Um, Arendt's, um, uh was very influenced by Dante. Um, and I'm wondering if you think you see any of that here. Uh, now I'm beginning to, uh, thanks to you. Uh, I hadn't previously, but the, certainly the, the, the moral cynicism in this and the uh, thought that all is, all is possible uh, and that that's a, uh, a fundam fundamental misunderstanding of the structure of the universe would fit in a, a Dantean perspective. Um, I, not that I've spent all that much time with Dante, but it does feel like one could, um, th that aspect of it, uh, and related also to what, what Eric was talking about before, the, the religious component the, and the promise of a, um, of a, um, an ultimate reward that is ultimately a perversion of, re of reality fits perfectly in a Dantean conception, I think. Thomas, I, it reminds me, and I'm sorry for putting you on the spot this way, but I, I know when you were the director of language and thinking at Bard, you, you organized one of the series around the idea that things can always be other than they are. Um, and I, I know that's something that you've thought about, and it's it's something that really has been kind of popping up as I've been listening to this conversation, because it strikes me that that's an essential phrase here, right? This idea that people have that things can always be other than they are, and how that's really different from Arendt's conception of possibility, which I think is, is, is rooted in Jasper's um, and, and Kant in a certain way, but this idea of possibility where you can't see the future, it's not instrumental, it's not utilitarian, it's not about trying to get from where you are to something better, always better, right, this idea that, oh, things can be better than they are, but this idea that things can always be other than they are it seems to me very Arendtian. I was just wondering if that's something you've thought about. Well, the, th the thought that comes to my mind, thanks for bringing that back, the precise question of that program was um, an interesting one, one to think about on this particular day. What needs to be the case for things to be otherwise? What needs to be the case for things to be otherwise? And it was a, a way of thinking about that problem. And I, I think that the, uh, there's a difference between imagining that things can always be otherwise, imagining that, imagining that anything is possible, and recognizing that there are constraints of reality something needs to be the case in order for things to be otherwise. And it, it, does, uh, it does seem to me that one of the things that one of the distinctions Arendt is making is between a fantastical notion that everything can always be otherwise uh, in, a, um, in a fiction, as opposed to a recognition of reality and the, what needs to be the case in order for things uh, to be otherwise. We have a minute uh, before okay. Christian, you're to begin. Does anyone want a last word? If just not, to say, yes, can please. I say one thing about please. that last comment about everything is possible? I always think about it in relation to the metaphor of making. So the phrase everything is possible in this more negative sense implies uh, I can make everything, I can transform everything. 
uh, because I'm not bounded in the way in which you were just talking about by the so-called re real world or the, the ways, uh, you know, common sense, because there is no more common sense, would dictate that we would have limitations. So, you know, it's this sort of manufacturing of everything that uh, I'm reminded of that in a, in a sense comes to, to the foreground in the section on the camps. We are right on time. If you're just joining us, this is the marathon reading of Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism. We are at page 389 and Christian Folk, I will put you in the center. Begin when you will. Okay. Hello and a warm welcome from Berlin. Chapter 12, <clears throat> Totalitarianism in Power. When a movement, international in organization, all comprehensive in its ideological scope and global in its political aspiration seizes power in one country, it obviously puts itself in a paradoxical situation. The socialist movement was spared this crisis, first, because the national question, and that meant the strategical problem involved in the revolution, had been curiously neglected by Marx and Engels. And secondly, because it faced governmental problems only after the First World War had divested the Second International of its authority over, um, over the national members, which everywhere had accepted the primacy of national sentiments over international solidarity as an unalterable fact. In other words, when the time came for the socialist movements to seize power in their respective countries, they had already been transformed into national parties. This transformation never occurred in the totalitarian, the Bolshevik and the Nazi movements. At the time it seized power, the danger to the, to the movement lay in the fact that on the one hand, it might become ossified by taking over the state machine and frozen into a form of absolute government. And that on the other hand, its freedom of movement might be limited by the borders of the territory in which it came to power. To a totalitarian movement, both dangers are equally deadly. A development toward absolutism would put an end to the movement's interior drive and a development towards nationalism would frustrate its exterior expansion without which the movement cannot survive. The form of government, the two movements developed or rather which almost automatically developed from their double claim to total domination and global rule is best characterized by Trotsky's slogan of permanent revolution, although Trotsky's theory was no more than a socialist forecast of a series of revolutions from the anti-feudal bourgeois to the uh, anti-bourgeois proletarian, which would spread from one country to the other. Only the term itself suggests, suggests permanency. With all its, its semi-anarchistic implications and is strictly speaking a misnomer. Yet even Lenin was more impressed by the term than by the theoretical content. In the Soviet Union, at any rate, revolutions in the form of general purges became a permanent institution of the Stalin regime after 1934. Here, as in other instances, Stalin concentrated his attacks on Trotsky's half-forgotten half slogan precisely because he had decided to use this technique. In Nazi Germany, a similar tendency toward permanent revolution was clearly discernible, though the Nazis did not have time to realize it to the same extent. Characteristically enough, their permanent revolution also started also started uh, with the liquidation of the party faction which had dared to proclaim openly the next stage of revolution. And precisely because the Führer and his uh, old guard knew that the real struggle had just begun. Here, instead of the Bolshevik concept of permanent revolution, we find the notion of a racial selection which can never stand still, thus requiring a constant radicalization of the standards by which the selection, i.e. the extermination of the unfit is carried out. 
The point is that both Hitler and Stalin held out promises of stability in order to hide their intention of creating a state of permanent instability. There could have been no better solution for the perplexities inherent in the coexistence of a government and a movement of both a totalitarian claim and limited power in a limited territory of ostensible membership in a, uh, in a committee of nations in which each respects the other's sovereignty and claim to world rule, then this formula striped off its original content. For the totalitarian ruler is confronted with a dual task, which at first appears contradictory to the point of absurdity. He must establish the fictitious world of the movement as a intangible working reality of everyday life, and he must, on the other hand, prevent this new world from developing a new stability. For a stabilization of its laws and institutions would surely liquidate the movement itself and with the hope for eventual world conquest. The totalitarian ruler must, at any price, prevent normalization from reaching the point where a new way of life could develop, one which might, after a time, lose its bastard qualities and take its place among the widely um, differing and profoundly contrasting ways of life of the nations of the earth. The moment the revolutionary institutions became a national way of life, that moment when Hitler's claim that Nazism is not an export commodity or Stalin's that socialism can be built in one country would be more than an attempt to fool the non-totalitarian world. Totalitarianism would lose its total quality and become subject to the law of the nations according to which each possesses a specific territory, people and historical tradition which relates it to other nations. Plurality, which ipso facto refutes every contention that any specific form of government is absolutely valid. Practically speaking, the paradox of totalitarianism in power <clears throat> is that the possession of all instruments of governmental power and violence in one country is not an unmixed blessing for a totalitarian government, for a totalitarian movement. It's disregard for facts, its strict adherence to the rules of a fictitious world becomes steadily more difficult to maintain, yet remains as essential as it was before. Power means a direct confrontation with reality, and totalitarianism in power is constantly concerned with overcoming this challenge. Propaganda and organization no longer suffice to assert that the impossible is possible, that the incredible is true, that an insane consistency rules the world. The chief psychological support of totalitarian fiction, the active resentment of the status quo, which the masses refuse to accept as the only possible world, is no longer there. Every bit of factual information that leaks through the iron curtain set up against the ever-threatening flood of reality from the other non-totalitarian side is a greater menace to totalitarian domination than counter-propaganda has been to totalitarian movements. The struggle for domination of the total population of the earth, the elimination of every competing non-totalitarian reality is inherent in the totalitarian regimes themselves. If they do not pursue global rule as their ultimate goal, they are only, they are only too likely to lose whatever power they have already seized. Even a single individual can be absolutely and reliably dominated under, uh, only under global totalitarian conditions. Scandency to power, therefore, means primarily the establishment of official and officially recognized headquarters or branches in the case of satellite countries for the movement and the acquisition of a kind of laboratory in which to carry out the experiment with or rather against reality, 
the experiment in organizing a popular, uh, in organizing a people for ultimate purposes, which disregard individuality as well as nationality under conditions which are admittedly not perfect, but are sufficient for important partial results. Totalitarianism in power uses the state administration for its long range goal of world conquest and for the direction of the branches of the movement. It establishes the secret police as the executors and guardians of its domestic experiment in constantly transforming reality into fiction. And it finally erects concentration camps as special laboratories to carry through its experiment in total domination. Section one, the so-called totalitarian state. History teaches that rise to power and responsibility affects deeply the nature of revolutionary parties. Experience and common sense were perfectly justified in expecting that totalitarianism in power would gradually lose its revolutionary momentum and utopian character that the everyday business of government and the possession of real power would moderate the, the pre-power claims of the movements and gradually destroy the fictitious world of their organizations. It seems, after all, to be in the very nature of things, personal or public, that extreme demands and goals are checked by objective conditions and reality taken as a whole is only to a very small extent determined by the, inclina by the inclination toward fiction of a mass society of atomized individuals. Thank you, Christian. And I will invite you to comment if you would like on that section as I welcome our other participants back to the room. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there's, um, there's a lot to say, I think. Um, You've I got mean, eight minutes, take your time. Yeah. <laughs> no, what I, what I find uh, particularly interesting is um, on the one hand that Arendt is, is dealing with this, with this transformation of a movement um, to, um, um, to a, a more established uh, power structure, right? I mean, and, and, and the challenges a movement faces uh, with regard to, to this transformation. This is one thing that, that strikes me as particularly interesting. <clears throat> and another one is um, maybe that there are a lot of topics um, um, the, the idea of atomized individuals, uh, mass society, uh, fiction, the, the difference between reality and, and fiction that, uh, that, um, that are taken up uh, in, 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 uh, by her uh, in, in, in later writings, like the, the human condition, um, and then also um, um, the, you know, the, this, 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 uh, this, the difference between um, um, factual truth and, uh, 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 and uh, I don't know, what is the, 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 the English word for Vernunftwahrheit? Uh, I mean, reasonable truth, I don't know. I mean, the, the, this Leibniz uh, 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 distinction. And, uh, uh, and a lot of these, these topics are already there. And this, is, uh, uh, this strikes me as, uh, uh, as, uh, as particularly uh, uh, interesting, I would say. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, welcome in, uh, John, Samantha, Kathleen, you're here as well. <laughs> Have I... Well, the laboratory concept of the camp as a laboratory is particularly frightening. Uh, and before she gets into the, uh, or the word, particularly frightening word before she gets into the section that uh, was just read about the so-called totalitarian state. And I was always, I remember when I'd have discussions with this with other people in a, in a seminar setting, a lot would turn around the idea of this, why is it so cold? You know, why is the state so cold a state? And uh, I think that's a very interesting thing to, to consider um, back to where we were before about everything is possible. If it's a state, not everything is possible because 
theoretically, anyhow, it's bounded by laws and uh, other other characteristics of what she calls objective reality or objective conditions. Also, the, the, uh, in this section and in the previous section, the vectors of instability in the regime, uh, it's fascinating where she locates them and how, um, how they interact and how th this, this sort of consistent race against the encroachment of reality as a, a threat to the very stability of the regime. I think the um, you know we didn't we didn't read this part today um, because it comes earlier on um, in the book, um, which I which I think it is important to understanding this um, idea of possibility that we've been talking about is her discussion of Hobbes and Hobbes's conception mm -hmm. of power that precedes the section on it, on imperialism. Um, you know, and she, she turns to Hobb as the primary political theorist of power who conceptualizes power after power, um, which is this drive toward continuous expansionism. Um, you know, Trump's, uh, tr <laughs> Trump's um, creation of the Space Force has been eerily reminiscent of Cecil Rhodes' desire to annex the stars if he could. <laughs> But it becomes the perfect, you know, kind of narrative model to illustrate what she's trying to get at by this um, destabilizing force that's inherent within totalitarian movements, precisely what you just said, Kathy, it's this drive toward more, 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 more power, power after power, um, that prevents the possibility of these movements from becoming stable political institutions that that would have the capacity to protect freedom or guarantee rights, even if they wanted to. And it's ultimately this procession, this drive toward the future, this, this um, you know, this, this, it's always the drive forward from thinking the logical deduction that drives us forward, the creation of reality to transform what is into something better. Um, power after power, expansion, expansion creates the boomerang effect, um, mm -hmm. which is the kind of, you know, one of, I think the important, um, you know, turns that we get in the second part um, that shows why totalitarianism is doomed to fail, right? Why these kinds of political models that are built off of exponential growth as their only driving principle um, tactically can't create something stable um, and that instability comes back. Um, there's that striking uh, passage, a striking sentence, power means a direct confrontation with reality and totalitarianism mm -hmm. in power is constantly concerned with overcoming this challenge, therefore um, doomed to a failure. Uh, we do have a couple of minutes. I see that Shmuel is with us. Uh, welcome. Um, we have a Thank couple you. of minutes left. Uh, Christian, would you like to uh, have another word on this? Yeah, I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I mean, the... Um... Um, the fact that uh, that the totalitarian uh, that neither a totalitarian movement uh, nor a totalitarian state is uh, uh, can be uh, uh, should be perceived as a monolithic block, but uh, full of of inner tensions and contradictions, from which um, the the drive for for permanent transformation. <laughs> Um, results from. I think this is a, 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 a so that so that, that this is kind of the nature or the essence of 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 of, of such a movement. I think this is uh, particularly striking because sometimes we have the the attempt to um, to 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 draw a, a coherent picture or to 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 have this uh, the the the. the, the this this criteria of, of of a of a of a of a homogeneous homogeneous uh, um, political movement, but this is exactly not the case when it comes to uh, uh, to totalitarian movements. They are paradoxical. And the the, uh, the inherent dynamism. This came up a, a bit earlier. We were talking about uh, the ways in which aren't even in the. Um, even in the style is conveying that sense of uh, the internal tensions and dynamism of the movement. We are uh, just about at time, a few seconds left. So I uh, see it's the darkness outside your window uh, there, <laughs> Christian. Uh, Shmuel, I'm not sure where you're um, joining us from. Uh, Israel. From Israel, uh, okay. What, and what time is it there? 
about uh, 8.40 eight forty yeah, at night. 8.40 yeah. at night. The evening, yeah. I so am it's putting, dark here too. I'm sorry, go ahead. So it's dark here too. It's dark. <laughs> well, we still have light in, um, in New York. Licht, mehr Licht. Uh, I'm going to spotlight you now. And uh, for those following along, uh, welcome if you're just joining us. This is the marathon reading of Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism. Shmuel Lederman, who is joining us from Israel, is uh, reading beginning at page 393. We have 20 minutes, so um, it's a generous time. Take your time. Begin whenever you wish. Thank you. Uh, many of the errors of the non-totalitarian world in its diplomatic dealings with totalitarian government, the most conspicuous ones being confidence in the Munich Pact with Hitler and the Yalta Agreement with Stalin, can clearly be traced to an experience and a common sense which suddenly proved to be lost, uh, its proved to have lost its grasp on reality. Contrary to all ex expectations, important concessions and greatly heightened international prestige did not help to reintegrate the totalitarian countries into the Committee of Nations or induce them to abandon their line complaint that the whole world had solidly lined up against them. And far from, pre pre from preventing this, diplomatic victories clearly precipitated the recourse to the instruments of violence and resulted in all instances in increased hostility against the powers that had cho shown themselves willing to compromise. These disappointments suffered by statements uh, statesmen and diplomats find their parallel in the earlier disillusionment of benevolent observers and sympathizers with the new revol revolutionary government. What they had looked for, what they had looked forward to, was the establishment of new institutions and the creation of a new code of law, which, no matter how revolutionary in content, would lead to a stabilization of conditions and thus check the momentum of the totalitarian movement at least in the countries where they had seized power. What happened instead was that terror increased both in Soviet Russia and Nazi Germany in inverse ratio, a ratio to the exist existence of the internal political opposition. So that it looks as though political opposition had not been the pretext of terror that liberal accusers of the regime were wont to assert, but the last imped impediment with uh, full fury. Even more disturbing was the handling of the, constitutional, of the constitutional question by the totalitarian regimes. In the early years of their power, the Nazis let loose an avalanche of laws and decrees, but they never bother, bothered to, ab to abolish officially the Weimar Constitution. They even left the civil services more or less intact, a fact which, in, which induced many native and foreign observers to hope for restraint of the party and for the rapid normalization of the new regime. But when with the issuance of the Nuremberg laws, this development had come to an end, it turned out that the Nazis themselves, themselves showed no concern whatsoever about their own leg legislation. Rather, there was, the, there was only the constant going ahead on the road toward ever new fields, so that finally, the purpose and scope of the secret state police, as well as of all other states or party institutions created by the Nazis, could in no, be, in no manner be covered by the laws and regulations issued for them. In practice, this permanent state of lawlessness found expression in the fact that a number of valid regulations were no longer made public. Theoretically, it corresponded to Hitler's dictum that total, the total state must not know any difference between law and ethics. Because, it, because if it assumed that the valid law is identical with the ethics common to all and springing springing from their consciousness, their conscious, uh, consciousness, uh, consciousness, sorry, then there is indeed no further necessity for public decrees. Uh, the Soviet Union, where the pre-revolutionary pre civil services had been exterminated in the revolution and the, regime, and the regime had paid scant attention to constitutional questions during the period of revolutionary change, Change even went to the trouble of issuing an entirely new and very elaborate constitution in 1936, a veil of liberal phrases and premises over the guillotine in the background. 
an event which was hailed in Russia and abroad at the conclusion of the revolutionary period. Yet the publication of the constitution turned out to be the beginning of gigantic super purge, which in nearly two years liquidated the existing administration and erased all traces of normal life and economic recovery, which had developed, developed in the four years after the liquidation of the Kulaks, of Kulaks and enforced collectivization of the rural population. From then on, the constitution of 1936 played exactly the same role the Weimar constitution played under the Nazi regime. It was completely disregarded, but, but never abolished. The only difference was that Stalin could afford one more absurdity, with the exception of Vyshinsky, all those who had drafted the never repudiated constitution were ex executed as traitors. What strikes the observer of the totalitarian state is certainly not its monolithic structure. On the contrary, all serious students of the subject agree at least on the coexistence or the conflict of a dual authority, the party and the state. Many, moreover, have stressed the peculiar shapelessness of the totalitarian government. Thomas Masaryk so early that the so-called Bolshevik system has never been anything but a complete absence of system. And, and it is perfectly true that uh, even an expert would be driven mad if he tried to unravel the relationship between party and state in the Third Reich. It has also been frequently observed that the relationship between the two sources of authority, between state and party, is one of ostensible and real authority so that the government machine is usually pictured as the powerless facade which hides and protects the, real power, protects the real power of the party. All levels of the administrative machine in the, in the Third Reich were subject to a curious duplication of offices. With a fantastic thoroughness, the Nazis made sure that every function of the state administration would be duplicated by some party organ. The Weimar division of Germany into states and provinces was duplicated by the Nazi division into Gaue, uh, whose, border, whose border lines, however, did not coincide, so that every given locality belonged, even ge geographically, to two altogether different, different administrative units. Nor were the duplication of functions abandoned when, after 1933, outstanding Nazis occupied the official ministries of the states. When Frick, for instance, became Minister of the Interior or uh, Gortner, Minister of Justice, uh, these old and trusted party members, once they had embarked upon official non-party careers, lost their power and became an uninfluential as other civil servants. Both, became, both came under the factual authority of Himmler, the writing chief of the police, who normally would have been subordinate to the Minister of the Interior. Better known abroad, has been the fate of the old German Foreign Affairs Office in the Wilhelmstrasse. The Nazis left its, uh, its personnel nearly untouched and, of course, never abolished it. Yet at the same time, they maintained the, the pre power Foreign Affairs Bureau of the party, headed by Rodenberg. And since this, uh, since this office had, had specialized in maintaining contact with fascist organizations in Eastern Europe and the Balkans, they set up another. Thank you. I am. I would like to invite you. That section had um, quite a few footnotes, so uh, we have a bit more time. Uh, and I'd like to invite you, Shmuel, if you'd like to comment on that or on uh, any aspect of the book, what you just read, or any aspect of the book. And I'll welcome our other panelists back. So I think what strikes me the most in in this part of the book is uh, how prescient it is. I mean, it, it basically. Um, uh, foreshadows many of the insights that uh, later historians, including contemporary historians of the Holocaust, of, the, of Nazi Germany, uh, it anticipated how they refer to the Nazi, Nazi regime today, I happen to come from genocide studies, not only for political theory. So, so many issues like the, uh, for example, the whole idea of, uh, of course, the duplication of the different, uh, or, or what is sometimes called the uh, totalitarian anarchy, or a polyarchy and so on. The, the idea that the, the totalitarian regime is based on different authorities uh, with, with, uh, whose powers uh, um, clash with each other. Uh, the, the authorities they have on, on specific localities, specific issues, topics, uh, they clash. And, and it's, it's interesting the way Arendt recognized that at the same time, it's extremely inefficient in terms of administration. 
and uh, and yet uh, so efficient in, term, in terms of creating the total turn dynamic. Uh, so efficient in creating both the idea that uh, uh, Hitler is the one who decides over everything eventually. Uh, and, and many uh, so-called functionalists who are assumed to follow Arndt in that sense, uh, they, they tended in the past to uh, um, <clears throat> underestimate Hitler's role in the Holocaust uh, and more generally in the totalitarian state. And, um, uh, and, and it's interesting the way that uh, it's actually uh, it, uh, increased its power enormously. And both when we focus on the question of the Holocaust, of the Jews, the, the very dynamic that created many problems for the Nazis in actually implementing the final solution is the same dynamic that radicalized them more and more towards the final solution. So, so I think, so, so for me at least, Arndt's, Arndt's description of this uh, totalitarian dynamic, uh, first of all, anticipates many of the insights that later historians said, and also um, uh, this, uh, this process of um, constant radicalization which I think, okay, with all the, all the differences, I mean, I think we can see something of the sort in, in, in the United States and other places uh, today, this kind of uh, organized chaos, organized in the chaos in the sense that everything is run so inefficient. And on the other hand, it creates this dynamic of constant, uh, co constant radicalization in the uh, means employed in the policies uh, that uh, the things that seemed unimaginable only two years ago or three years ago now seem almost to make sense uh, for many people. Uh, so this organized chaos that are identified that we see again and again in, in totalitarian regimes and also interesting regimes like the one we have seen created over the last four years in the United States. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, very, it's a very interesting analysis and dynamic. I'll follow up on a couple of things and then invite our other panelists in. Uh, one, sort of the, on this organized, the experience of organized chaos and the uh, instability, one, one hears often these days the appeal for a return to normalcy, which is something, which is a return to this, uh, some sense that it's not perpetually chaotic. And that does seem, uh, throughout the, the conversation today, we've been Looking at as you as you have been as well at parallels in in this book to the contemporary moment and also points of difference and that that I think is definitely uh, a parallel the the way in which the present regime in the United States seeks constantly to give a sense of uh, destabilization of chaos of unpredictability and that that is consistent with a, a strategy for maintaining. Uh, ma ma maintaining power. And in the section that was read before by uh, Christian Folk, the necessity of that, uh, of maintaining, it, 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 the idea that it can't return to a kind of normalcy because that would threaten the very logic of the regime is, uh, is fascinating. I had a question for you, um, if I may, on something you said before, and also the other panelists are welcome to weigh in. The efficiency of the dual systems, the fact that there are always, to, that there's this reduplication and there's always something, an aspect of the regime, an aspect of the administration in the party and an aspect of the administration in the state. It, I, I don't know that I understand fully why, the, the way in which that's efficient um, for the purposes of the, of the movement. It, seems like another explan explanation could be that it's just an artifact, an accidental artifact of the way things developed and it would have eventually been gotten rid of. But I think that the idea is, as you suggested, that it serves a purpose. And I'm wondering if you, if you have a further thought about that. Well, I think first of all, the, the kind of different authorities that are created within the state or between the party and the state and within each of these organs I think, first of all, I mean, in general terms, it allows Hitler to be the final decision maker on everything. So it creates a competition where everybody tries to, uh, the, the way uh, Ian Kershaw, Hitler's biography put it uh, in, in a famous uh, phrase, um, um, well, which I'm blanking out on right now, uh, to aim toward the fear. Okay, so, so everybody tries to guess what the fear actually wants. And you can't, you can't know that there is no one authority, or often there is no one authority 
to which he can turn or she can turn when she, well, usually he can turn when uh, he wants to know what exactly is the official policy. There is no official policy. There is Hitler's will, which you have to guess where it, where it leads. And then you, you try to make a policy suggestion. And soon you find out that um, often, not always, but often Hitler chooses the uh, policy suggestions that are the uh, most ex extreme ones. At the most extreme ones and the more most uh, ambitious and so on and then this creates a kind of radicalization which leaves Hitler at the head of the pyramid without having without making him uh, have to uh, issue specific orders or specific specific policies uh, and it also creates this kind of radicalization process that that Hitler's or leaders like Hitler uh, need in order to keep the regime going and to keep this uh, kind of movement going. So that gives at least one fun function in one, one way in which this uh, kind of dynamic or this kind of uh, status or situation is deficient as far as these goals are concerned. That but, is uh, my. Thank you. Yeah, that that does help, and and also creating. It, it, I was realizing as I was asking the question that it contributes to the instability, as well having these competing. Centers. I, I'd like to welcome uh, John, Samantha. Uh, you're here as well. Would you like to weigh in on this section or um, any this question or anything else in this section? And Jana, uh, I'll introduce you shortly, but you're welcome to join in the conversation as well. I kind of have a question that I want to pose that I was thinking about this morning, and I and I think it ties this conversation to the ongoing conversation about possibility. Um, and I'm not sure there's a good answer to it, but I can't, I guess there's part of me that can't help but wonder if there is a kind of desire for insta instability among the people. Um, you know, I think at least in the United States then, since the 1970s that, you know, we've had economic stagnation, we've had the increasing privatization of our public and political institutions. Americans actually don't move anymore. Um, you know, the fantasy of class mobility um, has, you know, I think pretty much shrunk out of sight, you know, in the widening wealth gap. And I'm just, you know, wonder, so there's absence of movement. And I'm wondering, you know, I, I guess there's part of me that wonders if in that absence of movement, there is a desire for instability, that there's a kind of almost perverse desire to shake things up. And if that's not in part what led to the election of Trump in 2016, by, uh, just uh, if I may ask, Samantha, do you mean a um, lack of movement uh, socially and economically? Yes. Mean, no, it's not geographically. Um, I mean socially and economically, although studies have also shown that Americans move less than they used to. Um, but I meant primarily socially, economically, and, and also the political parties, I think we could put in that um, framework as well, um, you know, have become so crystallized. Um, and we're, you know, we're seeing that shake up right now. Um, well, that's uh, well, the first thing that comes to my mind, as you mentioned, the reason why I asked for the clarification is because it's certainly deep in the American myth that it's a country on the move, that it's expansive, go west is, central to what has traditionally been um, one understanding of the American character and the degree to which that may, I'm just thinking aloud with what you've said, but the, the degree to which that defining characteristic might be failing to be realized, increasingly failing to be realized and create a kind of desire for, to shake things up as one might say. Chris, Chris I think. Oh, Go ahead. Uh, John, would you like a word in? Uh, well, I was going to say that um, the change uh, could be, on the one hand, progress, you know, making some progress from where we are now. And the people who uh, feel themselves to be disenfranchised, I'm thinking about uh, Enzenberger's uh, essay, The Radical Loser, is how it's translated in, in, in English, but it's... Uh, this idea of the way capitalist societies produce uh, a class of losers, what we might say the disenfranchised, those who feel themselves to be losers, not those who are labeled losers, 
but feels himself to be left out and lost. And um, um, they, instead of wanting progress, see progress as the mechanism that's brought them to the situation that they're in. But there is this desire to shake things up, to break everything apart and refashion some kind of new world. And that is in fact a desire for change, but it's more of a destructive kind of desire than a productive kind of desire. And so maybe not moving, but rather disassembling the assemblage that they feel trapped in. And these movements uh, seem on the surface ostensibly to offer that kind of a destructive uh, mechanism. When, when is that Enzensberger text written? Do you know? Uh, Roughly? 2006. Interesting. Well, we are at um, two o'clock here in New York, and I will welcome our next reader, Jana Mader, my friend and neighbor. We are on page, th for those just joining us, this is the U.S. Election Day marathon reading of Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism. We'll be going all the way to the end of the book, and we are currently at page 397. Jana, I am going to put you at the center of the universe, and you can begin when you will. Thank you. Oregon to compete with the office in the Wilhelmstraße, the so-called Ribbentrop-Büro, which handled foreign affairs in the West and survived the departure of its chief as ambassador to England, that is, his incorporation into the official apparatus of the Wilhelmstraße. Finally, in addition to these party institutions, the Foreign Office received another duplication in the form of an SS office, which was responsible for negotiations with all racially Germanic groups in Denmark, Norway, Belgium, and the Netherlands. These examples prove that for the Nazis, the duplication of offices was a matter of principle and not just an expedient for providing jobs for party members. The same division between a real and an ostensible government de developed from very different be beginnings in Soviet Russia. The ostensible government originally sprang from the All-Russian Soviet Congress, Congress, which during the Civil War lost its influence and power to the Bolshevik Party. This process started when the Red Army was made autonomous and the secret political police re-established as an organ of the party and not of the Soviet Congress. It was completed in 1923 during the first year of Stalin's general secretaryship. From then on, the Soviets became the shadow government in whose midst the cells from, formed by Bolshevik party members functioned the re representatives of real power who were appointed and responsible to the Central Committee in Moscow. The crucial point in the later development was not the conquest of the Soviets by the party, but the fact that although it would have presented no difficulties, the Bolsheviks did not abolish the Soviets and use them as the decorative outward symbol of their authority. The coexistence of an ostensible and a real government, therefore, was partly the outcome of the revolution itself and preceded Stalin's totalitarian dictatorship. Yet while the Nazis simply retained the existing administration and deprived it of all power, Stalin had to revive his shadow government, which in the early 30s had lost all its functions and was half forgotten in Russia. He introduced the Soviet constitution as the symbol of the existence as well as the powerlessness of the Soviets. None of its paragraphs ever had the slightest practical significance for life and jurisdiction in Russia. The ostensible Russian government, utterly lacking the glamour of tradition so necessary for a facade, apparently needed the sacred halo of written law. The totalitarian defiance of law and legality, which in spite of the greatest changes, still remained the expression of a permanently desired order, found in a written Soviet constitution, as in the never repudiated Weimar constitution, a permanent background for its own lawlessness, the permanent challenge to the non-totalitarian world and its standards whose helplessness and impotence could be demonstrated daily. 
Duplication of offices and division of authority, the coexistence of real and ostensible power are sufficient to create confusion, but not to explain the shapelessness of the whole structure. One should not forget that only a building can have a structure, but that a movement, if the word is to be taken as seriously and literally as the Nazis meant it, can have only a direction and that any form of legal or governmental structure can be only a handicap to a movement which is being propelled with increasing speed in a certain direction. Even in the pre-power stage, the totalitarian movements represented those masses that were no longer willing to live in any kind of structure, regardless of its nature. Masses that had started to move in order to flood the legal and geographical borders securely determined by the government. Therefore, judged by our conceptions of government and state structure, these movements, so long as they find themselves physically still limited to a specific territory, necessarily must try to destroy all structure, and for this willful destruction, a mere duplication of all offices into party and state institutions would not be sufficient. Since duplication involves a relationship between the facade and the state and the inner core of the party, it too would eventually result in some kind of structure. The relationship between party and state would automatically end in a legal regulation which restricts and stabilizes their respective authority. As a matter of fact, duplication of offices, seemingly the result of the party state problem in all one party dictatorships is only the most conspicuous sign of a more complicated phenomenon that is better defined as multiplication of offices than duplication. The Nazis were not content to establish Gaue in addition to old provinces, but also introduced a great many other geographical divisions in accordance with the different party organizations. The territory, territorial units of the SA were neither coextensive with the Gaue nor with the provinces. They differed, moreover, from those of the SS and none of them corresponded to the zones dividing the Hitler youth. To this geographical confusion must be added the fact that the original relationship between real and ostensible power repeated itself throughout albeit an ever-changing way. The inhabitant of Hitler's Third Reich lived not only under the simultaneous and often conflicting authorities of competing powers, such as the civil services, the party, the SA, and the SS. He could never be sure and was never explicitly told whose authority he was supposed to place above all other others. He had to develop a kind of sixth sense to know at a given moment whom to obey and whom to disregard. Those, on the other hand, who had to execute the orders which the leadership in the interest of the movement regarded as genuinely necessary in contradistinction to governmental measures, such orders were, of course, entrusted only to the party's elite formations and not much better off. Mostly, such orders were intentionally vague and given in the expectation that the recipient would recognize the intent of the order giver and act accordingly, for the elite formations were by no means merely obligated to obey the order of the Führer. This was mandatory for all existing, existing organizations anyway, but to execute the will of the leadership. And as can be gathered from the lengthy proceedings concerning excesses before the party courts, this was by no means one and the same thing. The only difference was that the elite formations, thanks to their special indoctrination for such purposes, had been trained to understand that certain hints meant more than their mere verbal contents. Technically speaking, the movement within the apparatus of totalitarian domination derives its mobility from the fact that the leadership constantly shifts the actual center of power, often to other organizations, but without dissolving or even publicly exposing the groups that have thus been deprived of their power. In the early period of the Nazi regime, immediately after the Reichstag fire, the SA was the real authority in the party, the ostensible one. 
The power then shifted from the SA to the SS and finally from the SS to the security service. The point is that none of the organs of power was ever deprived of its right to pretend that it embodied the will of the leader. But not only was the will of the leader so unstable that compared with the whims of oriental despots are a shining example of steadfastness. The consistent and ever-changing division between real secret authority and ostensible open representation made the actual seat of power a mystery by definition. And this to such an extent that the members of the ruling clique themselves could never be absolutely sure of their own position in the secret power hierarchy. Alfred Rosenberg, for instance, despite his long career in the party and his impressive accumulation of ostensible power in offices in the party hierarchy, still talked about the creation of a series of Eastern European states. Thank you, Jana. My pleasure, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we're delighted to have you here. We have a bit of time. There were uh, long footnotes in that section, so the actual text was sort of reduced. Uh, so we have a bit of time before the next reader, who is me, actually. So uh, as we have been doing all day, I'll invite you, if you'd like, to comment on this section or on uh, any of the other sections of this book, and I will invite our other panelists back into the room. Um. I thought it was interesting when she was talking about the division of power and how, um, you know, she is talking about it, that it was not clearly defined. And uh, I'm wondering if that's something that we see in the current government as well, um, where things have been a little fuzzy. Uh, and. Um, I was also thinking of the current um, developments with the Supreme Court nomination, maybe, and um, the power of the Supreme Court in the United States. Maybe, yeah, we can talk a little bit more about that. I think that was the core idea in this part, the division of power. Thomas, um, I, I was struck by the metaphor uh, that she's employing here about the mobilization of power within an apparatus and that the center of that power changes. The contrast she gives on, on page 398 is with the building and the structures. And that put me in mind of the human condition and the architectural metaphors that are used there. And there's sort of a contrast here between um, aren't trying to offer um, a political ontology, if you will, in the human condition, where she talks about the necessity of structures and institutions as a kind of preservation or the creation of a space for action, for real political action and speech, as opposed to a totalitarian system that lacks precisely that kind of architectural structure and is a constant movement. Um, and I, I was struck by that comparison. I wonder if, if anyone has any insights about that. I, I would say something, but Sam, do you want to come in on this? No, please go ahead. Uh, I'll, uh, well, I'd, I'd, that, I'd just say that's extremely interesting, uh, John. I, I was struck by it as well. And the, the distinction between, um, between a, a, a the, the idea that the movement only has directionality yeah. and that that's uh, fundamentally opposed to structure. But I hadn't made the leap that you did to the, the idea of not only that it, not only that the movement and particularly totalitarian movement rejects the structuring, rejects the building, but also the positive argument for why structure is necessary and why the building is necessary for a healthy political environment uh, in which things can, in which one can dwell, in which things can appear, in which uh, that definitely um, is resonant. And it reminds me of what Christian Falk said before about how much is anticipated, how much of her later thinking is anticipated in aspects of this, uh, of this book. And it makes one wonder whether it was all there before like it was all there at the beginning and just kind of all of the thought was there and it unfolded. Um, or if she's picking up on things in the subsequent work 
that she was beginning to sense here? Yeah, that, um, that notion of structure too uh, reminds me of her reading of Tocqueville too, and the way she saw these sort of local civic uh, organizations as necessary to democracy. And that when you have the erosions of those local institutions like that, you'll inevitably have the erosion of these larger institutions. But I think she also gives a warning that institutions aren't enough. They require the activity of people. So in other words, you can't just have large uh, political and social and religious institutions and think that you'll preserve yourself from uh, fascism or some kind of uh, rabid populism. Um, but you need these local organizations. Um, and if there's anything that we could say about today's election where the turnout, uh, at least in my state, uh, it was already 108% of our, uh, in Texas, uh, in early voting. So that kind of local action, um, I think is, bodes well <laughs> for resisting uh, these kind of future uh, dystopian events. There's an interesting question. I want to um, want also to return to Jana's point about uh, the contemporary relevance of uh, ambiguity of power, but bringing Tocqueville up here makes me wonder about the distinction because for Tocqueville, of course, also the distribution of power is important, that there be distributed, distributed uh, centers of power for a healthy democratic society. And what Arendt is talking about is the distribution of uh, uh, conflicting uh, centers of power uh, that are um, that permit a totalitarian domination. And so the ways in which those are different, and it has, I mean, at least in this section, seems to have to do specifically with um, genuinely competing um, centers of power in Tocqueville versus the, the sort of illusion of centers of power under the, the uh, ultimate authority of the leader in the, total, in the totalitarian state. Um, and then to go back to what Jana was saying, that uh, Jana, I think what you had in mind also occurred to me immediately, the unclarity and when there, when there were those um, um, protest movements in, uh, over the summer in DC and suddenly there were um, there were authorities on the street whose authority was ambiguous. Who did they belong to when they had uniforms that weren't identifiable? And the sense that it was unclear who exactly, what the chain of command is and what the structure of authority is, was, um, it seems like part of what Arndt is talking about here and was certainly on my mind there. Yeah, absolutely, exactly. She talks, I think also, she, she uh, calls it shapelessness and, uh, from, yeah, please. Yeah. John, were you just coming in? Oh, no, sorry. Oh. Um, yeah, yeah, and just uh, as a follow up on what uh, John said before, I mean, there is also the issue, I mean, uh, strongly connected with that is the issue of centralization, right? I mean, once you have a, a central institution, even, even if strong institutions, like many of the institutions are in the United States, it's easier to dismantle them. It's easier to destabilize them uh, in contrast to uh, when you have a, a, a diffuse structure of institutions, uh, multiple institutions on the local level. It's harder to, uh, to dismantle them, to destabilize them, to uh, rob them of their power. Uh, and we see, I think this is something we see. And I think those concerns about centralization versus uh, decentralization were, were there for Arndt so to begin with, not only in the context of uh, our analysis of totalitarianism, but also our analysis of uh, uh, post, uh, post-war post Europe and, and Palestine. And, uh, and I think this is something we also see today in the United States. Uh, those were strong institutions that Trump manages to dismantle many of them and destabilize many of them and, and make them more and more shapeless at, uh, every day. Uh, and shows the, um, um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, the importance, as you said, the importance of uh, local institutions, 
about its actual power, its actual significance, and not just symbolic ones. I think, I think this goes directly to the question of responsibility too that we were discussing earlier. Political institutions are not enough to ensure freedom. Um, Arendt has a dynamic understanding of the relationship between um, citizen power and the power of political institutions. Um, and I, you know, I think one of her great contributions in the human condition is also um, the way that she talks about power in relationship to political action. She's really, and I, I think maybe this is what Yana was talking about that Thomas was, was trying to put the spotlight on is that, you know, uh, you know, a, a social movement like the Black Lives Matter movement we saw this summer, I think would be a good example of the kind of political power being generated that Arendt's talking about. For her, power is always constitutive um, and it's necessary. We can't just accept the authority of our political institutions. We have to actively engage them and participate in our democracy. We can't rely upon them to act in our best interests because history has taught us that they fail horribly. Um, and that they'll often default to force instead of power. Yana, did you get did you get cut off before? Can I throw it back to you to finish this up? No, okay. Um, good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Maybe I had a thought, but um, on shapelessness, I think, yeah. But yeah, I agree with what you just said. Yeah. Okay, well, I um, am up now, we are at, Hi. 20. So I will begin reading. And uh, John, just so you know, when I finish reading, I will um, hand the hosting over to you. And oh, no, that's not that's not correct. I continue for another 20 minutes. So I'm on. Don't worry. I'm going to put the spotlight on myself now. And we are reading from Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism. We're on page 401. As a security wall against Moscow at a time when those invested with real power had already decided that no state structure would succeed the defeat of the Soviet Union and that the population of the Eastern occupied territories had become definitely stateless and could therefore be exterminated. In other words, since knowledge of whom to obey and a comparatively permanent settlement of hierarchy would introduce an element of stability which is essentially absent from totalitarian rule, the Nazis constantly disavowed real authority whenever it had come into the open and created new instances of government compared with which the former became a shadow government, a game which obviously could go indefinitely. One of the most important technical differences between the Soviet and the national socialist system is that Stalin, whenever he shifted the power emphasis within his own movement from one apparatus to another, had the tendency to liquidate the apparatus together with its staff. While Hitler, in spite of his contemptuous comments on people who are, quote, unable to leap across their own shadows, unquote, was perfectly willing to continue using these shadows, even though in another function. The multiplication of offices was extremely useful for the constant shifting of power. The longer, moreover, a, a totalitarian regime stays in power, the greater becomes the number of offices and the possibility of jobs exclusively dependent upon the movement, since no office is abolished when its authority is liquidated. The Nazi regime started this multiplication with an initial coordination of all existing associations, societies, and institutions. The interesting thing in this nationwide manipulation was the coordination, was that coordination did not signify incorporation into the already existing respective party organizations. The result was that up to the end of the regime, there were not one but two national socialist student organizations. 
two Nazi women's organizations, two Nazi organizations for university professors, lawyers, physis physicians, and so forth. It was by no means sure, however, that in all cases, the original party organization would be more powerful than its coordinated counterpart. Nor could anybody predict with any assurance which party organ would rise in the ranks of the internal party hierarchy. A classic instance of this planned shapelessness occurred in the organization of scientific anti-Semitism. In 1933, an Institute for Study of the Jewish Question, Institut zur Erforschung der Judenfrage, was founded in Munich, which since the Jewish question presumably had determined the whole of German history, quickly enlarged into a research institute for modern German history. Headed by the well-known historian Walter Frank, it transformed the traditional universities into seats of ostensible learning or facades. In 1940, another institute for the study of the Jewish question was founded in Frankfurt, headed by Alfred Rosenberg, whose standing as a party member was considerably higher. The Munich Institute consequently was relegated to a shadowy existence. The Frankfurt, not the Munich institution, was supposed to receive the treasures from looted European Jewish collections and become the seat of a comprehensive library on Jude Judaism. Yet when these collections actually arrived in Germany a few years later, their most precious parts went not to Frankfurt, but to Berlin, where they were, were received by Himmler's special Gestapo department for the liquidation not merely the study of the Jewish question, which was headed by Eichmann. None of the older institutions was ever abolished. So that in 1944, the situation was this. Be behind the facade of the university's history departments stood threateningly the more real power of the Munich Institute behind which Rose Rosenberg's Institute in Frankfurt, and only behind these three facades, hidden and protected by them, lay the real center of authority, the, Reich, the Reichssicherheits Hauptamt, a special division of the Gestapo. The facade of Soviet government, despite its written constitution, is even less impressive erected even more exclusively for foreign observation than the state administration which the Nazis inherited and retained from the Weimar Republic. Lacking the Nazis' original accumulation of offices in the period of coordination, the Soviet, regimes, the Soviet regime relies even more on constant creation of new offices to put the former centers of power in the shadow. The gigantic increase of the bureaucratic apparatus inherent in this method is checked by repeated liquidation through purges. Nevertheless, in Russia too, we can distinguish at least three strictly separate organizations, the Soviet or state apparatus, the party apparatus, and the NKVD apparatus each of which has its own independent department of economy, a political department, a ministry of education and culture, a military department, etc. In Russia, the ostensible power of the party bureaucracy is against the real power of the secret police, as against the real power of the secret police, corresponds to the original duplication of party and state as known in Nazi Germany. And the multiplication becomes evident only in the secret police itself, with its extremely complicated, widely ramified network of agents in which one department is always assigned to supervising and spying on another. Every enterprise in the Soviet Union has its special department of secret police, 
which spies on party members and ordinary personnel alike. Coexistent with this department is another police division of the party itself, which again watches everybody, including the agents of the NKVD, and whose members are not known to the rival body. Added to these two espionage, espionage org organizations must be the unions in the factories, which must see to it that the workers fulfill their prescribed quotas. Far from important, far more important than these apparatuses, however, is the special department of the NKVD, which represents, quote, an NKVD within the NKVD, unquote, i.e. a secret police within the secret police. All reports of these competing police agencies ultimately end up in the Moscow Central Committee and the Politburo. Here it is decided which of the reports is decisive and which of the police division, divisions shall be entitled to carry out the respective police measures. Neither the average inhabitant of the country nor any one of the police departments knows, of course, what decisions will be made. Today, it may be the special division of the NKVD. Tomorrow, the party's network of agents. The day after, it may be the local committees or one of the regional bodies. Among all these departments, there exists no legally rooted hierarchy of power or authority. The only certainty is that eventually, one of them will be chosen to embody, quote, the will of the leadership. The only rule of which everybody in a totalitarian state may be sure is that the more visible government agencies are, the less power they carry. And the less is known of the existence of an institution, the more powerful it will ultimately turn out to be. According to this rule, the Soviets, recognized by a written constitution as the highest authority of the state, have less power than the Bolshevik party. The Bolshevik party, which recruits its members openly and is recognized as the ruling class, has less power than the secret police. Real power begins where secrecy and re real power begins where secrecy begins. In this respect, the Nazi and the Bolshevik states were very much alike. Their differences lay chiefly in the monopolization and centralization of secret police services in Himmler on one hand, and the maze of apparently unrelated and unconnected police activities in Russia on the other. If we consider the totalitarian state solely as an instrument of power and leave aside questions of administrative efficiency, industrial capacity, and economic productivity, then its shapelessness turns out to be an ideally suited instrument for the realization of the so-called leader principle. A continuous competition between offices whose functions not only overlap, but which are charged with identical tasks gives opposition or sabotage almost no chance to become effective. A swift change of emphasis which relegates one office to the shadow and elevates another to authority can solve all problems without anybody's becoming aware of the change or of the fact that opposition had existed. The additional advantage of the system being that the opposing office is likely never to learn of its defeat since it is either not established at all, as in the case of the Nazi regime, or it is liquidated much later and without any apparent connection with the specific matter. This can be done all the more easily since nobody, except those few initiated, knows the exact relationship between the authorities. Only once in a while does the non-totalitarian world catch a glimpse of these conditions, as when a high official abroad confesses that an obscure clerk in the embassy had been his immediate superior. 
In retrospect, it is often possible to determine why such a sudden loss of power occurred, or rather, that it occurred at all. For instance, it is not hard to understand today why at the outbreak of war, people like Alfred Rosenberg or Hans Frank were removed to state positions and thus eliminated from the real center of power, namely the Führer's inner circle. The important thing is that they not only did not know the, reason, the reasons for these moves, but presumably did not even suspect that such apparently exalted positions as governor general of Poland or Reich's minister for all Eastern territories did not signify the climax, but the end of their national socialist careers. The leader principle does not establish a hierarchy in the totalitarian state any more than it does in the totalitarian movement. Authority is not filtered down from the top through all intervening layers to the bottom of the body politic as it is in the case, as is the case in authoritarian regimes. The factual reason is that there is no hierarchy without authority and that in spite of the numerous misunderstandings concerning the so-called authoritarian personality, the principle of authority is in all important respects diametrically opposed to that of totalitarian domination. Quite apart from its origin, I will now welcome our panelists back. I believe you are all here now. John See, McCree, I'm wondering if you have a... Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say who's, who's in the room. Um, John McCready, Samantha Hill, Jana Mader, and Shmuel Lederman, and Eric Ward might be with us. Uh, John, please go ahead, but you seem to have frozen. Uh, Sam, John was about to ask you something. Do you want to anticipate what he was going to ask? <laughs> I'm not. I'm. I'm not sure what John. I'm not sure what John um, was was going to ask me there. I think that, you know, as I was listening to you read this, Thomas, um, the thing that really just struck me listening to this all day now, um, you know, and you read it wonderfully. And I think we get. I think we get in the section a sense of her humor actually um you know she's talking about um the the leader right the leader principle the authoritarian personality um and she is doing it um in a very different way than eric Fromm does than adorno does than um anybody else does at this time and i was just wondering what how if you know kind of what you what stood out to you as you were reading these passages aloud because i was really struck by the irony um, that she was using as a rhetorical advice device to kind of reveal the absurdity of this leader principle. Yeah, that um, I hear what you're saying, and I sense that too. It's it's easy, I think, to lose to not hear that in in Arendt to hear her as um, as kind of I don't know what the right word would be, but humorless. <laughs> doesn't exactly capture it, but there's, I think that there, um, it's possible to read that way. And I think you're right to notice it here. It's, it's almost a, 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 um, a mocking. Uh, there's a, a kind of undercutting mockery, which is light handed, but very effective, I think. And, uh, and I, I do think it comes across in this section. Um, what was also, uh, and also the, the way in which it, it relates to, I forget what the, the, the relationship between gullibility and cynicism uh, that mm -hmm. she talked about earlier in the section we read earlier. We, we didn't actually get to discuss that, but uh, there's a, a way in which the humor indicates where you are in that um, continuum. So she, she, she's saying that, there, that um, those in a totalitarian regime are marked out specifically by um, a blend of th those who are to, to some degree in power, either the, the fellow travelers or the inner circle, 
by the mix, the, the curious mix of gullibility and cynicism. And the more gullible you are, the further you are from the center of power, the more you are the subject of the joke. The joke is on you. Whereas the closer you are to the center of power, the more cynical you are, the more you realize it's a joke. And, and I think by um, conveying that sense, that, that very light-handed sense of irony or sarcasm, it underscores that aspect of it. Yeah. Jana Shmu, would you like to jump in? Um, actually, we're just, I'm noticing, uh, excuse me one moment, we are at the time that Jason Stanley is uh, meant to be joining us. And I see that he is not in the room. So if, and um, John McCready has disappeared. Samantha, can you- I'm, I'm on contact, it. Jason. Um, and we'll vamp for, I think we have about a two minute rule, uh, which we might extend a little bit. Jana Schmuel, would you like to jump in with something? <clears throat> Jana? One sentence that stood out to me was real power begins where secrecy begins. I thought that was uh, uh, really interesting um, and maybe something that connects what we, uh, to what we said earlier about, um, you know, now I'm using it again, the word shapelessness, but the, the greater the power, the less you actually know what's going on. And I think that's something the current government is doing well. Um, policy, you know, uh, as an example, and, or it started actually with uh, not really knowing what the government actually will do in those four years. There was not really a clear plan. So that made me think of that, how that can be very effective, not really knowing. Um, I would actually say uh, that this was um, also occurred to me as I was reading that section. And for those who jo joined us just recently, throughout the day, we've been talking about um, ways in which aspects of this book have resonance or relevance to the contemporary moment and ways in which they don't, points of similarity and difference, and they've come up throughout the discussion. One point of similarity in, in this section is, I was thinking about the way in which the response to the coronavirus was organized by the contemporary administration. And it, it was hard to see who was in charge. It was hard to know. And, and there was, it, in fact, it seemed, I don't, you know, I didn't follow this very closely, but there was a shadow, there was the formal organization that was in charge or the, the formal committee that was in charge and then, or task force. And then there was this sort of shadow task force. And even, on, even in the formal um, task force, it, there, it seemed like it was always shifting and it was unclear who was really in charge. And you constantly had the sense that there was behind it, this shadow task force or the shadow um, committee that was making the decisions it, quite similar to what Arendt is describing here. That's a perfect example. Want to, want to say something? And I, oh. oh, go ahead, Sam. Yes. No, I was just going to say I, th I think that's a beautiful description, actually, of the way that she's talking about the evils of bureaucracy um, and the way that bureaucracy um, within totalitarian regimes becomes the kind of structure. Um, so, um, you know, we're thinking about this question of shapelessness um, and power after power, um, but bureaucracy is, um, you know, is, is a very different conception of the organization of power um, that doesn't, uh, you know, rely upon, um, you know, or it creates a system where there's nobody clearly to blame, I think is, is one of our central points. We are now past the two minute rule. So Jason Stanley uh, has not arrived, has not appeared. And uh, unless he does, by the time I finish this sentence, uh, he will not be reading with us today. I can continue unless if there's uh, someone in the room, including John McCready, who's just joined us again. Uh, if there's someone, John, we've um, noticed the absence of our next reader who is Jason Stanley. Uh, and so we're about to draw straws to determine who reads the next section. Um, I will um, volunteer if no one else would like to, but if uh, someone has a desire, please speak now. All right, I guess it's me. John, is a t I take it you don't want to read right now. 
Oh, you're muted. I, I have not Go for it, Thomas. permitted you to, okay, you're unmuted now, John. Okay, uh, sorry, I was just emailing Jason. Um, well, how about this? I, I propose that, um, John, I make you the host now. Okay. Because you will be the next host. Okay. I, and for those watching us, and forgive us for showing the plumbing a bit. You are now the host, John. And if you want, I can read this or start reading this. You can watch to see if um, Jason arrives and I'll be happy to turn it over to him if he wants to pick up at uh, any page. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so whenever I'm spotlighted, you can tell me and I'll begin on page uh, 405. Okay. In Roman history, authority, no matter in what form, always is meant to restrict or limit freedom, but never to abolish it. Totalitarian domination, however, aims at abolishing freedom, even at eliminating human spontaneity in general, and by no means at a restriction of freedom, no matter how tyrannical. Technically, this absence of any authority or hierarchy in the totalitarian system is shown by the fact that between the supreme power, the Führer, and the ruled, there are no reliable intervening levels, each of which would receive its due share of authority and obedience. The will of the Führer can be embodied everywhere and at all times. And he himself is not tied to any hierarchy, not even the one he might have established himself. Therefore, it is not accurate to say that the movement after its seizure of power founds a multiplicity of principalities in whose realm each little leader is free to do as he pleases and to imitate the big leader at the top. The Nazi claim that, quote, the party is the order of Führers was an ordinary lie unquote, was an ordinary lie. Just as the infinite multiplication of offices and confusion of authority leads to a state of affairs in which every citizen feels himself directly confronted with the will of the leader, who arbitrarily chooses the executing organ of his decisions, so the one and a half million Führers throughout the Third Reich knew very well that their authority derived directly from Hitler, without the intervening levels of a functioning hierarchy. The direct dependence was real and the intervening hierarchy, certainly of social importance, was an, was an ostensible spurious imitation of an authoritarian state. The leader's absolute monopoly of power and authority is most conspicuous in the relationship between him and his chief of police who in a totalitarian country occupies the most powerful public position. Yet despite the enormous material and organizational power at his disposal as the head of a veritable police army and of the elite form formations, the chief of police apparently is in no position ever to seize power and himself become the ruler of the country. Thus prior to Hitler's fall, Himmler never dreamed of touching Hitler's claim to leadership and was never proposed as Hitler's successor. Even more interesting in this context is Beria's ill-fated attempt at seizing power after Stalin's death. Although Stalin had never permitted any of his police chiefs to enjoy a position, of com a position comparable to that of Himmler during the last years of Nazi rule, Beria, too, disposed of enough troops to challenge the rule of the party after Stalin's death, simply by occupying the whole of Moscow and all accesses to the Kremlin. Nobody except the Red Army might have disrupted his claim to power, and this would have led to a bloody civil war in whose out a bloody civil war whose outcome would by no means have been assured. The point is that Beria voluntarily abandoned all his positions only a few days later, even though he must have known that he would forfeit his life 
because for a matter of days, he had dared to play off the power of the police against the power of the party. This lack of absolute power, of course, does not prevent the chief of the police from organizing his enormous apparatus in accordance with totalitarian power principles. Thus, it is most remarkable to see how Himmler, after his appointment, began the reorganization of the German police by introducing into the hitherto centralized apparatus of the secret police, the multiplication of offices, i.e. he apparently did what all experts of power who preceded the totalitarian regimes would have feared as decentralization leading to a diminution of power. To the service of the Gestapo, Himmler first added the security service, originally a division of the SS and founded as an inner party police body. While the main offices of the Gestapo and the security service were eventually, cent eventually centralized in Berlin, the regional branches of these two huge secret services retained their separate identities and each reported directly to Himmler's own office in Berlin. In the course of the war, Himmler added two more intelligence services, one, coordin one consisted of so-called inspectors who were supposed to control and coordinate the, the security service with the police and who were subject to the jurisdiction of the SS. The second was specifically military intelligence bureau, was a specifically military intelligence bureau, which acted independently of the Reich's military forces and finally succeeded in absorbing the army's own military intelligence. The complete absence of successful or unsuccessful palace revolutions is one of the most remarkable characteristics of totalitarian dictatorships. With one exception, no dissatisfied Nazis took part in the military conspiracy against Hitler of July, 1944. On the surface, the leader principle seems to invite bloody changes of personal power without a change of regime. This is but one of many indications that the totalitarian form of government has very little to do with lust for power or even the desire for a power generating machine. With the game of power for power's sake, which had been characteristic of the last stages of imperialist rule. Technically speaking, however, it is one of the most important indications that totalitarian government, all appearances notwithstanding, is not ruled by a clique or a gang. The evidence of Hitler's, as well as Stalin's dictatorship, points clearly to the fact that isolation of atomized individuals provides not only the mass basis for totalitarian rule, but is carried through to the very top of the whole structure. Stalin has shot almost everybody who, would, who could claim to belong to the ruling clique and has removed and has moved the members of the Politburo back and forth whenever a clique was on the point of consolidating itself. Hitler destroyed the cliques or cliques of Nazi Germany with less drastic means. The only bloody purge having been directed against the Rome clique, which indeed was firmly kept together through the homosexuality of its leading members. He prevented their formation by constant shifts in power and authority and frequent changes of intimates in his immediate surroundings so that all former solidarity between those who had come into power with him quickly evaporated. It seems obvious, moreover, that the monstrous unfaithfulness, which is reported in almost identical terms as the outstanding trait in both Hitler's and Stalin's characters, did not allow them to preside over anything so lasting and durable as a clique. However that may be, the point is that there exists no interrelationship between those holding office. They are not bound together by equal status in a political hierarchy or the relationship between superiors and inferiors or even the uncertain loyalty of gangsters. 
In Soviet Russia, everybody knows that the top manager of a big industrial concern can as well as the Minister of Foreign Affairs be demoted any day to the lowest social and political status and that a complete unknown may step into his place. The, the gangster complicity, on the other hand, which played some role in the early stages of the Nazi dictatorship, loses all cohesive force for totalitarianism uses its power precisely to spread, to spread this complicity through the population until it has organized the guilt of the whole people under its domination. The absence of a ruling clique has made the question of a successor to the totalitarian dictator especially baffling and troublesome. It is true that the issue has plagued all usurpers and it is quite characteristic that none of the totalitarian dictators ever tried the old method of establishing a dynasty and appointing their sons. Against Hitler's numerous and therefore self-defeating appointments stands Stalin's method, which made the succession one of the most dangerous honors in the Soviet Union. Under totalitarian conditions, knowledge of the labyrinth of transmission belts of transmission belts equals supreme power and every appointed successor who actually comes to know what is going on is automatically removed after a certain time a valid and comparatively permanent appointment would indeed presuppose the existence of a clique whose members would share the leader's monopoly of knowledge of what is going on which the leader must avoid by all means Hitler once explained this in his own terms to the supreme commanders of the Wehrmacht, who in the midst of the turmoil of war were presumably racking their brains over this problem. Quote, as the ultimate factor, I must in all modesty name my own person irreplaceable. The destiny of the Reich depends on me alone. Unquote. There is no need to look for any irony in the word modesty. The totalitarian leader, in marked contrast to all former usurpers, despots, and tyrants, seems to believe that the question of his succession is not overly important, is not overly important, that no special qualities or training are needed for the job, that the country will eventually obey anybody who happens to hold the appointment at the moment of his death and that no power thirsty rivals will dispute his legitimacy. As techniques of government, the totalitarian devices appear simple and... Thank you, Thomas. Well, we have uh, two minutes um, while we wait on our Next reader, does anyone have any comments on uh, the section that Thomas just finished reading or Thomas? Someone other than me, please. <laughs> Having just read eight pages, I'm a bit tapped out. Yeah, one, one interesting thing. Um, John, you might wanna unmute Sam as well. If you haven't, yeah, you have to um, ask to unmute in order for the new panelists, and also Kathleen is here in order for them to be able to unmute, and maybe Eric as well. I'm not sure if he's here. And now you know everything you need to know to host. <laughs> but go um, ahead, you, you were saying. Yeah, so this, uh, this continuing theme of the lack of a hierarchy uh, is interesting to me, but also the um, letting go of the gangsterism that takes place at the beginning, but the totalitarian system uh, can't tolerate later on. So it makes use of it as a kind of accelerator and then dismantles it um, through these increasing layers of elitist uh, regimes, and I thought that was interesting. The further we go with this, 
uh, the further and further we are from our own political situation. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, uh, I think what's telling about it is that we're watching how an assemblage of various elements can form to create this kind of momentum. And I think those non-totalitarian conditions that she keeps pointing to and highlighting um, may, may need to be um, paid attention to early on. Uh, so uh, like we're doing now, while we still have a democratic process where we can vote, um, as we begin to see the, the acceleration of the formation of say, um, uh, paramilitary groups or propaganda that begins to erode uh, the notion of truth um, and um, insulate us from reality in some way, that that is the time to resist. At this point in, in her argument, um, there doesn't seem to be any place for resistance to begin. <laughs> uh, the door seems to be shut from within inside this system. I'm just noticing, John, that we are at the time for the next section and we are without the next reader. I don't know if there's a, a plague going around here. Andreas <laughs> Stroll is, uh, ought, ought to be here. Um, Andreas is trying to get in, but it didn't, um, the link isn't working. So Sam is trying to fix that for him. Um, and so, I will watch for him. Does uh, Kathy, do you want to read this section? Do you feel like sure. reading? Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, hold on. 409 to 412. Okay. And just we're reading. A we're, and we're reading the origins of totalitarianism on election day. It's our marathon reading, and Kathleen Jones is our uh, next reader until the other reader. Okay. And, I don't and have, you know, you I don't know have, how to spotlight um, Kathleen. Yes. Okay. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, Thomas's Spartan shaker setting and good lighting, but we'll do without. <laughs> okay. Appear simple and ingeniously effective. They assure not only an absolute power monopoly, but unparalleled certainty that all commands will always be carried out. The multiplicity of the transmission belts, the confusion of the hierarchy, secure the dictator's complete independence of all his inferiors and make possible the swift and surprising changes in policy for which totalitarianism has become famous. The body politic of the country is shock proof because of its shapelessness. The reason why such extraordinary efficiency was never tried before are as simple as the device itself. The multiplication of offices destroys all sense of responsibility and competence. It is not merely a tremendously burdensome and unproductive increase of administration, but actually hinders productivity because conflicting orders constantly delay real work until the order of the leader has decided the matter. The fanaticism of the elite cadres, absolutely essential for the functioning of the movement, abolishes systematically all genuine interest in specific jobs and produces a mentality which sees every conceivable action as an instrument for something entirely different. And this mentality is not confined to the elite, but gradually pervades the entire population, the most intimate details of whose life and death depend upon political decisions. That is, upon causes and ulterior motives, which have nothing to do with performance. Constant removal, demotion, and promotion make reliable teamwork impossible and prevent the development of experience. 
Economically speaking, slave labor is a luxury which Russia should not be able to afford. In a time of acute shortage of technical skill, the camps were filled with, quote, highly qualified engineers who compete for the right to do plumbing jobs, repair clocks, electric lighting, and telephone, end quote. But then, from a purely economic utilitarian point of view, Russia should not have been able to afford the purges in the 30s that interrupted a long awaited economic recovery or the physical destruction of the Red Army general staff, which led almost to a defeat in the Russian Finnish war. Conditions in Germany were different in degree. In the beginning, the Nazis showed a certain tendency to retain technical and administrative skill, to allow profits in business, and to dominate economically without too much interference. At the outbreak of the war, Germany was not yet completely totalitarianized. And if one accepts pre preparations for war as a rational motive, it must be conceded that until roughly 1942, her economy was allowed to function more or less rationally. The preparation for war in itself is not anti-utilitarian, despite its prohibitive costs, for it may indeed be much, quote, cheaper to seize the wealth and resources of other nations by conquest than to buy them from foreign countries or produce them at home, end quote. Economic laws of investment and production, of stabilizing gains and profits, and of exhaustion do not apply if one intends in any event to replenish the depleted home economy with loot from other countries. It is quite true, and the sympathizing German people were perfectly aware of it, that the famous Nazi slogan of guns or butter actually meant butter through guns. It was not until 1942 that the rules of totalitarian domination began to outweigh all other considerations. The radicalization began immediately at the outbreak of war. One may even surmise that one of Hitler's reasons for provoking this war was that it enabled him to accelerate the development in a manner that would have been unthinkable in peacetime. The remarkable thing about this process, however, is that it was by no means checked by such a shattering defeat as Stalingrad, and that the danger of losing the war altogether was only another incitement to throw overboard all utilitarian considerations and make an all out attempt to realize through ruthless total organization, the goals of totalitarian racial ideology no matter for how short a time. After Stalingrad, the elite formations, which had been strictly separated from the people, were greatly expanded. The ban on party membership for those in the armed forces was lifted, and the military command was subordinated to SS commanders. The jealously guarded crime monopoly of the SS was abandoned and soldiers were assigned at will to duties of mass murder. Neither military nor economic nor political considerations were allowed to interfere with the costly and troublesome program of mass extermination and deportation. If one considers these last years of Nazi rule and their version of a, quote, five-year plan, which had no time to carry out, but which aimed at the extermination of the Polish and Ukrainian people of 170 million Russians 
as mentioned in one plan, the intelligentsia of Western Europe, such as the Dutch and the people of Alsace and Lorraine, as well as all those Germans who would be disqualified under the pro prospective Reich Health Bill or the planned community alien law. The analogy to the Bolshevik five-year plan of 1929, the first year of clear-cut totalitarian dictatorship in Russia is almost inescapable. Vulgar eugenic sl slogans in one case, high sounding economic phrases in the other were the prelude to a piece of prodigious insanity in which all rules of logic and principles of economics were turned upside down. Kathleen? Yes. Um, Andreas is here. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll let him uh, finish. Sure. Andreas, welcome. Thank you. Sorry for the technical problem. Uh, um, Kathleen, could you tell Andreas uh, where you left off? I left off on page 411 in the middle, just before the last paragraph that begins, to be sure. To be sure, totalitarian dictators do not consciously embark upon the road to insanity. The point is rather that our bewilderment about the anti-utilitarian character of the totalitarian state, totalitarian state structure springs from the mistaken notion that we are dealing with a normal state after all. A bureaucracy, a tyranny, a dictatorship, from our overlooking the empathic, emphatic assertions by totalitarian rulers that they consider the country where they happen to seize power, that they consider the country where they happen to seize power only the temporary headquarters of the international movement on the road to world conquest that they reckon victories and defeats in terms of centuries or millennia, and that the global interests always overrule the local interests of their own territory. The famous right is what is good for the German people was meant only for mass propaganda. Nazis were told that right is what is good for the movement, and these two interests did by no means always coincide. The Nazis did not think that the Germans were a master race to whom the world belonged, but, they should, but that they should be led by a master race as should all other nations and that this master race was only on the point of being born. Not the Germans were the dawn of the master race, but the SS. The Germanic world empire as Himmler said, or the Aryan world empire as Hitler would have put it, was in any event still centuries off for the movement it was more important to demonstrate that it was possible to fabricate a race by annihilating other races than to win a war with limited aims. What strikes the outside observer as a piece of prodigious insanity is nothing but the consequence of the absolute primacy of the movement, not only over the state, but also over the nation, the people, and the positions of power held by the rulers themselves. The reason why the ingenious devices of totalitarian rule with the absolute and unsurpassed concentration of power in the hands of a single man were never tried out before is that no ordinary tyrant was ever mad enough to discard all limited and local interests, economic, national, human, military, in favor of a purely fictitious reality in some indefinite distant future. Since totalitarianism in power remains faithful to the original tenets of the movement, the striking similarities between the organizational devices of the movement and the so-called totalitarian state are hardly surprising. The division between party members and fellow travelers organized in front. This is where my pages end. All right, thank you very much, Andreas. Um, let me invite you to comment on uh, what you've read. We have about six minutes uh, before the next reading. Um, is there something particularly that stood out to you? And I'll invite all of the other uh, panelists to join us. Yeah, it struck me. I, I um, had a conversation with Samantha yesterday and I already told her I was 
lucky that I had uh, been uh, assigned those pages by coincidence because the ruthlessness, not only against other human beings, but against their own pledge to you know, achieving a certain goal, no matter how cruel that goal be of totalitarian rulers is sort of put to an absurd point when you read those lines and you can feel how true they are, that they're willing to sacrifice everything for a mere uh, fantasy that, you know, nobody will ever live to see. That is some kind of almost uh, religious, but religion is too nice a word, uh, feverish nightmare. And it has, and that is why it's so difficult to criticize these uh, plots or these chimeras or nightmares uh, in a rational way, because there's ne nothing rational about it. Uh, that, that really struck me to put, to see that in such clear words. Although, it, I mean, that, I think that's right, but it's also true. I, I'm struck by the consistency or the coherence of the ideology. It's mad because it doesn't, it, it doesn't connect to reality. It doesn't, it's not, there's no reality principle that is maintaining it. But on the other hand, it's entirely self-consistent. It is, um, that's what's so terrifying about it is that once it's seized control of the mind of someone or of the masses, there's no way from outside to point out inconsistencies because it simply ignores any reality that doesn't accord with it and carries itself out with this kind of implacable consequence that is also terrifying and not limited by any kind of moral considerations or practical considerations or anything like that, just the consistency of the ideology. Um, uh, that's an important, I think that's a good insight. The, there's a difference, there's a logic to rationality, but there's a momentum to, or a velocity uh, to these totalitarian movements such that the velocity has to be continued in order for it to continue its madness uh, or um, um, uh, progress. But uh, to this open-ended future that also can't be rationally described, right? And so there's almost a, um, uh, the anti-rationalism in it um, almost becomes a badge of honor for those who uh, uh, associate with these kinds of movements too. Uh, the idea that you can be captured uh, by a velocity that defies all logic and rationality is considered a kind of uh, promotion intellectually. Yeah. It's yeah. like being in a, in a spaceship and now the space and cutting all contact to any, you know, any ground center, to any, any contact to the outside world and you're just there and you're drifting through space. There's no yeah. way anybody from the outside can interfere anymore. And there's no given third that would help in an argument inside the spaceship because you're all on the same course. Yeah, exactly. And you can't, and, and that the, um, uh, that the, the 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 ethic of loyalty means that the very denial of reality becomes a badge of membership. You, um, uh, you 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 point out that this is this is absurd or this is crazy, and it's like yes, that's because I'm very loyal. I'm a complete member of this. You know, I think that there was a a real Arendt had a very profound sense of um, the psychological satisfactions that that. That, that could give and how um, uh, how frightening that is because there's no way to to stop it there's no there's no common ground in a sense to to use to try to say well look we all agree on this so you know and and there is something surprisingly anti-modern in this right there is this challenge to the rationality of modernity and Arendt does describe how, how people became susceptible to this with Nietzsche and Kierkegaard and Marx mm -hmm. and how the, they broke the thread of tradition. Um, and uh, in so doing, in trying to liberate man in some sense uh, from the confines of reason, they exposed human beings to um, 
what was not yet present, which was this totalitarian system that could fill that kind of a vacuum. Right. Um, it needs to, I think it needs to fight two kinds of truths. There's a truth that is sort of essentialistic uh, that has a, that has, re refers to something given and that has to be uh, cut off. But then there's also a truth that is more relational. If mm -hmm. A is true and B is true, then C must be true too. And even that kind of tr uh, truth must be undermined in order to mm -hmm. make that work. And that is, that is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she uses that, you know, whoever says A has to say B. That's the, the this, this logical consequence that she sees at work in these ideologies. And they give this answer to people who are fundamentally isolated, right? Isn't that, that's part of what makes totalitarianism such a contemporary danger is that it depends on a population of atomized figures who have no vital connection to each other outside of this movement that sweeps them up and gives them meaning and makes them feel part of something larger. Well, that brings us uh, to 220, where uh, Jim McFarlane is going to begin his reading. Uh, if you're just joining us, this is the election day reading, marathon reading of Hannah Arendt's Origins of Totalitarianism. We're reading part three, and uh, Jim will begin on the page 413. I'll highlight you, or spotlight you. There you go. Organizations, far from disappearing, leads to the coordination of the whole population who are now organized as sympathizers. The tremendous increase in sympathizers is checked by limiting party strength to a privileged class of a few millions and creating a super party of several hundred thousand, the elite formations. Multiplication of offices, duplication of functions, and adaptation of the party sympathizer relationship to the new conditions means simply that the peculiar onion-like structure of the movement in which every layer was the front of the next more militant formation is retained. The state machine is transformed into a front organization of sympathizing bureaucrats whose function in domestic affairs is to spread confidence among the masses of merely coordinated citizens and whose foreign affairs consist in fooling the outside non-totalitarian world. The leader, in his dual capacity as chief of the state and leader of the movement, again combines in his person the acme of militant ruthlessness and confidence-inspiring normality. One of the important differences between a totalitarian movement and a totalitarian state is that the totalitarian dictator can and must practice the totalitarian art of lying more consistently and on a larger scale than the leader of a movement. This is partly the automatic consequence of swelling the ranks of fellow travelers and is partly due to the fact that unpleasant statements by a statesman are not as easily revoked as those of a demagogic party leader. For this purpose, Hitler chose to fall back without any detours on the old fashioned nationalism, which he had denounced many times before his ascent to power by posing as a violent nationalist, claiming that national socialism was not an export commodity. He appeased Germans and non-Germans alike and implied that Nazi ambitions would be satisfied when the traditional demands of a nationalist German foreign policy return of territories ceded in the Versailles Treaty, Anschluss of Austria, annexation of the German-speaking parts of Bohemia were fulfilled. Stalin likewise reckoned with both Russian public opinion and the non-Russian world when he invented his theory of socialism in one country and threw the onus of world revolution on Trotsky. Systematic lying to the whole world can be safely carried out only under the conditions of totalitarian rule, where the fictitious quality of everyday reality makes propaganda largely superfluous. In their pre-power stage, the movements can never afford to hide their true goals to the same degree. After all, they are meant to inspire mass organizations. But, Given the possibility to exterminate Jews like bedbugs, namely by poison gas, it is no longer necessary to propagate that Jews are bedbugs. 
given the power to teach a whole nation the history of the Russian Revolution without mentioning the name of Trotsky, there is no further need for propaganda against Trotsky. But the use of the methods for carrying out the ideological goals can be expected only from those who are ideologically utterly firm. Whether they have acquired such firmness in the Comintern schools or the special Nazi indoctrination centers, even if these goals continue to be publicized. On such occasions, it invariably turns out that the mere sympathizers never realize what is happening. This leads to the paradox that the secret society in broad daylight is never more conspiratory in character and methods than after it has been recognized as a full-fledged member of the comedy of nations. It is only logical that Hitler, prior to his seizure of power, resisted all attempts to organize the party and even the elite formations on a conspiratory basis. Yet, after 1933, he was quite eager to help transform the SS into a kind of secret society. Similarly, the Moscow-directed communist parties, in marked contrast to their predecessors, show a curious tendency to prefer the conditions of conspiracy even where complete legality is possible. The more conspicuous the power of totalitarianism, the more secret become its true goals. To know the ultimate aims of Hitler's rule in Germany, it was much wiser to rely on his propaganda speeches in Mein Kampf than on the oratory of the Chancellor of the Third Reich. Just as it would have been wiser to distrust Stalin's words about socialism in one country, invented for the passing purpose of seizing power after Lenin's death, and to take more seriously his repeated hostility to democratic countries. The totalitarian dictators have proved that they knew only too well the danger inherent in their pose of normality. That is, the danger of a true nationalist policy or of actually building socialism in one country. This they try to overcome through a permanent and consistent discrepancy between reassuring words and the reality of rule by consciously developing a method of always doing the opposite of what they say. Stalin has carried this art of balance, which demands more skill than the ordinary routine of diplomacy, to the point where a moderation in foreign policy or the political line of the Comintern is almost invariably accompanied by radical purges in the Russian party. It was certainly more than coincidence that the popular front policy and the drafting of the comparatively liberal Soviet constitution were accompanied by the Moscow trials. Evidence that totalitarian governments aspire to conquer the globe and bring all countries on earth under their domination can be found repeatedly in Nazi and Bolshevik literature. Yet these ideological programs inherited from pre-totalitarian movements, from the supranationalist anti-Semitic parties and the pan-German dreams of empire in the case of the Nazis, from the international concept of revolutionary socialism in the case of Bolsheviks, are not decisive. What is decisive is that totalitarian regimes really conduct their foreign policy on the consistent assumption that they will eventually achieve this ultimate goal and never lose sight of it, no matter how distant it may appear or how seriously its ideal demands may conflict with the necessities of the moment. They therefore consider no country as permanently foreign, but on the contrary, every country as their potential territory rise to power, the fact that in one country the fictitious world of the movement has become a tangible reality creates a relationship to other nations which is similar to the situation of the totalitarian party under non-totalitarian rule. The tangible reality of the fiction, backed by internationally recognized state power, can be exported the same way contempt for parliament could be imported into a non-totalitarian parliament. In this respect, the pre-war solution of the Jewish question was the outstanding export commodity of Nazi Germany. Expulsion of Jews carried, on, carried an important portion of Nazism into other countries. By forcing Jews to leave the Reich, passportless and penniless, 
the legend of the wandering Jew was realized. And by forcing the Jews into uncompromising hostility against them, the Nazis had created the pretext for taking a passionate interest in all nations' domestic policies. How seriously the Nazis took their conspiratorial fiction, according to which they were the future rulers of the world, came to light in 1940, when, despite necessity and in the face of all their all too real chances of winning over the occupied peoples of Europe, they started their depopulation policies in the Eastern territories, regardless of loss of manpower and serious military consequences and introduced legislation which with retroactive force exported part of the Third Reich's penal code into the Western occupied countries. There was hardly a more effective way of publicizing the Nazi claim to world rule than punishing as high treason every utterance or action against the Third Reich, no matter where, when, or by whom it had been made. Nazi law treated the whole world as falling potentially under its jurisdiction so that the occupying army was no longer an instrument of conquest that carried with it the new law of the conqueror, but an executive organ which enforced a law which already supposedly existed for everyone. The assumption that Nazi law was binding beyond the German border and the punishment of non-Germans were more than mere devices of oppression. Totalitarian regimes are not afraid of the logical implications of world conquest even if they work the other way around and are detrimental to their own people's interests. Logically, it is indisputable that a plan for world conquest involves the abolition of differences between the conquering mother country and the conquered territories, as well as the difference between foreign and domestic politics, upon which all existing non-totalitarian institutions and all international intercourse are based. If the totalitarian conqueror conducts himself everywhere as though he were at home, by the same token, he must treat his own population as though he were a foreign conqueror. And it is perfectly true that the totalitarian movement seizes power in much the same sense as a foreign conqueror may occupy a country which he governs not for its own sake, but for the benefit of something or somebody else. The Nazis behaved like foreign conquerors in Germany when, against all national interests, they tried and half succeeded in converting their defeat into a final catastrophe for the whole German people. Similarly, in case of victory, they intended to extend their extermination politics into the ranks of racially unfit Germans. A similar attitude seems to have inspired Soviet foreign policy after the war. The cost of its aggressiveness to the Russian people themselves is I think that's it. Was it supposed to continue? Maybe if nothing else happens, we should start a conversation in the meantime. <laughs> uh, Jim, I'm sorry, uh, Andreas. I just realized that I was on mute the whole time, so everything I was saying. Uh, was... <laughs> <laughs> I was a little confused. It's okay. all right. I, 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 you know, I was inviting you, Jim, uh, to make any comments you wanted on the reading. Oh, then, okay. Andreas. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I just think um, 
uh, I, I'm struck by again this uh, this thought uh, or this this understanding, this kind of um, systemic understanding of conspiratorial thinking, and this discrepancy between the stated politics and the um, uh, the actual politics that's working. I think so often in our um, uh, public sphere, uh, we hear references to conspiracy theories, and they're almost exclusively understood as kind of psychological phenomenon, as ways of providing explanations for confusing circumstances. And I think Arendt is here showing something else about the way conspiratorial thinking operates in the um, uh, this kind of corrosive dynamism of totalitarian movements that they are able, um, they need the conspiratorial discrepancy between stated aims and actual aims between visible policies and um, clandestine policies um, in order to keep the dynamic going and to keep this, um, uh, this, this movement uh, 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 coming, uh, uh, proceeding forward. Um, so it's not just a matter of the atomized individuals requiring an explanation. And so you get, you know, some kind of you know, um, uh, the, the uh, assassination of John F. Kennedy conspiracy thinking or in, in our immediate world, the QAnon sorts of um, uh, fantasies about these um, nefarious under uh, 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 conspiracies going on, but rather that um, the the way the politics of totalitarianism operates and the um, the damage that it does to the state and to to the ways that people live together depends on having this systemic discrepancy between um, the actual and the um, the uh, stated aims of of the movement. Um, I think that's an interesting observation that she's making here. It's one that, that um, uh, I have to think some more about, but I was struck as I was reading through it. Yeah, I think she referred to one of them as the ostensible power and then the actual power behind that, right? Yeah, and the onion-like character of the movement that, you know, it's this process of radicalization where, you know, every... Uh, every visible front, every visible pol political organization becomes a front for something um, uh, behind it, which in turn, when it becomes visible, is the front for something behind it. And that there's this dynamic of, um, of, of uh, uh, because if you ever had just the visible power and the, the power itself coincide, that would be a kind of stability that totalitarianism seems um, fundamentally hostile to. Um, I think what else, what else is interesting there is that notion of superfluity that continues to run through the totalitarian system, that each front is in fact immediately right. rendered superfluous right. to the movement, right? Yeah. Um, and that goes for every individual. I'm reminded of that film, um, The Gray Zone, where mm -hmm. you get this sort of visceral experience of the superfluity of everyone within the camp. Mm -hmm. uh, the camp yeah. itself is superfluous, the guards, the inmates, uh, and there's a constant, you can almost see the movement down to that last scene where they're all being executed yeah. there. Yeah, exactly. I mean, in, in a kind of ghastly, humorous way, there's a similar thing in Death of Stalin, the way that, they, you know, that there it's almost that slapstick is the only thing that can capture the absurdity of these, you know, you load them onto the truck and then he's executed. You know, you load these people on the truck to be executed and then you're executed by the next guy who's standing, you know, behind you. And then the next guy, there's this, yeah, everyone becomes superfluous in that way. And the other thing that I think that underscores is for me, one of the most terrifying dimensions of Arendt's diagnosis of totalitarianism is that we uh, tend to, and I know I always have seen it as a movement that has a leader um, you know, a highly visible and ostensibly responsible leader. 
And her vision of it is that that leader in some sense is as much a kind of byproduct of the dynamic as anything else in the system. In other words, it's not as though Hitler is running the show and dictating. This isn't to exonerate him at all, but to say that what totalitarianism is, is something like a kind of plague of stupidity in mass societies or something, a way that they can go wrong collectively um, that uh, cannot be reduced to any individual um, responsibility in any straightforward or easy way. And that is easy to mistake as saying, well, these leaders aren't responsible for what, but it's not that. It's obviously they bear huge moral responsibility, but what they, but what we're looking at is a dynamic that is um, indigenous to mass societies and that it dwarfs this individual responsibility. And in that sense, these policies are, um, the, the, the clandestine policies are being produced by the dynamic that is eroding politics itself as it continues. And so uh, the, the downside is that if the leader is a buffoon, that actually doesn't mean that the system isn't working the way it it works, you know, that it's not as though it needs some genius at the top to run the thing. It's, it's a, a collective pathology that is operative. Yeah, that, that's why I compared it to a spaceship. Once it's on its course, it's driven by its own inertia. It doesn't need any intervention anymore. And it's yeah, possible exactly. to stop. You know, it's just, it's, that's the, the core of the apparatus. Once yeah. the, the apparatus is set to work, it'll never stop. It's driven by its own inertia. Yeah. All right. Well, that brings us uh, to our time. Uh, unfortunately, Anne is not able to access uh, Zoom. She's tried it several times, and she's not able to get in. Um, so in, in lieu of her reading, if she uh, comes in, I'll, I'll add her. But I'll, I'll go ahead and read her. Uh, portion. If you're just joining us, this is the election day reading of Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism, Part 3, uh, and we are at page 417. And John, you might want to spotlight yourself. It's called Spotlight for Everyone. It doesn't allow me to do that. Under your three dots, it doesn't allow you to spotlight. For, it doesn't say spotlight for everyone. And the, if you go to yourself up at the top. Uh, I see. There we go. OK. Prohibitive. It has foregone the great post-war loan from the United States, which would have enabled Russia to reconstruct devastated areas and industrialize the country in a rational, productive way. The extension, the extension of Comintern governments throughout the Balkans and the occupation of large Eastern territories brought no tangible benefits, but on the contrary, strained Russian resources still further. But this policy certainly served the interests of the Bolshevik movement, which is spread over almost half of the inhabited world. Like a foreign conqueror, the totalitarian dictator regards the natural and industrial riches of each country, including his own, as a source of loot and a means of preparing the next step of aggressive expansion. Since this economy of systematic spoilation is carried out for the sake of the movement and not of the nation, no people and no territory as the potential beneficiary can possibly set a saturation point to the process. The totalitarian dictator is like a foreign conqueror who comes from nowhere and his looting is likely to benefit nobody. Distribution of the spoils is calculated not to strengthen the economy of the home country, but only as a temporary tactical maneuver. For economic purposes, the totalitarian regimes are as much at home in their countries as the proverbial swarms of locusts. The fact that the totalitarian dictator rules his own country like a foreign conqueror makes matters worse 
because it adds to ruthlessness an efficiency which is conspicuously lacking in tyrannies in alien surroundings. Stalin's war against the Ukraine in the early 30s was twice as effective as the terrible bloody German invasion and occupation. This is the reason why totalitarianism prefers quizzling governments to direct rule despite the obvious dangers of such regimes. The trouble with totalitarian regimes is not that they play power politics in an especially ruthless way, but that beyond, behind their politics is hidden an entirely new and unprecedented concept of power, just as behind the real politic lies in an entirely new and unprecedented concept of reality, supreme disregard for immediate consequences rather than ruthlessness, rootlessness and neglect of all national interests rather than nationalism, contempt for utilitarian motives rather than unconsidered pursuit of self-interest, idealism, i.e. the unwavering faith in an ideological fictitious world rather than lust for power, these have all introduced into international politics a new and more disturbing factor than mere aggressiveness would have been able to do. Power, as conceived by totalitarianism, lies exclusively in the force produced through organization. Just as Stalin saw every institution independent of its actual function, only as a transmission belt connecting the party with the people, and honestly believed that the most precious treasure of the Soviet Union were not the riches of its soil or the productive capacity of its huge manpower, but the cadres of the party, for example, the police. So Hitler, as early as 1929, saw the great thing of the movement in the fact that 60,000 men, quote, have outwardly become almost a unit that actually these members are uniform, not only in ideas, but that even the facial expression is almost the same. Look at these laughing eyes, this fanatical enthusiasm, and you will discover how 100,000 men in a movement become a single type, end quote. Whatever connection power had in the minds of Western man with earthly possessions, with wealth, treasures, and riches, has been dissolved into a kind of dematerialized mechanism whose every move generates power as friction or as galvanic currents generate electricity. The totalitarian division of states into have and have not countries is more than a demagogic device. Those who make it are actually convinced that the power of material possessions is negligible and only stands in the way of the development of organizational power. To Stalin, constant growth and development of police cadres were incomparably more important than the oil in Baku, the coal and ore in the Urals, the granaries in the Ukraine, or the potential treasures in Siberia. In short, the development of Russia's full power arsenal. The same mentality led Hitler to sacrifice all Germany to the cadres of the SS. He did not consider the war lost when Germany, German cities lay in rubble and industrial capacity was destroyed, but only when he learned that the SS troops were no longer reliable. To a man who believed in organizational omnipotence against all mere material factors, military or economic, and who moreover calculated the eventual victory of his enterprise in centuries, defeat was not military catastrophe or threatened starvation of the population, but only the destruction of the elite formations which were supposed to carry the conspiracy for world rule through a line of generations to its eventual end. The structuralist, the structuralistness of the totalitarian state, its neglect of material interests, its emancipation from the profit motive, and its non-utilitarian attitudes in general, have more than anything else 
contributed to making contemporary politics well nigh unpredictable. The inability of the non-totalitarian world to grasp a mentality which functions independently of all calculable action in terms of men and material and is completely indifferent to national interests and the well-being of its people shows itself in a curious dilemma of judgment. Those who rightly understand the terrible uh, efficiency of totalitarian organization and police are likely to overestimate the material force of totalitarian countries. While those who understand the wasteful incompetence of totalitarian economics are likely to underestimate the power potential which can be created in disregard of all material factors. Section two, the secret police. Up to now, we know only two authentic forms of totalitarian domination, the dictatorship of National Socialism after 1938 and the dictatorship of Bolshevism since 1930. These forms of domination differ basically from other kinds of dictatorial, despotic, or tyrannical rule. And even though they have developed with a certain continuity from party dictatorships, their essentially totalitarian features are new and cannot be derived from one party systems. The goal of one party systems is not only to seize the government administration, but by filling all offices with party members to achieve a complete amalgamation of the state and party so that after the seizure of power, the party becomes a kind of propaganda organization for the government. This system is total, only in a negative sense, namely in that the ruling party will tolerate no other parties, no opposition, and no freedom of political opinion. Once a party dictatorship has come to power, it leaves the original power relationship between state and party intact. The government and the army exercise the same power as before, and the revolution consists only in the fact that all government positions are now occupied by party members. In all these cases, the power of the party rests on a monopoly guaranteed by the state, and the party no longer possesses its own power center. The revolution initiated by the totalitarian movements after they have seized power is of considerably more radical nature. For the start, from the start, they consciously strive to maintain the essential differences between state and movement and to prevent the revolutionary institutions of the movement from being absorbed by the government. The problem of seizing the state machine without amalgamizing with it is solved by permitting only the party members whose importance for the movement is secondary to rise in the state hierarchy. All real power is vested in the institutions of the movement and outside the state and military apparatuses. It is inside the movement, which remains the center of action of the country, that all decisions are made. The official civil services are often not even informed of what is going on, and party members with the ambition to rise to the rank of ministers have in all cases paid for such bourgeois wishes with the loss of their influence on the movement and the confidence of its leaders. Totalitarianism in power uses the state as the outward facade to represent the country in the non-totalitarian non world. As such, the totalitarian state is the logical heir of the totalitarian movement from which it borrows its organizational structure. Totalitarian rulers deal with non-totalitarian governments in the same way. They dealt with parliamentary parties or intra-party factions because their rise to power and, though on an enlarged international scene, are again faced with the double problem of shielding the fictitious world of the movement or the totalitarian country from the impact of factuality and of presenting a semblance of normality and common sense to the normal outside world. 
above the state and behind the facades of ostensible power, in a maze of multiplied offices underlying all shifts of authority and in the chaos of inefficiency, lies the power nucleus of the country, the super efficient and super competent services of the secret police. The emphasis on the police as the sole organ of power and the corresponding neglect of the seemingly greater power arsenal of the army, which is characteristic of all totalitarian regimes, can still be partially explained by the totalitarian aspiration to world rule and its conscious abolition of the distinction between a foreign country and a home country, between foreign and domestic affairs. The military forces trained to fight a foreign aggressor have always been a dubious instrument for civil war purposes. Even under totalitarian conditions, they find it difficult to regard their own people with the eyes of a foreign conqueror. More important in this respect, however, is that their value becomes dubious even in a time of war. Since the totalitarian ruler conducts his policies on the assumption of an eventual world government, he treats the victims of his aggression as though they were rebels, guilty of high treason, and consequently prefers to rule occupied ter territories with police and not with military forces. Even before the movement seizes power, it possesses a secret police and spy service with the branches in various countries. Later, its agents receive more money and authority than regular military intelligence service and are, and we'll end there. I'll just uh, invite everyone to um, comment on that reading if you have any comments. Yeah, I'm struck by this idea of a, a totally new concept of power um, that, uh, that, that shows up. Um, early in the, uh, in the uh, new and unprecedented concept of power, just as behind the real politic lies an entirely new and unprecedented concept of reality. Um, and again, this kind of um, dual structure of uh, an outward facing, more normal and traditional um, state structure and then an inward facing um, uh, uh, I, concept of well, inward in certain con in certain contexts in certain in, in certain uh, in certain consideration because of course the other point that she seems to be making is precisely this distinction between the the nation and its um, external exterior, environment has broken down as well because these movements don't have territorial limitations there they have territorial um situations but they are from a formal in a formal sense um universalizing and so they don't have um territorial boundaries and so in that wonderful movement she describes they consider themselves the appropriate rulers of foreign countries that they conquer, but then by the same token, they relate to their own populations as if they were conquered populations. And so um, uh, that, that, that sense that that, that that kind of power is entirely new and unprecedented seems to connect them to this idea that totalitarianism is not a version of tyranny or is not a version of authoritarianism. Um, it may grow out of that. It may have, you know, historical and contingent links to that, but as a dynamic, as a formal form of government or a dynamic for the way societies are organized, it's not um, a tyrannical form. 
um, which would in some, I mean, I think she means that to mean it's worse in some way, that their tyrannies are old. We have some familiarity with how you deal with them. There are certain sorts of things, you know, they are vehement for a while and then the tyrant is overthrown or whatever it may be. But then what we're dealing with in totalitarian societies is something that is new and that doesn't, um, that we can't simply use the, uh, the ideas from earlier experiences of injustice to, to combat. We're seeing something happen here that is um, uh, qualitatively different from simply a tyrannical domination of a population, but rather there's some kind of uh, discrepancy that has crept into the organs of the state, the organs of, of administration um, that is corrosive in this, in this very fundamental way. I would, uh, I'll jump in unless, uh, Andreas, would you like to uh, say something? No, go ahead, please. Uh, well, two, two observations. Um, just, I see that we're almost at time for the next section, uh, but I think we might be also waiting for the next reader. So I'll say a couple of things. One, uh, Jim, on that, uh, the calling attention to the new conception of power, I was also looking at that. Um, this is on page 418. Mm -hmm. Power as conceived by totalitarian, totalitarianism lies exclusively in the force produced through organization. And one question, one thing that I want to think more about, and you know, would be interested to hear what people think about it is, there seems to be a um, somewhat of a tension, or at least I'm not sure I fully understand the relationship between the power produced exclusively through the force, um, the force produced exclusively through organization and the structurelessness of the totalitarian state, which he uh, emphasizes on the same page. I know, and they're so blatantly, um, they're, they're so closely connected to one another just in the distribution of the argument that I'm sure that they, fit some way, but I'm not sure that I fully grasp that. And the second thing I wanted to observe in relation again to Jim, what you were saying is the, the newness of this, the, the way that she makes it evident that this is a new organ, a new um, political phenomenon that requires a new explanation brings to my mind something that's been recurrent throughout the day as we've been making, um, we've been thinking about reading this book now mm -hmm. and thinking about the way that aspects of this argument illuminate aspects of the contemporary situation, at least in the US, but also elsewhere. And also in ways in which it doesn't, there are ways in which there are parallels and um, differences. And it occurs to me that there's, um, one might think that there, uh, <laughs> it's time for, for another uh, form of analysis. Uh, mm -hmm. that, and, it's, and it's certainly um, in the spirit of Arendt to recognize that the theory, or, or to argue that the theory needs to be responsive to shifting historical circumstances. I think that's very important that it's not just about, she saw ahead what we're experiencing now. I think what's exemplary is the integrity with which she responded to what she was seeing. Um, and that that's what needs to be input imitated as it were, um, the insights of course that, that are applicable, but also um, a willingness to um, recognize the, the uniqueness and the unprecedented character of what she was confronted with. If we imitate that, that means we don't just simply transplant what she says into our circumstances and look for the correlates, but rather we look at what we're looking at and try to see it in as clear-eyed a way and as um, uh, unmystified a way as she was able to see the totalitarian movement she was contemporary with. That's, uh, I think that's very helpful. We're uh, just uh, over a little bit on our time um, and wanted to get to our uh, next reader, Monica Osborne, who's joining us from uh, uh, Canada, but by way of uh, LA. Yeah. Uh, so nice to see you, Monica. Nice uh, to see you. If you're just joining us, this is the election day reading of Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism, part three. Uh, and our next uh, reading begins on page 421. And I'll spotlight you, uh, Monica, and you can begin when you're ready. 
frequently the secret chiefs of embassies and consulates abroad. Its main tasks consist in forming fifth columns, directing the branches of the movement, influencing the domestic policies of the respective countries, and generally preparing for the time when the totalitarian ruler, after overthrow of the government or military victory, can openly feel at home. In other words, the international branches of the secret police are the transmission belts which constantly transform the ostensibly foreign policy of the totalitarian state into the potentially domestic business of the totalitarian movement. These functions, however, which the secret police fulfill in order to prepare the totalitarian utopia of world rule are secondary to those required for the present realization of the totalitarian fiction in one country. The dominant role of the secret police in the domestic politics of totalitarian countries has naturally contributed much to the common misconception of totalitarianism. All despotisms rely heavily on secret services and feel more threatened by their own than by any foreign people. However, this analogy between totalitarianism and despotism holds only for the first stages of totalitarian rule when there is still a political opposition. In this, as in other respects, totalitarianism takes advantage of and gives conscious support to non-totalitarian mis misconceptions, no matter how uncomplimentary they may be. Himmler, in his famous speech to the Reichswehr staff in 1937, assumed the role of an ordinary tyrant when he explained the constant expansion of the police forces by assuming the existence of a fourth theater in case of war internal Germany. Similarly, Stalin at almost the same moment half succeeded in convincing the old Bolshevik guard whose confessions he needed of a war threat against the Soviet Union and consequently an emergency in which the country must remain united even behind a despot. The most striking aspect of these statements was that both were made after all political opposition had been extinguished, that the secret services were expanded when actually no opponents were left to be spied upon. When war came, Himmler neither needed nor used his SS troops in Germany itself, except for the running of concentration camps and policing of foreign slave labor. The bulk of the armed SS served at the Eastern Front where they were used for special assignments, usually mass murder, and the enforcement of policy which frequently ran counter to the military as well as the Nazi civilian hierarchy. Like the secret police of the Soviet Union, the SS formations usually arrived after the military forces had pacified the conquered territory and had dealt with outright political opposition. In the first stages of a totalitarian regime, however, the secret police and the party's elite formations still play a role similar to that in other forms of dictatorship and the well-known terror regimes of the past. And the excessive cruelty of their methods is unparalleled only in the history of modern Western countries. The first stage of ferreting out secret enemies and hunting down former opponents is usually combined with drafting the entire population into front organizations and re-educating old party members for voluntary espionage services so that the rather dubious sympathies of the drafted sympathizers need not worry, the specially trained cadres of the police. It is during this stage that a neighbor gradually becomes a more dangerous enemy to one who happens to harbor dangerous thoughts than are the officially appointed police agents. The end of the first stage comes with the liquidation of open and secret resistance in any organized form. It can be set at about 1935 in Germany and approximately 1930 in Soviet Russia. Only after the extermination of real enemies has been completed and the hunt for objective enemies begun, does terror become the actual content of totalitarian regimes. Under the pretext of building socialism in one country or using a given territory as a laboratory for a revolutionary experiment or realizing Volks, Volksgemeinschaft, the second claim of totalitarianism, the claim to total domination is carried out. And although theoretically total domination is possible only under the conditions of word, world rule, the totalitarian regimes have proved that this part of the totalitarian utopia can be realized almost to perfection 
because it is temporarily independent of defeat or victory. Thus, Hitler could rejoice even in the midst of military setbacks over the extermination of Jews and the establishment of death factories. No matter what the final outcome, without the war, it would never have been possible to burn the bridges and to realize some of the goals of the totalitarian movement. The elite formations of the Nazi movement and the cadres of the Bolshevik, Bolshevik movement serve the goal of total domination rather than security, the security of the regime in power. Just as the totalitarian claim to world rule is only an appearance the same as imperialist expansion, so the claim to total domination only seems familiar to the student of despotism. If the chief difference between totalitarian and imperialist expansion is that the former recognizes no difference between a home and a foreign country, then the chief difference between a despotic and a totalitarian secret police is that the latter does not hunt secret thoughts and does not use the old method of secret services, the method of provocation. Since a totalitarian secret police begins its career after the pacification of the country, it always appears entirely superfluous to all outside observers or on the contrary, misleads them into thinking that there is some secret resistance. The superfluousness of secret services is nothing new. They've always been haunted by the need to prove their usefulness and keep their jobs after their original task had been completed. The methods used for this purpose have made the study of the history of revolutions a rather difficult enterprise. It appears, for example, that there was not a single anti-government action under the reign of Louis Napoleon, which had not been inspired by the police itself. Similarly, the role of secret agents in all revolutionary parties in Tsarist, Tsarist Russia strongly suggests that without their inspiring provocative actions, the course of the Russian revolution movement would have been far less successful. Provocation, in other words, helped as much to maintain the continuity of tradition as it did to disrupt time and again, the organization of the revolution. This dubious role of provocation might have been one reason why the totalitarian rulers discarded it. Provocation, moreover, is clearly necessary only on the assumption that suspicion is not sufficient for arrest and punishment. None of the totalitarian rulers, of course, ever dreamed of conditions in which he would have to resort to provocation in order to trap somebody he thought to be an enemy. More important than these technical considerations is the fact that totalitarianism defined its enemies ideologically before it seized power. So the categories of the suspects were not established through police information. Thus the Jews in Nazi Germany or the descendants of the former ruling classes in Soviet Russia were not really suspected of any hostile action. They had been declared objective enemies of the regime in accordance with its ideology. The chief difference between the despotic and the totalitarian secret police lies in the difference between the suspect and the objective enemy. The latter is defined by the policy of the government and not by his own desire to overthrow it. He is never an individual whose dangerous thoughts must be provoked or whose past justifies suspicion, but a carrier of tendencies like the carrier of a disease. Practically speaking, the totalitarian ruler proceeds like a man who persistently insults another man until everybody knows that the latter is his enemy so that he can, with some plausibility, go and kill him in self-defense. This certainly is a little crude, but it works as everybody will know who ever watched how certain successful careerists eliminate competitors. The introduction of the notion of objective enemy is much more decisive for the functioning of totalitarian regimes than the ideological definition of the respective categories. If it were only a matter of hating Jews or bourgeois, the totalitarian regimes could, after the commission of one gigantic crime, return, as it were, to the rules of normal life and government. As we know, the opposite is the case. The category of objective enemies outlives the first ideologically determined foes of the movement. New objective enemies are discovered according to changing circumstances. The Nazis, foreseeing the completion of Jewish extermination, had already taken the necessary preliminary steps for the liquidation of the Polish people 
while Hitler even planned the decimation of certain categories of Germans. The Bolsheviks, having started with descendants of the former ruling classes, directed their full terror against the Kulaks in the early 30s, who in turn were followed by Russians of Polish origin between 1936 and 1938, the Tatars and the Volga Germans during the war, former prisoners of war and units of the occupational forces of the Red Army after the war, and Russian Jewry after the establishment of a Jewish state. The choice of such categories is never entirely arbitrary since they are publicized and used for propaganda purposes of the movement abroad, they must appear plausible as possible enemies. The choice of a particular category may even be due. Thank you, Monica. Um, I'll unmute everyone, but do you, uh, Monica, do you have any comments on what you read that particularly struck you? Well, I mean, all, all of it strikes me. I mean, we, we know why we're doing this today. It's because it is striking in this particular context, right? In this particular cultural moment. Um, I, you know, I, uh, I was thinking about this the other day and I, I thought, well, I should, I should read this ahead of time. And then I chose not to read it ahead of time because I wanted to feel the full impact of these words on this day. And you know, admittedly, it's been it's been it's been a number of years um, since I've looked at uh, the origins of totalitarianism or even Arendt. Um, but it's um, you know what I will say is that as I read, I have a sinking feeling, like many of you, right? Um, it's it's not that it's prescient; it's that it's now. Yeah. So you. Um you feel like it's uh, we're at the totalitarian stage? I don't know that we're there. Yeah. I, I, think, I think we're close. I think there are, uh, you know, symptoms and signs of it. Um, you know, I think most would argue that we see it predominantly from the right and specifically from this administration, but I'm not entirely convinced that that's the only place from which it can come. Um, you know, and for me, that is the concern that it's not just coming from one place or one um, set of ideologies necessarily, that this may be more pervasive and endemic to each side. That would be my fear. Yeah. That notion of an objective enemy really struck me. And although I, I think as we've been reading today, it's very clear that uh, the United States isn't at this stage of totalitarianism yet, but there's, there are certainly some elements that um, if they coalesce could result in a kind of totalitarian regime. But I'm wondering about this objective enemy and where we might see that. There's certainly, um, and this was true in the 60s too, but trying to consolidate the left into a single target that is uh, uh, upon which you can pin any number of labels, socialists, uh, communists, uh, terrorists, and uh, uh, anarchists. Um, and that seems to be a, a, a kind of functional objective enemy right now. And anyone can be uh, lumped into that. You, you, you only need to express some uh, solidarity with any of the tenants that they're opposed to and you can be become a member, so. Absolutely, and I think there, you know, you, you said something you just said, you know, this idea of de defacing the objective enemy, you know, a, a, as you know, I, you know, was, I read a rent, but then I ended up with Levinas and, um, you know, so it, it all begins and ends there for me. But, you know, once, once you, you strip um, a person or a group of people of, of their faces, once we are no longer, we've either defaced them or, you know, we, we for whatever reason, can no longer see their faces, aren't they all enemies? Um, you know, so I think the potential for uh, so many different individuals and groups of people to become objective enemies is is real and um, massive, maybe. Yeah. Anyone else have anything? 
to jump in. I just say it, it reminds me what you were saying, Monica, reminds me a bit of something Arendt wrote at the very end of, of the first conclusion to the origins of totalitarianism, which we're approaching, which is that as long as, um, you know, there are conditions of unrest, as long as there is social and political turmoil, that the elements of totalitarianism will always exist within a society. Um, and the question is whether or not these can actually crystallize into a successful political movement or into a new kind of political movement that um, prevents freedom, prevents freedom of movement um, uh, and uses this kind of um, political ideology and propaganda to scapegoat, to scapegoat a group of people or class of people um, in order to further its own interest. You know, I think the the thing I know that I've been asked the most by people since 2016 is, is America a fascist country now? As though the you know, election of Donald Trump somehow signaled a break in American democracy in the beginning of some kind of new political order. And, and my answer has consistently, and I stick with it, has been no, um, it's not. But that doesn't mean that there aren't elements of fascism alive and well in the United States. You know, Hannah Arendt is offering us a list of the different elements. Um, and they exist apart from one another, but it's the way they work together, you know, so something that she talks a lot about is the privatization of public institutions. She talks about racism. She talks about um, the nation state um, and all of these things in one way or another are, you know, for her an element of what eventually became Nazism and, or, Bolshev and, or Bolshevism, I think, in a more developed form as she understands it um, in Russia. Right, right. And, you know, I think that's a really good point, because I think that as a society, we've become incapable of talking about elements and nuance. It's, it's either, you know, it's either or. We're either a fascist country or we're not a fascist country. But there, there is so much space in between. And, you know, it takes a lot of steps to get from no fascism to fascism, right? And I think that when we you know, polarize the, the discussion in this way, that that is dangerous ground because that, that's how you get to fascism, you know, with, with those kinds of polarizing debates. Well, that brings us to our next reading. Um, uh, Yasmin, uh, sorry. Um, we will begin on page 425. If you're just joining us, um, uh, this is the election day reading of Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism, Part 3, and we'll begin with Yasmin on page 425. The certain propaganda needs of the movement at large ask, for instance, the sudden entirely unprecedented emergence of governmental anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union, which may be calculated to win sympathies for the Soviet Union in the European satellite countries. The show trials, which require subjective confessions of guilt from quote unquote objectively identified enemies are meant for these purposes. They can best be staged with those who have received a totalitarian indoctrination that enables them quote unquote subjectively to understand their own objective harmfulness and to confess quote for the sake of the cause end quote. The concept of the objective opponent whose identity changes according to the prevailing circumstances so that as soon as one category is liquidated, war may be declared on another, corresponds exactly to the factual situation reiterated time and again by totalitarian rulers. Namely, that their regime is not a government in any traditional sense, but a movement whose advance constantly meets with new obstacles that have to be eliminated. So far as one may speak at all of any legal thinking within the totalitarian system, the objective opponent is its central idea. Closely connected with this transformation of the suspect into the objective enemy is the change of position of the secret police in the totalitarian state. The secret services have rightly been called a state within the state and this not only in despotisms, but also under constitutional or semi-constitutional governments. 
The mere possession of secret information has always given this branch a decisive superiority over all other branches of the civil services and constituted an open threat to members of the government. The totalitarian police, on the contrary, is totally subject to the will of the leader, who alone can decide who the next political enemy will be and who, as Stalin did, can also single out cadres of the secret police for liquidation. Since the police are no longer permitted to use provocation, they have been deprived of the only available means of perpetuating themselves independently of the government and have become entirely dependent on the higher authorities for the safeguarding of their jobs. Like the army in a non-totalitarian state, the police in totalitarian countries merely execute political policy and have lost all the prerogatives which they held under despotic bureaucracies. The task of the totalitarian police is not to discover crimes, but to be on hand when the government decides to arrest a certain category of the population. Their chief political distinction is that they alone are in the confidence of the highest authority and know which political line will be enforced. This does, not, this does not apply only to matters of high policy, such as the liquidation of a whole class or ethnic group. Only the cadres of the GUP knew the actual goal of the Soviet government in the early 30s, and on, only the SS formations knew that the Jews were to be exterminated in the early 40s. The point about everyday life under totalitarian conditions is that only the agents of the NKVD in an industrial enterprise are informed of what Mos Moscow wants when it orders, for instance, a speed up in the fabrication of pipes. Whether it simply wants more pipes or to ruin the director of the factory or to liquidate the whole management or to abolish this particular factory or finally to have this order repeated all over the nation so that a new purge can begin. One of the reasons for the duplication of secret services whose agents are unknown to each other is that total domination needs the most extreme flexibility. To use our example, Moscow may not yet know when it gives its order for pipes, whether it want, wants pipes, which are always needed, or a purge. Multiplication of secret services makes last minute changes possible so that one branch may be preparing to bestow the order of Lenin on the director of the factory, while another makes arrangements for his arrest. The efficiency of the police consists in the fact that such contradictory assignments can be prepared simultaneously. Under totalitarian, as under other regimes, the secret police has a monopoly on certain vital information. But the kind of knowledge that can be possessed only by the police has undergone an important change. The police are no longer concerned with knowing what is going on in the heads of future victims. Most of the time they ignore who these victims will be. And the police have become the trustees of the greatest state secrets. This automatically means a great improvement in prestige and position even though it is accompanied by a definite loss of real power. The secret services no longer know anything that the leader does not know better in terms of power. They've sunk to the level of the executioner. From a legal point of view, even more interesting than the change from the suspect to the objective enemy is the totalitarian replacement of the suspected offense by the possible crime. The possible crime is no more subjective than the objective enemy. While the suspect is arrested because he's thought to be capable of committing a crime that more or less fits his personality or his suspected personality, the totalitarian version of the possible crime is based on the logical anticipation of objective developments. The Moscow trials of the old Bolshevik guard and the chiefs of the Red Army were classic examples of punishment for possible crimes. Behind the fantastic fabricated charges, one can easily detect the following logical calculation. Developments in the Soviet Union might lead to a crisis. A crisis might lead to the overthrow of Stalin's dictatorship. 
This might weaken the country's military force and possibly bring about a situation in which the new government would have to sign a truce or even conclude an alliance with Hitler. Whereupon Stalin proceeded to declare that a plot for this overthrow of the government and a conspiracy with Hitler existed. Against these objective, though entirely improbable possibilities stood only subjective factors, such as the trustworthiness of the accused, their fatigue, their inability to understand what was going on, their firm conviction that without Stalin, everything would be lost. There is sincere hatred of fascism. That is a number of factual details which naturally lack the consistency of the fictitious, logical, possible crime. Totalitarianism's central assumption that everything is possible thus leads through consistent elimination of all factual restraints to the absurd and terrible consequence that every crime the rulers can conceive of must be punished regardless of whether or not it has been committed. The possible crime, like the objective enemy, is of course beyond the competence of the police, who can neither discover, invent, nor provoke it. Here again, the secret services depend entirely upon the political authority. Their independence as a state within the state is gone. Only in one respect does the totalitarian secret police still resemble closely the secret services of non-totalitarian countries. The secret police that is traditionally, that is since Fouché, profit, profited from its victims and has augmented the official state authorized budget from certain unorthodox sources simply by assuming a position of partnership in activities it was supposed to suppress, such as gambling and prostitution. These illegal methods of financing itself, ranging from friendly acceptance of bribes to outright blackmail, were a prominent factor in freeing the secret services from the public authorities and strengthened their position as a state within the state. It is curious to see that the financing of police activities with income from its victims has survived all other changes. In Soviet Russia, the NKVD is almost entirely dependent upon the exploitation of slave labor, which indeed seems to yield no other profit and to serve no other purpose but the financing of the huge apparatus. Himmler first finances SS troops who were the, who were the caterers of the Nazi secret police through the confisc confiscation of Jewish property. He then concluded an agreement with agreement with Dari, the Minister of Agriculture, by which Himmler received the several hundred million marks which Dari earned annually by buying agricultural commodities cheaply abroad and selling them at fixed prices in Germany. The source of regular income disappeared, of course, during the war. Albert Speer, the, success, the successor of Todt and the greatest employer of manpower in Germany after 1942, proposed a similar deal to Himmler in 1942. If Himmler agreed to release from SS authority the imported slave laborers whose work had been remarkably inefficient, the Speer organization would give him a certain percentage of the profit for the SS. To such more or less regular sources of income, Himmler added the old blackmail methods of secret services in times of financial crisis. In their communities, SS units formed groups of friends of the SS who had to volunteer the necessary funds for the needs of the local SS men. It is noteworthy, it is noteworthy that in its various financial operations, the Nazi secret police did not exploit its prisoners, except in the last years of the war, when the use of human material in the concentration camps was no longer determined by Himmler alone, work in the camps, quote, had no, pur no rational purpose except that of increasing the burden and torture of the unfortunate prisoners, end quote. However, these financial irregularities are the sole and not very important traces of the secret police tradition. They're possible because of... Thank you, Yasmin. Was there anything in particular that stood out to you as you were reading that, that you want to comment on? 
I'll open it up to everyone else as well. Was there anything that stood out to you, Yasmin? Oh, you might be muted, I'm sorry. Okay. So sorry. Yeah, I think going back to the previous discussion that you just had, this question about the reification uh, of an objective enemy or the possibility of anyone and anything uh, coming to this position or uh, gaining this sort of attribute, if you will. And the way in which how she describes in the, especially the first page that I read 425, how it's all about uh, the movement uh, and sort of the movement overcoming or eliminating the obstacles that it has. And there is no other logic other than the logic of the movement itself. So the facts or the factual reality perhaps uh, succumbs to uh, what that movement deems uh, worthy or valuable or possible or important at that time. And to me, these are, I think, themes uh, that appear time and again in Hannah Arendt's writing. And um, they happen to be crucial to, to my mind, to her thought. Yeah, it's interesting that in the, in the end, part of the totalitarian system that we're looking at now, where she's sort of brought us to, the objective enemy uh, is a kind of lure for the velocity of the, of the totalitarian movement. Um, it's, it's as if once they have momentum, it needs to attach to this objective enemy to continue that movement, it seems like. Was that sort of what you were getting at? Yes, in, 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 in doing that type of objectification and, and, and to be able to do it to anything that it chooses yeah, as, the, as the group to persecute or to sort of target. And this comes from what is interesting, I think from what I've read, what is interesting is this uh, punishment or the question of punishment or punishing a possible crime or a possible criminal uh, versus like trying to control yeah, what can be deemed criminal. And interestingly enough, a few pages later we'll come to it because we have the capacity to think and this freedom that comes with thought, anybody in any sense can become the object of enemy or can be targeted. Um, and I think that becomes pretty uh, interesting. I don't know what you think about that. I don't know if that makes sense, but. Yeah. to let others join in if they had any comments. I, I want to come back, Thomas, uh, if you're still on, but uh, I'd mentioned this allusion to Dante's Comedia, um, you know, in which you go through hell and you uh, then come through purgatory and you make the ascent to paradise. And aren't this third part has seemed like since we began a sort of inversion of that paradisiac uh, movement. Um, and now we're at a, and, and there's this notion of speed um, in this part that the velocity gets more and more intense and the layers become uh, uh, um, more compacted uh, until you get this objective enemy. Um, and as we move towards the end, that's just makes me want to research that more and more to see if there's actually a, a, a Dante uh, metaphor at work here. And I said Thomas, but we have a second Thomas uh, with us now who will be reading, Thomas Keenan. John Thomas Barker, I think, would like to respond, but he's still oh, muted since he I'm popped sorry. in. So I just wanted to. I had both of the Thomases uh, muted. I'm so sorry. No, can I just say while you're un, you know, while you're unmuting Thomas, that that you know, one of the I'm trying to remember the exact title now, but one of the first titles 
for the origins of totalitarianism. What, Lindsay, you might remember this, or Yasmin, someone that, what was it? It's like the road to hell um, was actually one of the first titles. Um, it, there were a couple variations. So I just wanted to oh. add that to the Dante conversation. Okay, so we're on to something here. First one to get the article published in a journal. No. What, what do you think I was doing while I was off? <laughs> I have, can I have a mention in the acknowledgement, Thomas? I, I'm, hope, I'm hoping they don't send it to you to review. <laughs> okay. uh, apologies for, for my disappearance. I, I had to vote, which I did. Good for you. There were a few people on the line. I'm happy to report. Um, John, just one, one um, logistical, uh, I'm gonna dodge your Dante question because okay. I don't wanna give away what I put in this article I just wrote. Okay. <laughs> but um, I did wanna say just one logistical matter. You, um, you might wanna un, um, spotlight the speaker once that person's done speaking. Sure. And, then it, and then whoever is speaking pops up. Once we go to the uh, panel discussion, then whoever's speaking pops up. Thank you for that reminder. All right, well, that brings us to our next uh, time slot. Uh, I wanna welcome Tom Keenan. If you're just joining us, we are doing a marathon reading of Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism, part three. And we'll begin with our next section at page 429. Tom, you can begin whenever you're ready. Okay, now I'm unmuted. The general contempt of totalitarian regimes for economic and financial matters, so that methods which under normal conditions would be illegal and would distinguish the secret police from other more respectable departments of the administration, no longer indicate that we are dealing here with a department which enjoys independence, is not controlled by other authorities, lives in an atmosphere of irregularity, non-respectability, and insecurity. The position of the totalitarian secret police, on the contrary, has been completely stabilized, and its services are wholly integrated in, in the administration. Not only is the organization not beyond the pale of the law, but rather it is the embodiment of the law, and its respectability is above suspicion. It no longer organizes murders on its own initiative, no longer provokes offenses against state and society, and it sternly proceeds against all forms of bribery, blackmail, and irregular financial gains. The moral lecture, coupled with very tangible threats that Himmler could permit himself to deliver to his men in the middle of the war, quote, we had the moral right to wipe out this Jewish people bent on wiping us out, but we do not have the right to enrich ourselves in any manner whatsoever, be it by a fur coat, a watch, a single mark, or a cigarette. That lecture strikes a note that one would look for in vain in the history of the secret police. If it still is concerned with dangerous thoughts, they are hardly ones which the suspected persons know to be dangerous. The regimentation of all individual, of all intellectual and artistic life demands a constant reestablishment and revision of standards, which naturally is accompanied by repeated eliminations of intellectuals whose dangerous thoughts usually consist in certain ideas that were still entirely orthodox the day before. While, therefore, its police function in the accepted meaning of the word has become superfluous, the economic function of the secret police, sometimes thought to have replaced the first, is even more dubious. It is undeniable to be sure that the NKVD periodically rounds up a percentage of the Soviet population and sends them into camps, which are known under the flattering misnomer of forced labor camps. Yet although it is quite possible that this is the Soviet Union's way of solving its unemployment problem, 
it is also generally known that the output in those camps is infinitely lower than that of ordinary Soviet labor and hardly suffices to pay the expenses of the police apparatus. Neither dubious nor superfluous is the political function of, is the political function of the secret police, the best organized and the most efficient of all government departments in the power apparatus of the totalitarian regime. It constitutes the true executive branch of the government through which all orders are transmitted. Through the net of secret agents, the totalitarian ruler has created for himself a, a directly executive transmission belt, which in distinction to the onion-like structure of the ostensible hierarchy is completely severed and isolated from all other institutions. In this sense, the secret police agents are the only openly ruling class in totalitarian countries and their standards and scale of values permeate the entire texture of totalitarian society. From this viewpoint, it may not be too surprising that certain peculiar qualities of the secret police are general qualities of totalitarian society rather than peculiarities of the totalitarian secret police. The category of the suspect thus embraces under totalitarian conditions, the total population. Every thought that deviates from the officially prescribed and permanently changing line is already suspect, no matter in which field of human activity it occurs. Simply because of their capacity to think, human beings are suspects by definition. And this suspicion cannot be diverted by exemplary behavior, for the human capacity to think is also a capacity to change one's mind. Since moreover, it is impossible ever to know beyond doubt another man's heart, torture in this context is only the desperate and et eternally futile attempt to achieve what cannot be achieved. Suspicion can no longer be allayed if neither a community of values nor the predictabilities of self-interest exist as social as distinguished from merely psychological realities. Mutual suspicion therefore permeates all social relationships in totalitarian countries and creates an all pervasive atmosphere even outside the special purview of the secret police. In totalitarian regimes, provocation, once only the specialty of the secret agent, becomes a method of dealing with his neighbor, which everybody willingly or unwillingly is forced to follow. Everyone in a way is the agent provocateur of everyone else. For obviously everybody will call himself an agent provocateur if ever an ordinary friendly exchange of dangerous thoughts, or what in the meantime have become dangerous thoughts, should come to the attention of the authorities. Collaboration of the population in denouncing political opponents and volunteer service as stool pigeons are certainly not unprecedented, but in totalitarian countries, they are so well organized that the work of specialists is almost superfluous. In a system of ubiquitous spying, where everybody may be a police agent and each individual feels himself under constant surveillance, under circumstances moreover, where careers are extremely insecure and where the most spectacular ascents and falls have become everyday occurrences, every word becomes equivocal and subject to retrospective interpretation. The most striking illustration of the permeation of totalitarian society with secret police methods and standards can be found in the matter of careers. The double agent in non-totalitarian regimes served the cause he was supposed to combat almost as much as, and sometimes more than, the authorities. Frequently, he harbored a sort of double ambition. He wanted to rise in the ranks of the revolutionary parties as well as in the ranks of the services. In order to win promotion in both fields, 
he had only to adopt certain methods, which in normal society belong to the secret daydreams of the small employee who depends on seniority for advancement. Through his connections with the police, he could certainly eliminate his rivals and superiors in the party. And through his connections with the revolutionaries, he had at least a chance to get rid of his chief in the police. If we consider the current conditions in present Russian society, the similarity to such methods is striking. Not only do almost all higher officials owe their positions to purges that removed their predecessors, but promotions in all walks of life are accelerated in this way. About every 10 years, a nationwide purge makes room for the new generation, freshly graduated and hungry for jobs. The government has itself established those conditions for advancement, which the police agent formerly had to create. This regular violent turnover of the whole gigantic administrative machine, while it prevents the deployment of competence, has many advantages. It assures the relative youth of officials and prevents a stabilization of conditions, which at least in time of peace are fraught with danger for totalitarian rule. By eliminating seniority and merit it prevents the development of the loyalties that usually tie younger staff members to their elders, upon whose opinion and goodwill their advancement depends. It eliminates once and for all the dangers of unemployment and assures everyone of a job compatible with his education. Thus, in 1939, after the gigantic purge in the Soviet Union had come to an end, Stalin could note with great satisfaction that, quote, the party was able to promote to leading posts in state or party affairs more than 500,000 young Bolsheviks. The humiliation implicit in owing a job to the unjust elimination of one's predecessor has the same demoralizing effect that the elimination of the Jews had upon the German professions. It makes every job holder a conscious accomplice in the crimes of the government, their beneficiary, whether he likes it or not, with the result that the more sensitive the humiliated individual happens to be, the more ardently he will defend the regime. In other words, this system is the logical outgrowth of the leader principle in its full implications and the best possible guarantee for loyalty in that it makes every new generation depend for its livelihood on the current political line of the leader, which started the job creating purge. It also realizes the identity of public and private interests of which defenders of the Soviet Union used to be so proud or in the Nazi version, the abolition of the private sphere of life. Insofar as every individual of any consequence owes his whole existence to the political interest of the regime. And when this factual identity of interest is broken and the next purge has swept him out of office, the regime makes sure that he disappears from the world of the living. In a not very different way, the double agent was identified with the cause of the revolution without which he would lose his job, and not only with the secret police. In that sphere too, a spectacular rise could end only in an anonymous death, since it was rather unlikely that the double game could be played forever. The totalitarian government, when it set such conditions for promotion in all careers as had previously prevailed only among social outcasts, has affected one of the most far-reaching changes in social psychology. The psychology of the double agent who was willing to pay the price of a short life for the exalted existence of a few years at the peak has necessarily become the philosophy in personal matters of the whole post-revolutionary generation in Russia. And to a lesser but still very dangerous extent in post-war Germany. This is the society 
permeated by standards and living by methods, which once had been the monopoly of the secret police in which the totalitarian secret police functions. Only in the initial stages, when a struggle for power is still going on, are its victims those who can be suspected of opposition. It then embarks upon its totalitarian career with the persecution of the objective enemy, which may be the Jews or the Poles, as in the case of the Nazis, or so-called counter-revolutionaries, an accusation which, quote, in Soviet Russia is established before any question as to the behavior of the accused has arisen at all, unquote, who may be people who at any time owned a shop or a house or, quote, had parents or grandparents who owned such things, unquote, or who happened to belong to one of the Red Army occupational forces or were Russians of Polish origin. Only in its last and fully totalitarian stage are the concepts of the objective enemy and the logically possible crime abandoned, the victims chosen completely at random and even without being accused, declared unfit to live. This new category of undesirables may consist, as in the case of the Nazis, of the mentally ill or persons with lung and heart disease, or in the Soviet Union of? Thank you, Tom. Um, let me ask if you have any comments after reading that, anything that stuck out to you that was particularly important? I had one uh, general and non, in a way, non-substantive comment, which is uh, how easy this uh, prose is to read. Uh, it's extremely um, oral uh, in its uh, <laughs> in its um, writing. Uh, it has it it has kind of built-in rhythms uh, that um, that guide guide the eye and the and the voice through it. Um, I've noticed that in other uh, texts of Arendt as well, but I've never read four pages continuously uh, aloud before. Um, and it really, it really um, jumped out at me here. That was one thing. Um, the other was this extraordinary sentence, which Yasmin alluded to um, before uh, when she was talking on page 430. Uh, this uh, sentence, simply because of their capacity to think human beings are suspects by definition, and the suspicion cannot be diverted by exemplary behavior for the human capacity to think is also a capacity to change one's mind. That it's the obviously the last part of that, which is so extraordinary because you could get through the first three phrases there, uh, okay. Um, but the explanation um, in terms of uh, human capacity for why uh, um, universal suspicion uh, and uh, surveillance society is possible, um, struck me as really amazing. Um, so uh, th that, that I think makes it even scarier uh, in a way, the, the story that she tells here. Um, so that jumped also, out at me. There is also this, um, right in that sentence, this, um, space for resistance that seemed almost impossible <laughs> in the preceding pages, whereas somehow the human capacity to think escapes the velocity of totalitarianism uh, and even eludes, uh, unless you allow yourself to be caught up in it in, in, in the way that Eichmann was, uh, it seems to be the last holdout beyond the grasp of the totalitarian system. And, and it's precisely because of that that they target it, that, that that actually has to be eliminated. Yeah, so that sounded a little more optimistic than I was um, reading it. Uh, <laughs> um, it felt to me like this uh, totalitarianism was um, precisely a system that, uh, that um, was is able to function um, in spite of 
thinking and thinking as changing one's mind. Um, so this is like, this is the, the guts of the system is because we can change our mind, nothing that we've said in the past uh, immunizes us from suspicion or um, uh, status as, a, as an enemy of the state. Um, so yeah, uh, we can change our mind, but they've got that covered. Uh, that's the way I was reading it. Yeah, that's that's pretty dark, Tom. <laughs> I, w I guess I'm I'm hearing that sentence against uh, some other reading that I've been doing in Carl Jaspers, who was also looking for a way in the 1930s to escape. Uh, the totalitarian system. For him, it was transcendence, and it certainly is bound up with this kind of thinking. Um, but you're right. I mean, um, I, I'm somewhat skeptical of Jasper's uh, proposal, uh, because in some systems, um, our thinking is so structured by our social and political and material conditions that it's difficult to believe that you can escape it in this way. Uh, I'll. I'll... Um, I see we're almost out of time in this session, alas, but I'd like to split the difference between the two of you and say, Tom, yes, they want to have that covered. Um, and John's point is uh, they might not succeed. Good. Uh, well, that brings us to time. And our next uh, reader is Serena Perry. Uh, so nice to have you. I'll spotlight you, Serena. Uh, great background. Um, and if you're just joining us, this is the election day reading of Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism, part three. And um, Serena will begin on page 433. Thanks, John. And thanks to all the organizers. People who happen to have been taken up in that percentage varying from one province to another which is ordered to be deported. This consistent arbitrariness negates human freedom more efficiently than any tyranny ever could. One had at least to be an enemy of a tyranny in order to be punished by it. Freedom of opinion was not abolished for those who were brave enough to risk their necks. Theoretically, the choice of opposition remains in totalitarian regimes too. But such freedom is almost invalidated if committing a voluntary act only assures a, quote, punishment that everyone else may have to bear anyway. Freedom in this system has not only dwindled down to its last and apparently still indestructible guarantee, the possibility of suicide, but it has lost its distinctive mark because the consequences of its, ex of its exercised are shared with completely innocent people. If Hitler had had the time to realize his dream of a German, of a general German health bill, the man suffering from a lung disease would have been subject to the same fate as a communist in the early and in the early and a Jew in the later years of the Nazi regime. Similarly, the opponent of the regime in Russia suffering the same fate as millions of people who are chosen for concentration camps to make up certain quotas, only re re relieves the police of the burden of arbitrary choice. The innocent and the guilty are equally undesirable. The change in the concept of crime and criminals determines the new and terrible methods of, total of the totalitarian secret police. Criminals are punished Undesirables disappear from the face of the earth. The only trace which they leave behind is the memory of those who knew and loved them. And one of the most difficult tasks of the secret police is to make sure that even such traces will disappear together with the condemned man. In Akhrana, the czarist predecessor of the GUP is reported to have invented a filing system in which every suspect was noted on a large card in the center of which his name was surrounded by a red circle. His political friends were designated by smaller red circles and his non-political acquaintances by green ones. 
Brown circles indicated persons in contact with friends of the suspect, but not known to him personally. Cross relationships between the suspect's friends, political and non-political, and the friends of his friends were indicated by lines between the respective circles. Obviously, the limitations of this method are set only by the size of the filing cards. And theoretically, a gigantic single sheet could have shown the relations and cross relations of the entire population. And this is the utopian goal of the totalitarian secret police. It has given up the traditional old police dream, which the lie detector is still supposed to realize, and no longer tries to find out who is and who thinks what. The lie detector is perhaps the most graphic example of the fascination that the stream apparently exerts over the mentality of all policemen. For obviously, the complicated measuring equipment can hardly establish anything except the cold-blooded or nervous temperament of its victims. Actually, the feeble-minded and the feeble-minded reasoning underlying the use of this mechanism can only be explained by the irrational wish that some form of mind reading were possible after all." End of parenthesis. This old dream was terrible enough, and since time immemorial has never invariably led to torture and the most abominable cruelties. There was only one thing in its favor. It asked for the impossible. The modern dream of such totalitarian police with its modern techniques is, incompa is incomparably more terrible. Now the police dreams that one look at the gigantic map on the office wall should suffice at any given moment to establish who is related to whom and in what degree of intimacy. And theoretically, this dream is not unrealizable, although its technical execution is bound to be somewhat difficult. If this map really did exist, not even memory would stand in the way of the totalitarian claim to domination. Such a map might make it possible to obliterate people without any traces, as if they had never existed at all. If the reports of the arrested NKVD agents can be trusted, the Russian secret police has come uncomfortably close to this ideal of totalitarian rule. The police has set dossiers about each inhabitant of the vast country, carefully listing the many relationships that exist between people, from chance acquaintances to genuine friendship to family relations. For it is only to discover these relationships that the defendants whose, quote, crimes have anyway been established, quote, objectively, unquote, prior to their arrest, are questioned so closely. Finally, as for the gift of memory so dangerous to totalitarian rule, foreign observers feel that, quote, if it is true that elephants never forget, Russians, seems, Russians seem to us to be the very opposite of elephants. Soviet Russian psychology seems to make forgetfulness really possible, end quote. How important to the total domination apparatus this complete disappearance of its victims is can be seen in those instances where, for one reason or another, the regime was confronted with the memory of survivors. During the war, one SS commandant made the terrible mistake of informing a French woman of her husband's death in a German concentration camp. This slip caused a small avalanche of orders and instructions to all comp camp commandants warning them that under no circumstances was information ever to be given to the outside world. The point is that, as far as the French widow was concerned, her husband had supposedly ceased to live at the moment of his arrest, or rather had ceased ever to have lived. Similarly, the Soviet police officers, accustomed to the system since their birth, could only stare in amazement as those, at those people in occupied Poland who tried desperately to find out what had happened to their friends and relatives under arrest. In totalitarian countries, all places of detention ruled by the police are made to be veritable holes of, are made to be veritable holes of oblivion into which people stumble by accident and without leaving behind them such ordinary traces of former existence as a body and a grave. Compared with this newest invention for doing away with people, the old fashioned method of murder, political or criminal, is ineffectual, inefficient indeed. The murderer leaves behind him a corpse, 
And although he tries to efface the traces of his own identity, he has no power to erase the identity of his victim from the memory of the surviving world. The operation of the secret police, on the contrary, miraculously sees to it that the victim never existed at all. The connection between secret police and secret societies is obvious. The establishment of the former always needed and used the uh, argument of dangers arising from the existence of the latter. The totalitarian secret police is the first in history which neither needs nor uses these old fashioned pretexts of all tyrants. The anonymity of its victims who cannot be called enemies of the regime and whose identity is unknown to the uh, persecutors until the arbitrary decision of the government eliminates them from the world of the living and exterminates their memory from the world of the dead is beyond all secrecy, beyond the strictest silence beyond the greatest mastery of double life that the discipline of conspirat conspiratory societies used to impose upon their members. The, the totalitarian movements, which during their rise to power, imitate certain organizational features of secret societies and yet establish themselves in broad daylight, create a true secret society only after their ascendancy to rule. The secret society of totalitarian regimes is the secret police, the only strictly guarded secret in a totalitarian country, the only esoteric knowledge that exists, concerns the operations of the police and the conditions in the concentration camps. Of course, the population at large and the party members specifically know all the general facts, that concentration camps exist, that people disappear, that innocent persons are arrested. At the same time, Every person in a totalitarian country knows that it is the greatest crime ever to talk about these secrets. Inasmuch as man depends for his knowledge upon the affirmation and comprehension of his fellow men, this generally shared but individually guarded, this never communicated information loses its quality of reality and assumes the nature of a mere nightmare. Only those who are in possession of the strict esoteric knowledge concerning the eventual new categories of undesirables and the operational methods of the cadres are in a position to communicate with each other about what actually constitutes the reality for all. They alone are in a position to believe what they know to be true. This is their secret. And in order to guard the secret, they are established as a secret organization. They remain members even if the secret organization arrests them, forces them to make confessions, and finally liquidates them. So long as they guard the secret, they belong to the elite. And as a rule, they do not betray it, even when they are in the prisons and concentration camps. We already have noted that one of the many paradoxes that offend the common sense of the non-totalitarian world is the seemingly irrational use which totalitarianism makes of conspiratory methods. The totalitarian movements, apparently persecuted by the police, very sparingly use methods of conspiracy for the overthrow of the government and their struggle for power, whereas totalitarianism in power after it has been recognized by all governments and seemingly outgrown its revolutionary stage, develops a true secret police as the nucleus of its government and power. It seems that official recognition is never felt to be a great menace to the conspir conspiracy content of the totalitarian movement, a menace of interior disintegration than the half-hearted police measures of non-totalitarian regimes. The truth of the matter is that totalitarian leaders, though they are convinced that they must follow consistently the fiction and the rules of the fictitious world which were laid down during their struggle for power, discover only gradually the full implications of the fic this fictitious world and its rules. Their faith in human omnipotence, their conviction that everything can be done through organization carries them into experiments which human imaginations may have outlined, but human activity certainly never realized. 
their hideous discoveries in the realm of the possible are inspired by an ideological scientific scientificality which has proved to be less controlled by reason and less willing to recognize factuality than the wildest fantasies of pre-scientific and pre-philosophical speculation. They establish the secret society, which now no longer operates in broad daylight, the society of the secret police or the political soldier or the ideologically trained fighter in order to be able to carry out the indecent experimental inquiry into what is possible. The totalitarian conspiracy against the non-totalitarian world, on the other hand, its claims to world domination remains as open and unguarded under conditions of totalitarian rule as in the totalitarian movements. It is practically impressed upon the coordinated population of quote, sympathizers in the form of a supposed conspiracy of the whole world against their own country. The totalitarian dichotomy is propagated by making it a duty for every national abroad to report home as though he were a secret agent and by treating every foreigner as a spy for his home government. It is for the practical realization of this dichotomy rather than because of specific secrets, military or other, that iron curtains separate the inhabitants of, totalitarian, of a totalitarian country from the rest of the world. Their real secret, the concentration camps, these laboratories in the experiment of total domination is shielded by the totalitarian regimes from the eyes of their own people, as well as from others. For a considerable length of time, the normality of the normal world is the most efficient protection against disclosure of totalitarian mass crimes. Quote, normal men don't know that everything is possible, end quote. Refuse to believe. Thank you, Serena. That's um, I'll uh, just ask what I've been asking everyone. If you have anything um, that particularly stood out to you during that reading that you want to uh, discuss. Yeah, I'm trying to look for, for it. I forget where I read it. But the idea that when lies are propagated so totally and you can't talk about them, they can't be confirmed by other people, it feels to you like you're living in your own private nightmare. That to me really rang true about the current political climate. Um, in so many ways, you would hear things like, we treat asylum seekers so well. They're so happy, they're so lucky to be in our conditions. And you look around and you think, why isn't everyone um, pointing out the ridiculousness of this? And then you think, wait, am I mistaken? Was this true? And um, of course we have more sources to confirm our intuitions and more ways and we're not quite as isolated for many reasons as the totalitarian societies Arendt talks about. But that idea that we're social knowers and our bonds, our need for connection is so important to truth that rationality isn't cut off from our experience as human beings connected to other people. I feel like is one of her, one of those insights from our rent that, um, you know, it's just, I, I feel like it's such an Arendtian thing to connect the idea of memory, human connection to the way truth and falsity gets propagated under totalitarianism. Yeah, I, I've been really, um, there's a kind of, anti-rationalism that is a constant refrain in these pages uh, and it strikes me that although we're not in a totalitarian society and we can't even really speak of us under as living under an authoritarian regime we certainly still have democratic institutions and principles operating in our system but there are these anti-intellectual um, elements that are beginning to um, come to the foreground, attacks on faculty at colleges, um, uh, and even labeling people Marxist who, who uh, are not explicitly Marxist, um, or even if they are, to label them as almost Stalinist or totalitarian themselves. And um, the attacks on science, um, and these kind of elements where people begin to um, uh, hold their beliefs without any justification. Uh, 
and hold them even when reality uh, uh, is opposed to their beliefs. Um, and that's, that's striking to me. Also, um, going back to, hi, Serena. Hi, Lucy. Um, hi. Um, what you were saying about it, it seeming so self-evident but you feel so lonely because of the self-evidence is no longer shared. And I was thinking recently of when I was a grad student reading Elizabeth Young Brawl's biography, of reading the passage where we're reading about Arendt um, going into the Prussian State Library in order to gather evidence of anti-Semitism in NGOs and charities mm -hmm. in the 33. And me thinking, well, because, because Blumenthal wanted to present that evidence to the uh, Zionist Congress in Poland the, the <laughs> next year. And thinking, why do you need evidence of anti-Semitism? It was 1933, this was not a secret. Why is she getting evidence? I mean, every, the Jewish community must have known. Um, everyone must have known. And it was only in the last five years that I realized what that's like, that you know, every time you try and gather evidence around migrant death, refugee death, what's happening, you gather, I, I have got so many friends and colleagues who spend their whole time gathering data to state what is completely obvious. <laughs> and we're doing exactly what she was doing in the Prussian library, which is amassing more and more evidence. And it feels like throwing tomatoes against a brick wall because there's something that still won't, you know, they won't stick on the wall. So you, you get into this kind of really slightly paranoid to go back to the kind of hermeneutics of paranoia and everyone being a double agent, where the, the self-evident has to be demonstrated again and again and again and again. And it's um, very alienating and completely exhausting. That's such a nice way of putting it. I feel like that's been true for so many different issues and the treatment of migrant and refugees and even about racism and the way that it gets discussed and denied and people who call things racist get gaslit and said, no, no, what are you talking about? There's not racism. You're like, wait, what? <laughs> um, and so that's such a nice way to put it. Like it's exhausting and there's, there's no amount of facts that can be amassed to prove this when you don't have those social connections to support the truth. Hmm. Well, that brings us uh, to our next uh, reading. If you're just joining us, this is uh, the election day marathon reading of the part three of Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism. And Nancy McHugh is our next reader, and uh, she will be picking up our reading at page 437. Nancy, you can begin uh, when you're ready. Okay, thank you, John. Their eyes and ears in the face of the monstrous, just as the mass men did not trust theirs in the face of the normal reality in which no place was left for them. The reason why the totalitarian regimes can get so far towards realizing a fictitious topsy-turvy world is the outside non-totalitarian totalitarian world, which is always compromises a great part of the population of the totalitarian country itself, indulges also, also in wishful thinking and shirks reality in the face of real insanity, just as much as the masses do in the face of the normal world. This common sense disinclination to believe the monstrous is constantly strengthened by the totalitarian ruler himself, who makes sure that no reliable statistics, no controllable facts and figures are ever published, so that there are only subjective, uncontrollable, and unreliable reports about the places of the living dead. Because of this policy, the results of the totalitarian experiment are only partially known. Although we have enough reports from concentration camps to assess the possibilities of total domination and to catch a glimpse into the abyss of the possible, we do not know the extent of character transformation under a totalitarian regime. We know even less how many of the normal people around us would be willing to accept the totalitarian way of life, that is, to pay the price of a considerably shorter life for the assured fulfillment of their career dreams. It is easy to realize the extent to which totalitarian propaganda and even some totalitarian institutions answer to the needs of the new homeless masses, but it's almost impossible to know how many of them, if they were further exposed to a constant threat of unemployment, will gladly acquiesce to a population policy that consists of regular elimination of surplus people and how many, once they fully grasp their growing incapacity to bear the burdens of modern life, 
will gladly conform to a system that together with spontaneity eliminates responsibility. In other words, while we know the operation and the specific function of the totalitarian secret, totalitarian secret police, we do not know how well or to what extent the secret of the secret society corresponds to the secret desires and the secret complicities of the masses in our time. Three, total domination. The concentration and extermination camps of totalitarian regime, regimes serve as the laboratories in which the fundamental belief of totalitarianism that everything is possible is being verified. Compared with this, all the other experiments are secondary in importance, including those in the field of medicine, whose horrors recorded in detail in the trials against the physicians of the Third Reich. Although it is characteristic that these laboratories were used for experiments of every kind. Total domination, which strives to organize the infinite plurality and differentiation of human beings as if all of humanity were just one individual, is only possible if each and every person can be reduced to a never changing identity of reactions. So that each of these bundles of reactions can be exchanged at random for any other. The problem is to fabricate something that does not exist, namely a kind of human species resembling an an other animal species whose only freedom would consist in preserving the species. Totalitarian domination attempts to achieve this goal both through ideological indoctrination of elite formations and through the absolute terror in the camps and the atrocities for which the elite formations are ruthlessly used to become as it were, the practical application of the ideological indoctrination, the testing ground in which the latter must prove itself, while the appalling spectacle of the camps themselves is supposed to furnish the theoretical verification of the ideology. The camps are meant not only to exterminate people and degrade human beings, but also to serve the ghastly experiment of eliminating under scientifically controlled conditions, spontaneity itself as an expression of human behavior and of transforming the human personality into the mere thing, into something that even animals are. For Pavlov's dog, which as we know, was trained to eat not when it was hungry, but when a bell rang, was a perverted animal. Under normal circumstances, this can never be accomplished because spontaneity can never be entirely eliminated insofar as connected not only with human freedom, but with life itself in the sense of simply keeping alive. It is only the concentration camps that such an experiment is possible. And therefore they are not only, I'm not gonna get the French right on this, but a guiding social ideal, ideal of the total domination general. Just as the stability of the totalitarian regime depends on the isolation of the fictitious world of the movement from the outside world. So the experiment of totalitarian domination in the concentration camp depends on sealing off the ladder against the world of all others the world of the living in general, even against the outside world of a country under totalitarian rule. As this isolation explains the peculiar unreality and lack of credibility that characterizes all reports from the concentration camps and constitute one of the main difficulties for the true understanding of totalitarian domination, which stands or falls with the existence of these concentration and extermination camps. For unlikely as it may sound, these camps are the true central institution of totalitarian organizational power, organizational power. There are numerous reports by survivors. The more authentic they are, the less they attempt to communicate things and invade human understanding and human experience. Sufferings, that is, that transform men into uncomplaining animals. None of these reports inspires those passions of outrage and sympathy through which men have always been mobilized for justice. On the contrary, anyone speaking or writing about concentration camps is still regarded as suspect, as if the speaker has resolutely returned to the world of the living. He himself has often assailed by doubts with regard to his own truthfulness, as though he had mistaken a nightmare for reality. This doubt of people concerning themselves and the reality of their own experience only, only reveals what the Nazis have always known. That men determined to commit crimes will find it expedient right. will find it expedient to organize themselves in the vastest, most improbable scale. 
not only because this renders all punishments provided by the legal system inadequate and absurd, but because the very immensity of the crimes guarantees that the murderers who proclaim their innocence with all manner of lies will be readily believed than the victims who tell the truth. The Nazis did not even consider it necessary to keep this discovery to themselves. Hitler circulated millions of copies of his book in which he stated that to be successful, a lie must be enormous, which did not prevent people from believing him as similarly the Nazis proclamation repeated ad nauseum that the Jews would be exterminated like bed bugs. In other words, like with poison gas, prevented anyone from not believing, from not believing them. There's a great temptation to explain away the intrinsically incredible by means of, the ra of liberal ra rationalizations. In each one of us, there lurks such a liberal wielding us, wielding us with the voice of common sense. The road to the totalitarian domination leads through many intermediate stages for which we can find numerous analogies and precedents. The extraordinary bloody terror during the initial stage of totalitarian rule serves indeed the exclusive purpose of defeating the opponent and rendering all further opposition impossible. But total terror is launched only after this initial stage has been overcome and the regime no longer has anything to fear from the opposition. In this context, it has been frequently remarked that in such a case, the means have become the end. But this is after all only an admission in paradoxical disguise that the category, the end justifies the means no longer applies that terror has lost its purpose, that is no longer the means to frighten people, nor does the explanation suffice that the revolution, as in the case of the French Revolution, was devouring its own children, for the terror continues even after everybody who might be described as the child of the revolution in one capacity or another, the Russian factions, the power centers of party, the army, the bureaucracy, has long since been devoured. Many things that nowadays have become the specialty of totalitarian governments are only too well known from the study of history. There have always, almost always been wars of aggression, the massacre of hostile populations after the victory went unchecked until the Romans mitigated it by introducing parse subjects, subjectus through centuries of the extermination of native peoples went in hand with the colonization of the Americas, Australia and Africa, Slavery is one of the oldest institutions of mankind and all empires of antiquity were based in the labor of state owned slaves who erected their public buildings. Not even concentration camps are an invention of totalitarian movements. They emerged for the, fir emerged for the first time during the Boer War at the beginning of the century and continue to be used in South Africa as well as India for undesirable elements. Here too, we find the first term, the find the term protective custody, which was later, adopt, later adopted by the Third Reich. These camps correspond in many respects to concentration camps at the beginning of totalitarian rule. They were used for suspects whose offenses could not be provided and who could not be sentenced by ordinary process of law. Process of law. All this clearly points to totalitarian methods of domination. All these are elements they utilize, develop and crystallize on the basis of the nihilistic principles that everything is permitted, which they inherited and already take for granted. But wherever these new forms of domination assume, they're authentically totalitarian structures, they, trans they transcend this principle, which is still tied to the ut utilitarian motives and self-interest of the rulers, and try their hand in the realm that up to now has been completely unknown to us, the realm where everything is possible. And characteristically enough, this is precisely the realm that cannot be eliminated either by utilitarian motives or self-interest, regardless of the latter's content, latter's content. What runs counter to common sense is not the nihilistic principle that everything is permitted, which was already contained in the 19th century utilitarian concept of common sense. What common sense and... Thank you, Nancy. Um... What stood out to you there in that reading? So, you know, it was interesting. There were a couple of things. You know, when I first started, um, you know, reading, it reminded me of, I, I spent a semester in Germany and I was in the old East Germany. Um, and it's so interesting to keep me, because my students, like that's not a concept for them. That's, that's real. They've only known, a, you know, a post-unified Germany. 
but when I, but when I was there, um, I spent a lot of time in um, like an English stamp dish where we would, where the Germans would practice their English by talking to um, English speakers. And one of the things they kept saying was that they would be like, oh, it was so horrible. You know, it was so horrible under the Russians. You know, it was just such a horrible, it was a horrible regime. You know, they, you couldn't trust your neighbor. You didn't know who was spying on you. It could be your own family members were spying on you. And they would repeat over and over again how horrible it was. And then they go, ah, but I just really miss the feeling of unity that we had. And there was a sense, they referred to that as nostalgia, like nostalgia for the East. And, it, and it's interesting to me because I see that in what's happening in the US right now, because their nostalgia for the East was this false sense of what existed. It, it was, it's not real, right? And I feel like there's a sense in which this nostalgia that we're seeing, for example, under, through um, uh, white working class voters, for a time in which they imagined something existed, where uh, they were where they were empowered in a way in, by by politics, or empowered in a certain kind of way within American culture, in which you know that people who were living on the edges were never actually empowered, and so it's like this false memory of better times that actually weren't really better times, and that sort of push for Trump is a false narrative of what was, but was never actually really there. So, so that really hit me. But then as I got to the end of the reading, um, this false notion of protective custody and isolation and suspects, so much rings to true of what we're doing in terms of, of putting immigrants within, you know, housing, illegally housing immigrants, separating families, um, you know, our, the border politics in the U.S. right now are just so reminiscent of these sort of, it's for the common good, it's for the good of America, it's for everybody, it's for everybody's good, it's even for the good of the people who were, you know, who were, were confining and putting in, in what are effectively our concentration camps. And so um, that really, that really rings true also to me from, from this, these four pages. Anyone else on the panel have anything to contribute? I, I just want to highlight two things. This is this was such a brilliant passage, and you read it so wonderfully. Um, that you know, I I felt like here we're starting to turn toward the end of the book. Um, this is the first time I really felt this um, as we're as we're working our way through part three, and there were you know two elements here. Um, you know, that, that really stood out. One is spontaneity and the emphasis she places on spontaneity um, as, as part of freedom and, and what, what separates totalitarianism from tyranny and fashion, fascism and authoritarianism is that it, it, it not just aims for world domination, but that it does away with sp spontaneity altogether. It makes spontaneous action, it makes political action impossible. Um, and the, the other thing that I was really struck by here was, um, you know, her, you know, saying, look, there are lots of analogies and precedents we can look to, but that's not what we need to do in order to fight fascism. Um, and it just, it feels like that's something um, that Arendt has been used a lot for in the past four years. And I can't, and it's, it's hard not to, I'm always reminded of the quote that, you know, she says it would be a mythological error to look to the past to try and solve the problems of our present. Um, and I, I think she's making that argument in these, in these pages that you read. You know, and the, and the real connection to the sort of the banality of evil, you know, the, you know, the, all the people that just sort of push along this agenda and act like it's just their job to do it when it, in fact they're making intentional decisions that are in fact harmful and evil, yet we just sort of act like, well, let's, that's this, you know, that's the, the job of this office and that's the job of that office. And let's just push those things, let's just push those things along as opposed to they are in fact a product of a certain kind of state that allows us to not see the intentionality behind certain kinds of acts or the, con or the connections between them. I think that's the other, the really critical thing is the severing uh, the uh, severing of connections between actions to make them seem like isolated incidents, as opposed, I mean, it's a lot like um, um, Henry Giraud's uh, biopolitics of disposability, you know, who's, who's disposable becomes very predictable under a totalitarian regime. I'll, um, 
just follow up on one thing that Samantha said, which is the uh, calling our attention again to the uh, the degree to which the book provides insights, but also um, it needs to be rethought or thought in the current circumstances and the, the way in which there are um, disanalogies and um, uh, aspects where we recognize resonance and where we don't. One thing that I'm thinking about is this passage. I, I wanted to note that it's the epigraph to this whole section that we're reading. Normal men, it was in the previous um, section, but it comes up again here. Normal men don't know that everything is possible, the idea that everything's possible. One thing I'm thinking about is trying to understand what that might mean, in the, whether that's a relevant observation in the current circumstance and what it might mean. Uh, the, certainly the normality and the, um, the distinction between uh, the way in which the presumption of normality gives an opportunity for the totalitarian um, impulse to take root because everyone's sort of trying to sustain a normality and the totalitarian is playing a different game. That's apparent to me, but what it means to say that everything is possible in the current context is something I'm, I'm not sure I know how to think about that, but I think it's, an interest, it's interesting for trying to think about how to apply Arendt's analysis to the current moment. Mm -hmm. All right, should I begin the next section, Sam? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to put the spotlight on John, who is going to uh, bring us into the final leg of our marathon reading of the third part of Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism. If you're just joining us, um, we're going to be beginning on page 441. John, it is all you. What common sense and normal people refuse to believe is that everything is possible. We attempt to understand elements in present or recollected experience that simply surpass our powers of understanding. We attempt to classify as criminal, a thing which, as we all feel, no such category was ever intended to cover. What meaning has the concept of murder when we are confronted with the mass production of corpses? We attempt to understand the behavior of concentration camp inmates and SS men psychologically, when the very thing that must be realized is that the psyche can be destroyed, even without the destruction of the physical man. That indeed psyche, character, and individuality seem under certain circumstances to express themselves only through the rapidity or slowness with which they disintegrate. The end result in any case is inanimate men, men who can no longer be psychologically understood, whose return to the psychologically or otherwise intelligibly human world closely resembles the resurrection of Lazarus. All statements of common sense, whether a psychological or sociological nature, serve only to encourage those who think it's superficial to dwell on horrors. If it is true that the concentration camps are the most consequential institution of totalitarian rule, dwelling on horrors would seem to be indispensable for understanding, for an understanding of totalitarianism. But recollection can no more do this than can the uncommunicative eyewitness report. In both these genres, there is an inherent tendency to run away from the experience instinctively or rationally. Both types of writer are so much aware of the terrible abyss that separates the world of the living from that of the living dead, that they cannot supply anything more than a series of remembered occurrences that must seem just as incredible to those who relate them as to their audience. Only the fearful imagination of those who have been aroused by such reports but have not actually been smitten in their own flesh, of those who are consequently free from the bestial, desperate terror, which when confronted by real present horror, inexorably paralyzes everything that is not mere reaction, 
can afford to keep thinking about horrors. Such thoughts are useful only for the perception of political contexts and the mobilization of political passions. A change of personality of any sort, whatever, can do no more, can no more be induced by thinking about horrors than by the real experience of horror. The reduction of man to a bundle of reactions separates him as radically as mental disease from everything within him that is personality or character. The reduction of a man to a bundle of reactions separates him as radically as mental disease from everything within him that is personality or character. When, like Lazarus, he rises from the dead, he finds his personality or character unchanged, just as he had left it. Just as the horror or the dwelling on it cannot affect a change of character in him, cannot make men better or worse, thus it cannot be the basis of a political community or party in the narrower sense. The attempts to build upon a European elite with a program of intra-European understanding based on the common European experience of the concentration camps have foundered in much the same manner as the attempts following the First World War to draw political con conclusions from the international experience of the front generation. In both cases, it turned out that the experiences themselves can communicate no more than nihilistic banalities. Political consequences, such as post-war pacifism, for example, derived from the general fear of war, not from the experiences in war. Instead of producing a pacifism devoid of reality, the insight into the structure of modern wars, guided and mobilized by fear, might have led to the realization that, only, that the only standard for a necessary war is the fight against conditions under which people no longer wish to live, and our experiences with the tormenting hell of the totalitarian camps have enlightened us only too well about the possibility of such conditions. Thus, the fear of concentration camps and the resulting insight into the nature of total domination might serve to invalidate all obsolete political differentiations from right to left and to introduce beside and above them the politically most important yardstick for judging events in our time, namely, whether they serve totalitarian domination or not. In any event, the fearful imagination has the great advantage to dissolve the sophistic dialectical interpretations of politics, which are all based on the superstition that something good might result from evil. Such dialectical acrobatics had at the least semblance of justification so long as the worst that man could inflict upon man was murder. But as we know today, murder is only a limited evil. The murderer who kills a man, a man who has to die anyway, still moves within the realm of life and death familiar to us. Both have indeed a necessary connection on which the dialectic is founded even if it is not always conscious of it. The murderer leaves a corpse behind and does not pretend that his victim was, has never existed. If he wipes out any traces, they are those of his own identity and not the memory and grief of the persons who loved his victim. He destroys a life, but he does not destroy the fact of existence itself. The Nazis, with the precision peculiar to them, used to register their operations in the concentration camps under the heading of undercover of the night, Nacht und Nebel. The radicalism of measures to treat people as if they never existed and to make them disappear in the literal sense of the word is frequently not apparent at first glance because both the German and the Russian system are not uniform but consist of a series of categories in which people are treated very differently. 
In the case of Germany, these different categories used to exist in the same camp, but without coming into contact with each other. Frequently, the isolation between the categories was even stricter than